give everybody a three minute warning so we can start at 9.30. We have a, a long agenda today. We'll start with uh, public comments. So everybody turn in your yellow sheet to Sonia over there. Raise your hand, Sonia. We're down to a 30 second warning. Okay, both clocks almost agree. We will call the uh, May 13th, 2022 Volusia County Council meeting to order at 9.30. And uh, we're gonna start as we always do with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, the invocation is open to um, every faith group in um, Florida, if the leader of your faith group would like to um, share in in an invocation, um, send an email to K Green, like the color, at Volusia dot org, and she'll get you all the details. Um, this morning we have Pastor Darren Harper from Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. If everybody would uh, like to stand and just remain standing for the pledge. Good morning. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We acknowledge that each day is a good gift from your hand. Our great God, we pause now to acknowledge your perfection and the authority over your creation in each of our lives. God Almighty, we want to ask that you would bless our county council, their families, and the people they represent. We thank you for the council members. We recognize that you've appointed them to this important role and task. Grant them the wisdom, energy, patience, and discernment they need to govern well. We pray that you would make them humble representatives of the many lives they represent. We pray that you would bless today's meeting. We pray for clarity, prudent judgment, a willingness to listen, and resolutions that would lead to good stewardship, dignity, and the flourishment of all. 
We pray for wisdom and the foresight of our county council as they consider present and the future needs of our county. We pray for right understanding, that they would always know what is best but, uh, as opposed to that which is easy or expedient. We thank you, Father, for Volusia County. We thank you for the beauty uh, of your good creation here. We thank you for our cities. We thank you for her people. And so now we pray in the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you would bless this assembly. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. To the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you please call the roll? Mr. Johnson. Here. Mr. Lowry. Here. Ms. Post. We have her via text. Mr. Robbins. Here. Ms. Wheeler. Here. Ms. Gertman. Here. Mr. Brower. Here. So let the record reflect that there is a quorum physically present here at the meeting, and I uh, need a motion uh, from the members present to recognize Council Member Post as participating in voting, uh, vo voting virtually. So due to moved. Motion by Gertman, second by Wheeler. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, and who's keeping tabs? So how will I know when she wants to speak? You'll wave? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. All right, we always start our meetings with um, public participation. It's an important part of our meeting. Um, there's a lot of, well, maybe there's nobody who wants to speak this morning. Chair Brower, my apologies. Hold on one moment, please. I'm holding. While, you're, while I'm waiting, I'll just give some brief uh, directions. There will be a clock on the, um, uh, the monitor in front of you, a clock on the screen behind me and behind you. You will have three minutes to speak. At, uh, at one minute, it'll go from green to uh, yellow. I think I have this right. And when you get down to a few seconds, it'll go to, to red and... and um, um, <laughs> I'm not going to say it. So, uh, Chair. Yes, ma'am. Can you also explain that we do not respond so it doesn't look like we're disrespecting, um, that we do not respond? Yeah, that, that's okay. tough, isn't it? Because a lot of times you want to respond. Uh, our policy, and I, I, I happen to think it is a... Um, it's the right policy is that we don't respond to people during public comment. And, and the reason is t today's meeting may go to 8 o'clock uh, p.m. because there's a lot on it. And if we respond to everyone, because you bring up, we have really smart people of Volusia County, and you bring up good ideas. And if we respond and debate and flesh them out, we'll be here till 10 o'clock every meeting that we have. So. Um, Ben's already mad at me for taking this much time to explain to you our non-participation policy, but he'll get over it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so th that's why. Um, thank you, Barbara. That's important to bring that up. So the first uh, that we have, I'm going to call them in order that they were given to the clerk, uh, Paul Richardson. Uh, good morning, Council. My name is Paul Richardson. I'm from DeLand, and I know you've heard me mention this a couple of times before, and uh, I'm sorry I keep bringing it up, but in a time where uh, uh, this country is facing much difficulty, we just had the COVID pandemic where 
have record in place in, um, there's a baby food shortage going on, and it, it's just all craziness. And so what, uh, what I've been doing of late has been suggesting that we do a 4th of July celebration this coming up in July 4th, 2026, which will be the 250th anniversary of the United States. And I think that's an important milestone for our country. And it will so uh, will give people, at least at Volusia County, some hope of the future that we're going to be doing something other than bickering, yelling, and screaming at each other, which we do enough of as is in, uh, here uh, currently in, this, in these troubled times. Uh, uh, and what I, what I would suggest maybe, uh, I know you guys can't talk to me about my idea during public participation, but maybe you might want to do a workshop uh, when a time when you don't have that much on the agenda, uh, you probably could schedule a workshop uh, discussing it amongst yourselves uh, what you want to do and then you know pass it on to uh, who, whoever to write up the, uh, the various items on the on, uh, for the committee on 4th July, like five members, uh, give or take, from one person from each district. Um, you can uh, uh, have them direction where uh, if they want, if you want to uh, discontinue it after July 4th, 2026, or keep going afterwards, who knows? Uh, but like I said, uh, just an idea because like I said, we need something to hope for. Hope is a good thing. Uh, Jesus Christ gave us hope. And so if we can also provide hope instead of uh, uh, problems for America, then it'll be something to look forward to, something that we can strive towards, something uh, we can all do for Rista County, for the people. And I hope you uh, uh, really consider it and really think about it and please, uh, decide to do it. So thank you. You have a good day. Uh, I will specifically be praying for uh, Councilwoman Post to get better so she can return to us here in the meetings. Uh, and I'll also pray for all of you guys. So you have a good day. And um, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Thank you. Uh, next we have Doug Pettit. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. My name is Doug Pettit. I live in Ormond Beach, and I am a candidate for the Volusia County Council at-large representative. On April 27th, I signed the Volusia County Wildlife Corridor Pledge for the support of the wildlife connectivity to protect our springs, to protect our food supplies with the farms and ranches within the corridor, and to support tourism for our economy. It was an easy pledge for me to support and if elected to this council, I will pursue the following. I will support county staff sending communications directly to landowners within the Opportunity Zone on a biannual basis to remind them of the status of their property within the corridor and the conservation opportunities available to them. I will support the county working with municipalities to assist and educate their staffs on, and on the landowners within the wildlife corridor that are in their city limits so they're made aware of the conservation opportunities as well. And I support the future land use designations contained in the Volusia County Comprehensive Plan being revised to address density and intensity of development on all Volusia County wildlife corridor lands. If we must have new development, then low impact sure. development principles should be required. Those LID principles should be yeah, required. Yeah, I am. Those LID principles should be required, in fact, throughout the entire county pertaining to new development. With 75% of the Volusia County vote residents voting to tax themselves for land conservation through the Volusia Forever program, the county owes it to the residents to pursue every opportunity for success. Money is not the issue. Since Florida Forever funds are available and federal funds are available for farmlands. While land conservation within these programs is a willing seller's situation, the public must be made aware of the availability of this funding. And that's my purpose for being here this morning. The Volusia County Council is tasked with protecting the wildlife corridor and the land conservation within the county. The council should be proactive in educating landowners on the conservation programs available to them, addressing zoning up front and establishing sound development principles sooner rather than later. 
I believe it is the council's responsibility to give direction as such. My pledge in my future position as the at-large representative is to implement what the voters of Volusia County have stated they expect with regard to land conservation and ensure that landowners know the opportunities available to them. Thank you. Derek LaMontagne. Hey, uh, good morning. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I had brought a PowerPoint presentation I would want to uh, show you guys. Um, I have been told that I am not able to present that um, through giving you a flash drive or plugging it in. So they said I could actually hold up my own laptop to show you pictures if that's it's really not the best way, but I'm willing to do what I need to do. So um, this, uh, when I get to photos, I'll tell you. But I'm going to start by talking about um, a, a process that happens in the county known as administrative rezonings. And I just want to say that I believe that they are doing harm to our county. Uh, for years, county staff has essentially been able to erase protected lands with no public input. Um, and that, that bothers me. And there are ordinances that seem to allow them to do that in certain instances. Um, but in other instances, it seems there's really no oversight, no check, and there's no um, way for the public to, uh, to have input on that. And I believe that uh, this process, this practice should be abolished and instead replaced with simply any time there's a rezoning of land or land use, that it comes to you, even if it's just on a consent agenda. It should be made public that, hey, we're losing conservation land, we're using losing resource corridor land, and so forth. So as an example, <laughs> this is not the best way. There is, uh, there's been several instances where, you know, just, I have maps here basically that show uh, old examples of, of land being rezoned. And uh, again, I apologize for the lack of technical difficulties, but there, there's a section that basically says um, that public notice would be required unless there's certain other conditions met. And it cannot happen if the boundary of the land adjoins uh, another property owned by another person. And I believe that has happened. And later today, you will hear an example of that happening. And I believe those people should have been noticed. And uh, there should have been public input. Um, to go along with that, um, I did want to say that um, we'll be talking later today about some instances of uh, stuff that happened by county staff back, or county council back in 2002. And it was, it's my belief that, um, that you know, after reading some of those details, that uh, it was actually staff that has requested some of these administrative rezonings in the past. It, it wasn't applicants even, it is the staff, again, all the way back since 2002, that have sort of said, hey, we want to just erase these protected lands. And there's no public input. You can see the maps afterwards, but I think that's a problem. Um, so again, I have photos. Oh. So here's an example, 2002. I'll just show that for the record. Um, so again, I apologize for that. Maybe we can work something out. But I do have uh, other talk I would like to do later today about um, effects uh, on Spruce Creek Waterway because there's a lot of uh, intrusion onto the, uh, the easements in that area. So hopefully I'll see you again uh, later. Thank you. Suzanne Scheiber. Good morning. Suzanne Scheiber, Ormond Beach, Florida. I'm representing Dern Green Volusia today. On June the 7th, you will be hearing a proposed development located on the Ormond Scenic Loop. I'm here to speak on this today because I cannot attend on June the 7th. This development has a 13.2 acre conservation element that would be the middle portion of the trail on the west side of Old Dixie Highway. There will be no cut through entrance on the road, which is important to preservation. In 2007, Frank T. Bruno signed the resolution 2007-18, representing Volusia County support for the loop. And the goals and objective portions of the loop plan, a strategy 1.4.5 of adding scenic highway protections to the Volusia County comprehensive plan is listed. And objectives 2.2 require new development and businesses within the corridor to incorporate the scenic highway vision into their development plans. Also in 2007, the Scenic Highway Advisory Committee recommended the local comprehensive plans include preservation and protections for the Ormond Scenic Loop and its historic resources as these are under development pressure. 
Over time, elected officials came and went, and even though Volusia County signed they supported the plan, there was a chipping away of the loop through the years. The support for the loop became diminished by local governments, and we ended up with houses built right on the road, as well as reduced protections in the comprehensive plan, or they were just never addressed. This needs to change. At the end of this month, we're putting together a committee within our own organization to pursue implementing the original loop plan the county signed off on. Our petition that launched this year has over 700 signatures supporting established buffers, low impact development, and land conservation on the loop. The original plan was a good one, and we will be sending it to you all via email. With 36-year-old DRIs, 22-year-old developments, and 15-year-old scenic highway plans, it really is past time to make the Ormond Scenic Loop and Trail live up to its vision. So I asked the county to review, renew, and solidify its support which it signed the resolution on in 2007. Please address the items and the goals and the recommendations of the plan. We are in support of the 13.2 acres of conservation portion of the Dixie Ridge plan you will be making a decision on. And the entire trail the county staff is pursuing on the west side of Old Dixie Highway. Thank you for your time. John Nicholson. John Nicholson, Daytona Beach High. Um, two things before I get to my main uh, issue is, uh, one, I believe H says City Island uh, plumbing and restroom uh, improvements. Is that the City of Daytona Beach, City Island? If it is, we just renovated the ref restroom six months ago. So we're going to do it again? Okay. Uh, two, um, lease agreement on land, L and M. Uh, it's a $195 reduction. It's going from one company to another. Um, what's the normal rate? Everything else is going up in the world. Why are we reducing our uh, leases to public land? That's a little bit of a question. Uh, and then what happened in Buffalo? It's happening a lot. Uh, it almost happened in Daytona Beach. All right. Uh, we had a student, Emmy Riddle, who planned on attacking. All right. It, it's not something that's not gonna happen anywhere. It can happen anywhere at any time. Uh, we've had two uh, deliberate uh, attacks by black groups on, uh, one is a police officer who eventually died. Uh, we had a couple, a block or two for me, murdered on the way back from bike week, all right? So we have black groups, we have white groups. When I was a kid, there used to be gangs, all right? Everybody worried about gangs. Well, I don't hear anything about gangs anymore, but. What are we as a city, what are we as a county, what are we as people doing to find out what's happening in our community? Do we have gangs anymore that are uh, suppressing businessmen and whatnot? Do we have any of these um, outliers that are coming into our community? Because we need to be aware, because we don't want this to happen anywhere. We don't want any of our schools, God forbid, Pine Ridge, Seabreeze, Spruce Creek, get some nutcase that comes in decide to shoot up because they did that at Columbine years ago. So I would ask that we seriously look at this. It is an issue. Um, I never understood when we went to uh, Afghanistan, we allowed those uh, mullahs to preach hate in the mosques and did nothing about it. So they're creating these people who hate. Somebody on the internet or whatever created that monster who shot up Buffalo. He was, everything was distorted. We have to look at anybody and everybody who might distort our young. Thank you very much. Elizabeth Levette. Good, uh, good morning. Chairman Brower and Council. Um, I'm talking to you today about what else? The Florida Wildlife Corridor. It's the buzz on everyone's lips. Um, we had a great uh, summit in Orlando that was pit on by tech giant Arnie Bellini. And he is willing to come to Volusia County to help us um, save that portion of the wildlife corridor that runs through um, Volusia County. So, 
I wanted to start by saying that the Florida Wildlife Corridor is a network of lands and waters running through the entire state that must be saved as soon as possible if Florida's unique biodiversity is to survive. The Florida Legislature unanimously recognized the corridor in 2021 and Governor Ron DeSantis signed it into law. 90% of the state's drinking water is sourced from the corridor. Even if you don't like animals and wildlife, and some people don't, I think we all know how important the water is. Um, most of Florida's many endangered species call the corridor home, but time is running out to save the corridor. Florida's century-old real estate insanity shows no signs of slowing, and too many local elected officials view their job as simply rubber stamping development applications. Jeff Brower has been the exception that proves the rule. Sorry, I'm shaky, I raced here. Um, but time is running out to save that. I did that. More, more than one speaker at the summit made the scary point that there is only a decade to save most of the endangered lands and the bulldozers get cl closer every day. I was inspired by Orny Bellini, a Tampa tech entrepreneur who is deploying his fortune to make the permanent protection of the wildlife corridor reality. The summit gathered many dedicated scientists, government officials, state and federal NGOs, artists, and regular Floridians who really care and acknowledge one stark reality. We are either at a tipping point or a turning point for saving what remains of natural Florida. The next decade is make or break for the wildlife corridor. Please learn more about the Wildlife Corridor and spread the word. The Volusia County Wildlife Corridor already has its own website, VolusiaWildlifeCorridor.org. We're pleased to announce that Arnie Bellini's marketing team, Live Wildly, have agreed to update that and bring the marketing up to speed. And we want to market this Live Wildly campaign so people will get outdoors and enjoy what makes Florida so wonderful. There's a lot more to Florida than our beaches. In that, you guys have been given or will be given a pledge. And these, this isn't just for words, okay? This is not just words. We want, it, we want more than mere words. We want actions. It being an election year, I know a lot of people are gonna pander to this because they feel it will get them votes, and it likely will, but we really wanna see some action behind it. We want. It was unanimous in the legislation. I hope it will be unanimous in your signing and all of the candidates signing. Thank you. Sorry for the shaky voice. John Baker. John Baker, 9 Cunningham Lane, DeBerry, Florida. I'm here to thank Chairman Brower and, and your staff for meeting with us yesterday to discuss a project that's coming before you today. I want to really acknowledge the cooperation and transparency in that meeting. And secondly, I'd like to acknowledge, honor, and celebrate the upcoming retirement of one of my former co-workers, one of your planning uh, managers, Susan Jackson. I worked with her in another location. I uh, appreciate and I've tried to convey to you in other uh, uh, correspondence the appreciation I have for all of your professional staff, present and past. They are what make it happen. No matter how honorable you, what you do, you have to have dedicated, honorable, hardworking people to make it happen for all of us. Thank you. Did you just bring me one more? John Baker was the last. Okay. Thank you all for Can you stay for the item? Okay. Okay, thank you. That takes us to the uh, consent agenda, and I have a request from uh, Councilwoman Post to pull P, R, and double D for discussion, um, V for a vote. Are there any other items that Council would like to pull to discuss? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like LMN, all of those together, and then double A, just for discussion. L and M double A. Oh, L M and N. 
We, everybody else is good? Barb? Nothing? Okay. We have that pulled um, for discussion by Post. Post and Robbins. Okay, then uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda except for um, item V, which will be pulled for a vote, these others just for a discussion. Motion to approve, Wheeler. Motion to approve by Wheeler, second by Johnson. All in favor, say aye. Aye. So let's go to uh, item P. And um, I'm assuming Councilwoman Post is going to speak to this, or does she? I'm here. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, thanks for bearing with me today online. It's um, we're getting so much better at this, though. So that's good. <laughs> um, so item P Papa is the request to rescind the ECHO grant for the city of Deltona Rookery Park. I, I think it's Big Lake Rookery Park, actually. Um, the county owns 3.7 acres of it and uh, Deltona owned most of it. Um, they're wanting to not do this project anymore uh, or rescind it. And so they're trying to get out of the agreement with us. But um, just a couple things on it. Um, item or page just as a administrative thing very quickly page p17 megan if you could pull that up P17 is a very dark picture. Yes, so um, I just wanted to point out, so the whole reason we do the agendas, right, is for the public. And um, even even the one I got, they're all the same, um, totally discernible, undiscernible. So uh, what's the point of having attachments or information in our agendas uh, if uh, you have no idea what it is? So, um, and I think particularly to that, it was showing the parcel and I had particular interest in where it was. So. Um, but I think hopefully moving forward, either uh, we can make sure in the agendas that the, the items are either readable or viewable or not in there at all. And uh, but mo moving on to the actual item itself, I did have a question, uh, or I just actually just wanted to point out, uh, this is at the end of Snook Road in Deltona Lakes. I had someone ask where it was. so. That's where it is. Um, but also, uh, this is pointing out that in 2020s, the city of Deltona um, requested a project to actually make an area, um, a larger area of park um, that is now being taken away. So um, I'm not exactly sure of the reasoning for this, but I think it's important that we, um, I think that we as a public and we as a council uh, note as these things are happening, especially I know that we have a lot of environmental people in the audience. And Brad, I know that you're working uh, very diligently um, to ensure that we are uh, assisting in the environmental aspect of uh, county operations. So just wanted to point out, um, you know, we really need to keep on top of all of these things, even if we're pushing stuff through and saying that we're uh, setting aside areas for various things we have to make sure that the next year and the next year and the next year that those projects actually are followed through on and that they happen so um just as a uh, a really good lesson tool uh, just pointing that out that's all i had on on item p thank you brad did you want to add to that or are you good is he down there yes mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry um Brad Burball, Resource Stewardship Director. Um, the parcel actually that's owned by the county is in between the two Deltona parcels. And we gave them, through a lease agreement, the ability to use that parcel. Well, now that they're not gonna use it and develop it into a park, it will come back to the county until they make a plan in the future and they can come back with a proposal to get the parcel as part of a larger project. 
So we may see it again on Echo? Potentially. Potentially. So I have the city of Deltona <laughs> here, so I will defer to the applicant. Okay. Any other questions? Then we'll move to uh, R. Yes, and so our Romeo is the uh, approval of the volume license agreement for Microsoft Software and Services. And I just wanted to, if uh, I see Brian writing coming in, um, just wanted to applaud everyone in the room that is working towards getting us towards Microsoft 365 <laughs> and getting us uh, moving forward in this area. This is a huge, huge, uh, desperately needed thing and um, just really wanted to point out it. I'm, I'm very excited that this is happening and um, and that we're moving forward on this with Microsoft, especially um, a very well-renowned uh, computer organization. So thank you so much. That was it. Thank you. Uh, Double D. Yes, so I do actually have a question. I see Regina coming down. Um, this is to uh, this is to approve the amendments for the recyclable uh, terms and the ground lease for Gel Corporation. And um, I've had a lot of questions over and over, Regina, about, and I know we talked about um, the things that you can recycle in Volusia County. And since we're um, keeping gel and we're moving forward with them, um, can you just reiterate to the public? I saw um, there was some question because in the narrative, in the first paragraph, it references paper, plastic, glass, et cetera, for 2018. And just wanted to clarify, because I still have people seeing that and saying plastic, so we can do plastic bags now? No. Um, can we do glass now? I know that that was recently brought back in, correct? If you could just bring us up to speed on what's available. Yes, for the plastic, since 2018, we recycle plastic bottles coded number one and number two to cut down on contamination. And specifically, we do not accept plastic bags in the curbside program because those bags typically get tangled in the machines and causes downtime. Okay, I know Publix will take the plastic bags. Does anyone have any idea what Winn-Dixie or any of the other stores do? Just because I know I've had that question as well. Yes, I know Walmart and Publix do. Okay, great. And the, the glass? Yes, we're still recycling glass, and we are permitted at our landfill that we can put a mixture within our daily cover that does get us recycling credits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regina. That's a very important uh, segment. I know we all have a lot of questions on that routinely. Thank you. Thank you. I think also that you, you can take Winn-Dixie bags to Publix. They don't discriminate. They don't check. You just stick them in the hopper. And I'm sure, I had a couple things for today. <laughs> Great point. For them. Yeah. Do you need Regina back? Uh, probably just Ben. Ben. Mr. Robbins had a question for you. Mr. Barlow, there was just a couple questions I had. I saw in, in the lease agreement, it was for another eight years. Is that something that's set in stone? You know, with the market that's going up and down as it is right now in terms of recyclables, um, and looking at the cost effectiveness of this, uh, you know, we have an expenditure of almost $300,000. We're getting a return of $15,000. Uh, and that has been in place. Those fees have been in place since, I believe, 2014. Yes, the ground lease, it does increase annually by 3% as an escalator to the land lease. Do we have anything in place that is, is compensating for inflation and everything else uh, that's greater than 3%? Because ultimately, you know, what we're doing is, is really not keeping up with the times and we're gonna be locking ourselves in for another eight years. Is there any way we can modify this agreement to about a one year or even at the latest, probably two year because it's gonna be all over the place and if we break this down on our tax bill, uh, we have to be, we have to realize a couple things. Uh, costs everybody $6 per person uh, to recycle, another five to transport, so that's 11 more dollars on our tax bill. We're not getting a return. Is there, would that allow us another, to look at other avenues to possibly, another method of recycling or another 
um, a company that can do this better or cheaper, or give us a little bit higher rate than we're getting now? Part of the issue with recycling is it, it's a, a capital intensive. They've got to have all the sorters and all those machines. I think, uh, you know, we met with Gel recently. They're looking to upgrade those machines. So the length of the, uh, the extension, the eight-year extension, allows them to invest in that technology and, and, and see a return on it. Um, as to your question, I, I mean, eight years is, is a long time, but, you know, there's a, a decent chance that there's not going to be a, a, a huge change in, in, the, in the return on recyclable materials. Um, obviously, we hope that at some point it gets back to where it was, where it was a revenue source versus a, a cost. But um, I think, you know, this contract that's been in place has called for eight-year extensions, and that's to allow the, the company to, you know, provide that investment into the uh, large amount of capital equipment that's needed to do this sorting. I get it. I just, are we able to modify this or, or test the climate uh, to see if we could break this down? Like you said, eight years is a long time and a lot of things are happening. Um, it's not paying for itself now. We may have to look at, that would give us an opportunity to look at better ways or other technology uh, uh, to maybe accomplish the same goal uh, because, I mean, it is what it is. Most of our contracts have a certain clause and I can get with purchasing and see if there's, if there's something that would trigger an out clause if there was a dramatic shift in cost associated or a huge increase in inflation, just as if uh, their costs went up dramatically, they have provisions to come in and ask for a CPI adjustment. But if their costs went up so much more than what's allowed in the contract, I'm sure there's a clause in the, in the contract that would allow a, a renegotiation. I can get with purchasing and get you the information on that. If we can, and, and also too, if we could see as well, how can we get a little bit better return on this? 15,000 on 300,000 is pretty low. I think they can do better, you know, if we sit down at the table and kind of work, crunch the numbers. But um, I don't know if you need direction from us to to uh, look into that stuff or you can, if you can handle that at staff level. We're always looking at that type of thing, and I'll have Ben and uh, Regina talk to Jalcor, who's in the audience, and they're hearing you. So. Okay. Don't go. Barb Gertman. So I just I just wanted to say um, I think eleven dollars a year for recycling um, when we're looking at our environmental impact I think is a is a good bargain in my opinion for where we are and knowing the ebb and flow of uh, recycling and the impact on the community so um, I appreciate the job you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Ben Johnson. You know, at one time there was a lot of money in recycling. Now it's a drain, and I think there's not. I think y'all have done a good job of keeping it in a space to where we can work with it. Myself, I think we need to leave this alone. When you have people that are going to be putting mega bucks into a situation, they've in order to have anybody take and put this kind of money in, there's got to be some kind of guarantee that they're going to have enough time to recover the money that they invest. Otherwise, uh, if I was the people. I wouldn't invest if I didn't have the time to recover. And, and this isn't $100,000 or $200,000. I know it's a, a, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. So I support it as is. We still have names up. Is that just, and there they go. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Um, that takes us to uh, L. And then you want to do L, M, and N in a series. Yeah, it, it, this is just a brief conversation, but um, in 1976, the council approved agreement with Daytona Beach Archery Club to use four acres of unimproved land on the airport property. And it was amended in 1984, uh, 1989, 1998, and 2000. On 12 they were sent a notice of termination on the lease. I just want to show how things do work well with the county. We got with them, our staff got with them, they found another piece of property, because I have had a lot of phone calls from residents saying, you know, how could you do this? Found another piece of property in Port Orange, and we worked with Port Orange, and it's part county property also, and we've got this all taken care of, that they will be moved to that, their 
archery club will be moved to that area, correct? So it's a great way of seeing how cooperation, collaboration goes together. But I wanted everybody to know we didn't kick them out on the street. We got them taken care of. And Brad, thank you for working hard to try to find the property and getting it all put together. Do you have anything else to say on that? No, I just would say, you know, the, the, the archery club has been us, with us uh, almost 50 years yeah. as a very good partner who's even done some improvements on our property for us as well. So uh, we wanted to support them and find a solution as we move through this process. Thank you. Just a really good example of how we make things work. Thank you. And M. That's all together. That was all together. Okay. Uh oh. Going right through. Did you have double A? I did. You want me to go with that sure. one? Okay. Double A. This is just another, just a brief comment. Okay, so this is on the um, approval of the engineering for with Holland Ogle, so, um, architects, professional architectural engineering services for the vertical construction project. This is their the Marine Science Center Education Center, correct? correct. I just want to make sure because I'm hearing from residents in the Pond Sandlet area and everything to make sure they're at the table when we're, you know, that their staff and everything is at the table when they're planning that because they've been very sensitive to the grounds and land. So we are including them from what I read on this, correct? Correct, we'll make sure that they're included. Yeah, I just want everybody to know that so maybe I'll get 10 less calls. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think that takes care of all the items for discussion. We have item V uh, that Councilwoman Post has called for a vote. Um, let me get to it. Yes, so item V, Victor, is actually the minutes. Um, I've had many discussions with staff over the years about the minutes, but on the, the workshop, minutes, which is page uh, V Victor 21 and V Victor 23 is uh, good examples of uh, where I think we really need to be putting, I understand the minutes are, are a uh, condensed version of what's occurring, but when we say discussion ensued between council and staff on various things, uh, to me that's not acceptable. Um, especially when it's talking about what we are going to keep on the ARPA list and what will be eliminated. I think those discussions, <clears throat> excuse me, those discussions are very, very relevant and uh, the public needs to be hearing those discussions or at least reading those discussions. Also on V Victor 21, same thing, discussion uh, towards the bottom there, discussion and questions ensued between uh, a director and council. Uh, I think that those items like that need to be uh, need to be written out as part of the minutes. Um, we should not be holding that information back from the public. Also on B Victor 24, discussion and questions ensued between another director and council. I think when council, there's a reason that council has discussion with directors during uh, items and uh, it's very important that those get documented uh, and it makes it very hard for the public to be able to go back and try and find stuff in audio um, when it's not even listed in the minutes. So um, if we could just start working on that, that would be wonderful. Um, also just wanted to, if we could uh, hold this then for the next meeting to ensure that all of that information is included, that would be terrific. So that would be my motion to, uh, to table this till next meeting for approval. Okay, there's a motion on the floor by post to table V. Is there a second? I'll second for further discussion. And your motion is seconded by Gertman. And that we will discuss that. Um, ben, I think your name was up first. Okay. Vice Chair Barbara Gertman. So um, I guess my only question, is it, is it possible to include in the minute, in the minutes, um, the time that that discussion happened so someone could refer to it? Yeah. 
That, that was going to be my question too for staff. Can we put a reference in the minutes? Um, I think more people would actually listen and watch than read um, anyway. Right. That's that's what I'm saying. I, if, if that's the quote in, that the, in the minutes, can you reference the time frame for that discussion so someone could refer to it? Um, I don't see them including every word in the minutes. But if you have that reference, I think that's a good compromise. Yeah, we could take a look maybe like the start time of the item. That way you could uh, <clears throat> go through the recordings or and get at least to that item, which would make it easier. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to the staff that does the work uh, and see what they, uh, uh, would it be better to do that or, or to do the time of the discussion itself. What is archived? Just audio or is video also archived? Of, of workshops. I know they are of council meetings. Well, everything's recorded and everything's videoed. Uh, yeah, which neither that's required. That's just what we do right. over and above. Kevin uh, Captain, Community Information Director. So anything that we acquisition, whether it's video, audio, minutes, it's all captured. We also capture closed captioning as a complete transcript that is also available. And so when it comes to minutes, I would defer to uh, Mr. Dyer as far as the definition of the summation of minutes. Uh, I know we've gone back and forth over the years about how detailed we get you know, and what is legally required. We do our very best to get the details in there, but we also know that we can't put everything into the minutes. We do want to be able to provide those sources, whether they be audio, video, or closed captioning, to be able to reference back the detailed conversation. You know, today is a good example. Mr. Chair, you mentioned that we'll probably go till 8 p.m. And so some of these minutes that we're doing are 40 pages. And, and so, so we, we, we do want to be mindful of capturing the essence in brevity in the minutes, but then have those resources available for further drill down of commentary. And those are available. Archived? Yes, they are arch archived. For example, video right now is archived on both Vimeo and on YouTube, as well as a backup with, we work with IT where we have a three to, three to one method. We have three copies backed up on two devices, one that's offline. So I had a second, but I, I don't agree with tabling the item. Archive, um, county council meetings, workshops. What about Echo, Volusia Forever? Those are all, anything that we acquisition is all archived okay. according to the records management retention okay. for the state of Florida. I would, I would defer to Jenna on those actual time frames. Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure every one of those meetings, though, gets uh, videoed. They all get uh, audio, some captured. form of recording, but not necessarily audio, video. Yeah. Right. Okay. Or live, or, or live stream, but the audio is captured from the live stream. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Ms. Post would like to speak. Okay. Um, hold on one second. Heather, we have uh, uh, Ben Johnson and Michael Dyer. And, and then I'll add you, uh, Ben. To do what was asked would be too cumbersome. Every time we turn around, we're trying to give staff something else to do so it takes away from the work they have to do. The only other way to do it is to hire more people. Then at the end of the year, somebody's going to say, well, we can't pay for that. Minutes are supposed to be an overview. There's plenty of redundancy in here. If somebody needs to do it, they can get the exact verbiage by going to our archives. The next thing that will happen is we put it down in writing, then somebody's going to complain, that's not exactly what I said. Now we have it again to where somebody's having to go back and research it, and, and then it's a, it's a big issue. I even think Robert's Rules somewhere in there it states that this is just an overview. I'm pretty sure it's in Robert's Rules that this is an overview, not a word-by-word -word document. I cannot support this one bit. It's just another way to make government more cumbersome in our place. And there's not that many people, if they want to find it, they can find it. And they can find exactly what each and every one of us said and what time they said it. Thank you.
County Attorney Michael Dyer. Yes, sir. Uh, just from a legal standard, your, your minutes, just, just so you know, uh, you know, these are your minutes. They can be as uh, detailed as council wants. I mean, you're, they're subject to your approval. Your, you know, the minutes for this meeting are about 25 pages. You tend to have more, de you have more detail in your minutes than you're legally required to have. So obviously the more detail you have, the longer it takes to get them back to you to prepare. Um, you know, I think a lot of local governments now, because technology has changed, are able to, you know, for years, you know, we offered audio and now we're offering video of council meetings and we're able to share that more. Those are all things above and beyond. That's not required. The only thing you're required to do is have the minutes. So um, certainly could be as detailed as you like, but from a legal standpoint, you're, uh, you, you really, you've gone beyond what you're required to do. Okay, um, Heather Post, you, you hear the discussion, um, you're next in the queue. I, it doesn't sound like you're gonna get the vote to table this, so um, in whatever your comment is, please also comment on whether you would be acceptable to um, having these references inserted in the minutes um, of where to listen or to watch. Heather Post. So I, I certainly think that, um, you know, if we wanted to start providing uh, occasionally the what uh, time that the uh, minutes are referencing to, even just throughout the minutes, if we did it every every page or so, that would be fantastic for people. I know that I have gone back <clears throat> and tried to look through minutes before and tried to find things on video and um, in council, as a council person working on things with council stuff, um, that's like, I don't have time to do that on, on so many items. Um, I will say this is not, um, staff has done an amazing, amazing job. And um, Kevin, you and your team have done phenomenal with um, the improvements in the last six years. Absolutely, <clears throat> excuse me, with the minutes. Um, but um, two things were mentioned. Um, you know, number one, it's too hard and too complicated, which, you know, is, is never a good excuse um, every time I hear that, which is repeatedly. But second, um, that we can't be writing down every single word that everyone says. And that's in no way what I'm asking. Um, what I'm saying is I'm looking at the ARPA workshop minutes. <clears throat> and so I'd like for someone to tell me, I'm looking at the ARPA workshop minutes. I pointed out three different sections. Um, one was on page B, Victor 23, towards the bottom, and it says, discussion ensued between council and staff on what projects should remain on the list. That is the entire point of the workshop. Right? So, um, and, and it says, Mr. Wechtenwald spoke on the items that would be eliminated. I think that that is dramatically important to the public when they're looking at what's going on in the ARPA workshop. I can tell you that there's lots of things that are that are included in the minutes, which are phenomenal. Um, I see in the, the the meeting minutes where someone's talking about where I'm I'm applauding Derbyshire Place and what a wonderful job they do and how they they harbored a family with small children. All of these things are really wonderful to to highlight and to note. But but when we have specific things where council is having conversation with directors and asking questions back and forth on the specific reason for the meeting or the specific reason for the agenda, I think that those things need to be noted. Now, does it need to be word for word? No, because that's not what minutes are. It's specifically what the meeting minutes should be. And so let me read what the meeting minutes are. If you, if you Google it, it says meeting minutes are notes that are recorded during a meeting. They highlight the key issues that are discussed, motions proposed or voted on, and activities to be undertaken. The meetings Minutes of the meetings are usually taken by a person, but um, their task, number one task, their only task is to provide an accurate record of what transpired during the meeting. And so noting conversations, <clears throat> all this other stuff is great to include and certainly are parts of the meeting, but when council has conversations with directors or with staff about an agenda item or about the workshop, I think that those things should be noted. And again, it doesn't need to be a 12 page thing, but certainly noted and not just say, hey, they talked about it for a while. Um, but 
I mean, I would love to hear from anyone on the rest of the council how just that one item that I pointed out out of the three discussion ensued between council and staff on which ARPA project should remain on the list and which would be eliminated uh, are, are not important to, to be at least uh, placed in the minutes. Um, and the fact that we're saying, number one, I heard someone say that, well, not a whole lot of people look at it, oof, not acceptable. And number two, um, you know, that we're saying that there's lots of other ways that they could research it. Well, okay, then what's the point of having minutes? Um, so all I'm asking is that any conversation between staff and council on a legitimate question and answer period or the legitimate reason for the uh, for the meeting itself be, be documented and uh, so I am I am not approving this because I've I brought this up many times before <clears throat> with George and upper staff and uh, I think it should be included it's that's the whole point of minutes okay. thank you let's get you some feedback Billy Wheeler thank you mr. chair um, I, I agree that all minutes are important. You know, I'm the chair of the River to Sea TPO for Volusia and Flagler, and we have many committees, and we do a summary of the uh, minutes, and it just kind of basically hits the high points, but we always tell everybody to get a complete um, discussion of everything a complete analogy of all of the discussion that was had that you can go online I think we by far are presenting enough information that uh, the public can go in and listen word for word everything that was said and um, I, I do like the idea of maybe putting uh, every once in a while on a page a time element so if they want to zero in um, so I don't know if that would take a motion, but I would like to approve these minutes with the addition of maybe a time frame placed on each page or, or just to give people an idea if that could be done. Yeah, we're going to have to maneuver our way through this. We've, we've got a motion on the table to table. We'll have to deal with that. And then I, I was going to suggest what you just did, that we, um, we have a new motion to reference. Mm -hmm on each page discussion mm -hmm. topics on the audio or video they can zero and, in. and maybe even someone said and i know barb's waiting to speak may have been uh, barbara gertman that said somebody that we put at the top of each page just where that is so they can listen to any discussion in there is that doable time wise so so here's the good thing i, I think we can i think we can meet halfway YouTube, for our council meetings, we have listed the agenda item. And so if you're looking at an agenda item, you can scroll across and you can see the lower third, which is the graphic we have on the bottom. And you'll be able to determine what item you're on when you're reading the minutes. Now, when it comes to the ARPA workshop that Ms. Post is concerned about, that's a little more difficult because we don't have like the items in there. So I think right. for a workshop such as that, we can work with our team and sort of figure out where we can put a timestamp, a time mark that would commensurate with YouTube or Vimeo so that there is that reference. And maybe we do it periodically throughout the course of the, say, eight hour workshop. We do it every hour or, or Are they however. Transcribing they're... from the video? Yes. They take that, notes that during the meeting and then they go back and then they listen to it uh, through video or audio. Okay. Yes. Barbara Gerben. So I, I will say um, that I do uh, agree with uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Post that for the ARPA, identifying what those um, specific items were, I think could be beneficial. So um, I would also um, support the, I guess we don't have a new motion yet, but, but once, once we do that we um, do amend this, these minutes to address that. Um, but again, I don't think it has to be tabled for that purpose. Okay, and I don't see any other discussion, so I'll call for the vote. The, the, the motion on the table was to table the um, uh, motion by post, second by Gertman. 
All in favor of um, tabling um, consent item V, I think we can just do this by, by voice. Let's, um, say aye. I guess I'm an aye since I brought the motion, but I just, um, the whole point was to have it amended. So either way. Okay. Um, any opposed to tabling V? Aye. So the vote is um, one to six, so the, the motion uh, is not passed. Okay, so let's entertain a motion. If, if Barb, maybe if you would like to make it, that a motion to um, to amend with the items from the upper upper list for um, what was discussed as far as accepted items and those that will be taken off the list, um, but also for numbered uh, reference to be on the page where they feel it's appropriate based on the conversation. Second. Um, right. Was that a motion? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mr. Chair, clarification on that, please. Okay, let me get, we have a, the motion and the second by Wheeler, so we'll open up for discussion. Uh, Heather Post. So just clarification on that. So Barbara, are you saying that uh, the three various items that I pointed out will be corrected? That those items should be added, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Michael Dyer. Chair, if it pleases council, what I'd recommend is, why don't you let us pull this off and bring it back to you? Because you're asking for, as I understand it, some reference to start times. Staff needs to look at that, find out the best way to accomplish that, and making some substantive changes. We just need to bring it back. So you're asking seven. us to table it. If that's what the council wants, I think that's what you need us to do. I didn't hear you vote. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. that's good. You hear his recommendation. We can vote this motion down and then yeah. we'll bring vote to, to table this, to send it back to staff. I, I yeah. think we understand what you're looking for, so staff will bring it back. So we don't need a, a, a third motion? No, sir. Okay, but we do need to vote this one down in order to do that. Well, we can vote for this and then give them direction. Well, That's what I'm, I mean, why do we need okay. to vote it down? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think you need to see the minutes that you're approving, though. I think that's our concern. Okay. Uh, so if you want to vote on the direction, I certainly understand that, but we will bring them back to you, having the content that you're at, you're directing. So okay. we're tabling the approval? Basically, yes. Or, yes. <laughs> or amending her motion um, to give direction. Whatever so we want to do. We still need to it. wind our way out of the motion that's on the table, which was to reference these things without um, sending it back to uh, staff. So we can get an amendment to send it to staff. I am in the motion. Okay. All right. So the the amendment would be to send this item um, back to staff for recommendations of how they can follow through with our direction to add the um, references to audio and video. Um, ben Johnson. The only thing I will support is the idea of taking and and it can be a a time stamp even on page, you know, top of each page you get your close, or maybe one there and one in the middle. I'm not in any way, shape, or form for taking and putting more information in there. It's just gonna convolute it. It's gonna take and make it so, where does it end? Well, we do it here, we do it the next. The next thing you know, we have a New York phone book out there that nobody can read. And the idea is, is to get you a general overview, then if you have the interest, you can go and research what you need to research. We're about to find us a solution for a problem that really doesn't exist. Well, I think we're in a good place. The, the motion is going back to staff and they will bring it to a subsequent meeting, maybe the next meeting, staff. Um, their proposal for how to get this how to best do this with the best use of time for employees and the best use for the, the public, which is the ultimate goal, is to let the public see what 
it is that we're talking about up here. Um, yeah. Billy Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm not. I'm still not convinced that we need to table this. This is this is really drawn. But if we're instructing staff to just to add time frames, we're not adding any more actual content or meat. Um, you know, I don't know why that would have to delay voting this. Um, I I don't understand that. I don't think you are. Um, I don't know if you can even recall your, your motion again, but it was to, um, your motion was to reference the top of each page. Um, and the amendment is, however the staff comes back and says that this is. Um, well, I think also the amendment is to add the items from the workshop and that's what they're right. referring to. Um, outlining and again my concern is because it's ARPA and you know having whatever those few items were identified and I think that's maybe where the contradiction is here okay let's deal with that uh, amendment first we, we we're into this so we have to handle it properly the amendment is to add these ARPA um, yes sir conversations um, any other discussion on that? All in favor of adding the ARPA, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Call the roll, please. Mr. Johnson? No. Dr. Lowry? No. Ms. Post? Yes. Mr. Robbins? Ms. Wheeler? No. Ms. Gertman? Yes. Chair Brower? Yes. So the motion is not passed. Um, there was uh, four no's, three yeses. Um, to add the, uh, the ARPA discussion. Okay, the next, now we have the main motion on the floor, which is to, um, <laughs> to send this to staff to discuss. Yeah. The time stamp it, yeah. Uh, okay. I, I think the council could make a new motion to adopt the minutes or we could, uh, or to deny them if you, deny them and we'll, uh, we'll have to bring some, a revised version back. I got it in my mind. Okay, Fred Lowry. I want to make a motion to approve the minutes while giving staff direction to get back with us on the timestamp issue. Okay, motion by Lowry to approve the minutes and at the same time giving uh, direction to staff to bring this back with how to get timestamps on it. Is that clear? Is that close enough to what you said? Second by Johnson. Any other discussion on that? All in favor of the motion on the floor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, motion carries uh, six to one. So staff, please bring that back. Okay. Um, one thing that everybody sitting in the audience just learned is that we don't gloss over the consent agenda. I mean, as you can see, most items, a lot of items were pulled up for discussion and one for a lengthy discussion and vote. Um, uh, anyway, so that takes us to item two. I hope everybody out here brought their lunch. I don't know which items everyone's waiting for, but uh, item two is a retirement of Corrections Lieutenant Ralph Seltz after 34 years of service. I can't do this by myself, Ralph. You're gonna be.
Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of council. Today is a happy, sad day but for us. Uh, Lieutenant Ralph's, Ralph Seltz was hired October 21st, 1987. He was promoted to correctional officer in 1988, promoted to sergeant in 2006, and has been with us serving in the role of a lieutenant since uh, July 26, 2008. Over Ralph's 34 year career, he's received numerous EPNs, letter of accommodations, appreciations, caught in the acts for his professional and diligent assistance, dealing with inmates, handling difficult situations, and helping and serving those that are in our custody. If you were to read uh, Lieutenant Seltz's evaluations, you would read comments that include vast knowledge of his job, always cooperates with everyone he comes in contact with, truly a self-starter, always has a positive attitude, tactful and courteous with his supervisors, staff, the public, and inmates, open relationship with staff, easily approachable and encourages their input stays calm under pressure. Not that he's had any over the last 30 years, but jumps in and helps anyone where help is needed. And most importantly, has the respect of his peers, subordinates, and inmates that fall under his tenure and leadership. Although we're happy for Lieutenant Seltz and his family, we're deeply saddened as a corrections division. As you can see by the many, many uh, correctional officers, civilian staff that are in our presence today, Ralph was like, is liked by all. Not just was, but is. We still like you, Ralph. All right. <clears throat> Ralph will surely be missed and has impacted the lives of thousands, both, both inmates in our custody, staff, and folks that uh, he comes in contact with every day. Ralph, you have truly earned your get out of jail free card. <laughs> Thank you for a job well done. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me present Lieutenant Ralph Seltz. I guess we got to talk now. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate it. It's been, it's been a long, good career. I enjoyed working for 30, over 34 years here. I you know, like to thank my family, my wife, my kids, my mother, dad. Um, they had to put up with a lot of night shifts, a lot of holidays, a lot of um, weekends, missing out on lots of different things that people don't realize. But when we get to sign up for this job, that we miss out on things like that. Um, it's, like I said, it's been an honor and a privilege to work for the county, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Any of Ralph's family that's here that would like to be in the picture, please come up. Yeah, please scoot over. Could you two come down on this end? Don't break the camera now.
Lieutenant Seltz? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. This, this is Councilwoman Post uh, virtually. I'm, I'm terribly sorry that I can't attend today um, for my, my accident, but um, I wish I was there with you and your family to talk to you in person, uh, but I wanna deeply thank you for your service to corrections in 30 years or 34 years. Oh my gosh, uh, such a long time. But I'll tell you, um, I had a very long career in law enforcement and um, I know firsthand corrections uh, is way more difficult. <laughs> you are, we get to deal with a lot on the outside, a lot of the happy moments um, and uh, a little less of the negativity. And uh, on the inside, you're, you're dealing with a lot of, um, you're dealing with inmates. And um, so it's, a, it's an entirely different environment and uh, so much more stressful. Uh, and you really have to have a lot of different characteristics to work in that environment. And I applaud you for doing that. Um, I definitely applaud your family for uh, enduring the last 34 years for sure. I'm sure your wife can attest to that. And, uh, but just thank you so much for all your service to Volusia County and uh, even to the inmates. And uh, I wish you best of luck in your retirement. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. That brings us to item three, ratification of the collective bargaining agreement with the bargaining agent for the lieutenant paramedics for fiscal year 22 through 24. Donna Page. Good morning, Chair Brower, Council Member Staff, Dana Page Pender Human Resources, and here today with me are Liz Payne from IAEP, as well as our EMS Chief, Michael Coleman, Interim Public Director, Public Protection Director, Mark Swanson, and some of the members of the bargaining team. And we are here today requesting approval of the initial collective bargaining agreement between the International Association of EMTs and Paramedics, representing the Lieutenant Paramedics in the county. This is their initial contract, and the contract is a three-year contract. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Liz Payne, who's going to say a few words. Hello, Elizabeth Payne, the president of the IAEP Local 210. I first want to thank you all for the continued support for EMS that you continue to show. We had many great conversations with this leadership team, and I'm very excited to continue to work with them going forward. This agreement here is one of many positive steps that will take EMS to the next level as we continue to do. And the Supervisors Union, if you don't know, oversees about 200 rank and file EMTs and paramedics. And uh, aside from sending a good message to the EMS supervisors, this agreement's also gonna send a strong message to our paramedics and EMTs and uh, let them know that there really are good opportunities for development here with uh, Volusia County EMS, which um, <coughs> I'm sure as you all know of, what we're trying to do here is retain our employees. So um, again, giving this strong message they can develop and they can grow and stay here is gonna be a good one. And uh, what a perfect time to have this conversation during EMS week. So thank you all very much. Thanks. Morning, uh, Council. Uh, Michael Coleman from uh, EMS, Director of EMS. And I just wanna say this is my first experience with the uh, union negotiations and contract. and. Uh, Hopefully all the other ones will go as smoothly as this, uh, this one went. And I just wanted to thank uh, Dana Page Pender she, for her expertise in navigating this process with me for my first time. Uh, Heather Wallace also uh, at her side and our side to help us navigate that. And uh, Mark Swanson, the director or interim director of public protection. Obviously, uh, anytime you're having to deal with something that is this important, uh, and it's your first time, then obviously you want uh, the best team to work through that. So, and of course to the, the union group to work with us collectively and uh, go back and forth. And I think we uh, ended up with a, an outstanding product. So I just thank you to everybody. And uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Post would like to speak. Were all of you done? Did anybody else want to speak? Okay, uh, Heather Post. Yes, uh, 
President Payne, I know that well, last time you had come in, um, you had asked about the BLS uh, standard operating procedure to have that put in place. And if you could just speak to the status of that real quick. It, it's, you're good You're good to go? Yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, they have worked very hard at establishing um, a protocol section and a clearer criteria, and it is currently sitting in protocol. So I think we're moving forward in a positive direction as far as getting all of that clear and uh, easier to work with. So thank you. Friend thank you. And that's, move that's in place, or you said it's in protocol. What does that mean? Is that it? It's in effect or no? Yes, ma'am. Um, if you want to go on the website, you can look up the Belushi County protocols. And if you go in the 900 section of our protocols, you will see it is a lot more clearly defined now in that section. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I'd absolutely move approval. Okay, you want to second it? I actually Sorry. wanted to make the motion, which. Okay. Um, motion to approve by Lowry, second. Is there a second? Second. Second by Wheeler. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, didn't I just make the motion? Well, yes, but uh, you, you couldn't hear it, but Mr. Lowry had already made the, the motion to approve. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was still speaking. Okay. okay. Uh, same result, motion to approve by Lowry, second by Wheeler. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, we rescind the vote. Ben Johnson wanted to speak. Sorry. I think was, you did you were that almost on purpose. There. I just wanted to say as a recipient of uh, several of your rides, the only problem is y'all just took me one way and dumped me off. But I want to commend the professionalism of your outfit. You don't see them all the time, but I've actually been the user, and, and I've always felt like I was in fantastic hands. Uh, yeah, sometimes we hear some people that are fussing about it, but I think y'all do an excellent job and above average and very proud to have y'all as our provider. And I feel very comfortable when you would come out to get me or if you had to come get any of my family and just commend y'all for a job well done and an organization well done. Thank you. Ben, at One Way Trip, we all paid good money for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only problem is that some people wish they hadn't come back. <laughs> yeah, we're still paying today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're still paying for me, yeah. Okay, I think the, uh, the we didn't really rescind the vote. The vote, uh, the motion carried seven to zero. So, do you have, do you have that? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was, this was good to see. And that brings us to item four, budget resolution, um, application and acceptance of an increase in state grant aid for terminal emergency generators project. Good morning, Mr. Chair, County Council, Cyrus Callum, Aviation and Economic Resources. So items four and five are actually related, but first off, uh, item four is application and acceptance to increase state grant funding. Uh, originally back in June of 2021, we had applied for a grant in the amount of $1.6 million. And due to the bids that came back, we we're asking for an increase in order to cover the cost of construction for the terminal generators. So um, the amount of the increase is going to be two million one hundred and twenty thousand four hundred dollars and so our match will be one million sixty thousand and two hundred dollars if we do this will that halt the increases <laughs> <laughs> well if we do this yeah we we probably should definitely take advantage of the pricing that we have okay billy wheeler Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to make a motion to approve the budget resolution. Second. Wheeler makes a motion to approve. Um, Johnson makes a motion, makes a second. Any other discussion? 
it is costs are going up everywhere so we we have to get this locked in because it, they're not going to drop absolutely and you know I, I i dare not say the dreaded h word in council chambers but should we have a catastrophe or something we definitely need to make sure for business continuity purposes that the airport is able to continue to function in order to support emergency services or military or whatever the case may be however we're needed so that's the reason why it's probably prudent that we act. Yes. Okay, so all in favor uh, of accepting the increase in state grade, state grant aid for terminal emergency generates projects, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries seven to zero. All right, Mr. Chair, and so the reason for the increase in state grant is as a result of the bid uh, that we came back, AM Waggle, uh, they are the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, and their price came in at $3,645,338. So, um, my understanding is that there's probably a 600 day lead time with regard to supply chain issues as it pertains to generators. And so, uh, we definitely want to take advantage of this pricing uh, as it stands today because we're seeing all indications that those prices are only going up, so. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Johnson, <coughs> second by Wheeler. Any discussion? Then I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And you've got that one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. Thank you. That brings us to item six, contract with Ajax Building Company for professional construction management and general contracting services for the new courtroom at the Deland Courthouse. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council members and staff. Jim Corbett, Facility Management Director. Uh, this is part two of the um, contract we awarded to Ajax. Uh, this is the guaranteed maximum price for the third floor courtroom renovation, excuse me, addition. We are also renovating the second floor for the to relocate court administration down there. Um, as you can see, the $2.4 million is our guaranteed maximum price. Um, the reason for that high price, obviously, is uh, previously mentioned inflation. Soaring costs, we are also doing all work after court hours to not disturb ongoing proceedings. Um, you have an estimated duration of nine months. Um, there are several items in here, um, particularly that are, are high cost items. The, the woodwork, millwork associated with designing um, and outfitting a courtroom are relatively expensive. Um, we, we've seen the cost increases uh, go up substantially in the last 12 months as well. Billy Wheeler. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the contract with Ajax Building Company. Second. Barb beat me on that. Motion to approve by Wheeler, second by Gertman. Um, I, you, you anticipated, I'll open it up for discussion before we vote. You anticipated my questions. What, when I read this, I thought $2.4 million, not for a courthouse, but a courtroom. Yes. And I had asked staff, what do we, what do we get for 2.4 million for a, a room? The, I think the taxpayers deserve to know, you've answered some of it, that's working at night. And um, there's also, there's two projects going on. That's, that's correct, Mr. Chair. There actually, three, it's a three-pronged approach. We actually already moved the court records off the second floor onto the first. That was done in-house with facility management. Um, so now that we have that empty space on the second floor, it's going to be a full office build out for court administration because it was a records room. So there's, there's not a lot of infrastructure there to operate the administration function. Um, in addition, there's going to be some security upgrades, some fire uh, protection improvements. The audiovisual piece is a very um, costly expense to the court. Um, and there are the, the waiting rooms, the holding, holding cell, as well as some access control measures we're going to need to take to ensure that the uh, defendants are not brought in the same avenues that the uh, judges' chambers or the jury chambers are. Okay, thank you. I, I, on 
page 6 8 of the of what we were given it says um, exhibit B is plans and specifications I would have loved to have I, I didn't find them in there I don't see any plans or any specs I, I think that would be important to include so we know what a 2.4 million dollar courtroom um, will look like but um, I may be the um, the, the Anyway, I think that would have been really helpful to see that. Are, are they available somewhere? It says Exhibit B, Plan and Specs. I, I do have a um, representative from Ajax here. But I, as far as the plans and specs themselves, yes, we can get those to you. Okay. It's, it would have been nice to have them before the vote. So we, again, that's $2.4 million uh, for courtroom. Any other, uh, George Rectonwall? Yeah, I just, we certainly would make them available to council, but I, I don't think we would make them available to the public because there's a security element uh, to what he just talked about and how they want to have, uh, you know, separate movement of defendants, judges, and juries. So they don't want uh, that just uh, given out to the public. But certainly you guys, uh, if you wanted to see, uh, that um, we would make that available. Yeah, I just I, for for me, I think that would be um, that, that's really necessary. I understand your point, not putting it yeah, into the public, but how can I sure vote for something two and point four million dollar room that I, I have no? Is it gold fixtures or what makes it two point four million dollars? Absolutely understand and understand the question, and definitely understand the concern because I've shared it. Uh, myself with the team uh, but uh, we again we can make that available now and in the future we'll make them available uh, ahead of time should anyone uh, want that we'll make sure if we reference it that we have that readily available for you Ben Johnson thank you George. mr. chair I understand your concerns and uh, I agree with the county manager that it could be made you know in private I've had the opportunity to be in courthouses with security, without security, and it's changed over the years to where instead of a building where you can just march the prisoners through, et cetera, and, and take care of the judges and the staff. So it's changed over the years. So what really ends up costing is what you can't see. It's not just a room. For instance, like this, what you can imagine what it would cost us to redo this room. You've got the doors, the electric doors. You have the ones, different ones for the prisoners you have ways to get the prisoners and the judges out of there in case of a problem or to keep them from being in the middle of a problem. So it, it's a lot more expensive an endeavor than any normal building that you would ever have besides a jail. So um, like I said, I understand where you're coming from every bit, but I've, I've just been able to have the opportunity from the ground floor up on it from the old days to watching this one be built and going through it as it's being built and to understand where it's coming from. So that's that's where your big money starts coming from. Thank you. I, I understand. Again, it's a it's a room. I, I will take a tour of it. And you know, this is this is for a courtroom. Soon we're going to be looking at a courthouse, and that that's what really um, concerns me. If it's two point four for a room. Right. Yeah. You know, okay. Sometimes remodel projects are more expensive than starting from the ground up, where you can plan it. We'll see. Thank you. Um, okay. Any other discussion? All in favor of the expenditure of two million four hundred eighty-three dollars and and twelve dollars say aye. aye. Any opposed? I think the motion carried seven to zero. Yes, seven to zero, thank okay. you. Item seven, thank you. thank you. Item seven is renewal of property insurance through Brown and Brown Inc. Expenditure. Expenditure of three million two hundred eighty. He did, so. Nine, four hundred and thirty-one. So he came in and he Can said, I'm not even looking at your left leg. 
Can somebody let um, her know? I told him, I said, hey, I, I really could, could we also, I'm getting x-rays today, could we also it? get an x-ray of my left leg because the, I had a giant root. Yeah. Unless you had anything, I, th I think we're back. Okay. Does your mic work now? I think it does. Yes. Okay. Dana Page Pender, Human Resources. With me today is Charles Spencer, our risk manager, and in the audience is Justin Anselmo and Steve Farmer from Brown and Brown Insurance, who's our broker of record. We're requesting approval of a renewal of our property insurance policies. These policies are with various insurance carriers that are outlined in the agenda item. The policy coverages remain the same as last year with the exception of our unnamed locations in which we saw a slight decrease in coverage. With the current state of the insurance industry, we were actually anticipating a 25% increase. And while we did see an increase, it was at 15% as opposed to 25%. And at this time, we're here if you have any specific questions about these renewals. Ben Johnson. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve by Johnson, second by Gertman. Any discussion? Is this on this item? No. Okay. Um, would you make it clear, because I've had questions about this, where does the uh, the three million two hundred eighty nine dollars go. That's it's spread amongst it's for many insurance various carriers. carriers. Yes, it is. It's not to one specific one. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? We've got a motion to accept by Johnson, second by Gertman. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. Okay, item eight, ordinance 2022-18, creating article X sections, and the sections are listed here of the code of ordinances of the uh, of Volusia to be entitled local provider participation fund. Explain this to us. Yes, sir. Good morning, Laura Coleman, Assistant County Attorney. Um, back on April 5th, we came before you uh, to discuss the possible creation of a local provider fund um, that would allow Volusia County to participate in the state's directed payment program. Um, this program uh, helps to address some of the shortfall in the Medicaid program for Medicaid providers within our county. Um, the ordinance that's before you today is at, you know, brought back to you at your instruction. Uh, we worked alongside Advent and their consultant group um, and also in collaboration with Halifax to bring this back to you. The ordinance does authorize the creation of this fund. Um, as we discussed back on April 5th, every year in order to actually levy the special assessment against the hospitals that would participate in this, you will also be given a resolution that is not in front of you this year, that'll come back to you in the fall. Um, this is the vehicle by which you have the ability to levy the special assessment. And then every year, 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 we will actually be asked if you would like to do so. So again, this is to create the, the fund itself um, and it is in front of you. We have representatives from Advent Halifax and um, Adelanto Healthcare Ventures in the room today if you have any questions. Ben Johnson. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Johnson, second by Lowry. I asked this question of staff. Um, is Advent asking us to tax them? And that's, <laughs> that's really what's, what's happening. You know, I, I, I'm going to quibble with tax. It's a special assessment. But yes, sir, I think this really is, uh, to be clear, and it is actually in the body of the ordinance itself, this is something that would really only be assessed against specific health care providers, um, not against the population, anyone in the population at large. Uh, so yes, sir, in, in essence, I think that's, that's fair. <laughs> OK. We do have two members of the public that have asked to speak on this item. Um, Colleen Ernst.
Hi, Colleen Ernst. Uh, I'm with the consulting group that's been working with the uh, Halifax system and with Advent uh, on, on this initiative and with hospitals across Florida. Um, I'd just like to offer that if this ordinance is adopted today, uh, this will be the 19th local government. Uh, there are 18 counties and then the city of Jacksonville in its capacity as the consolidated government for Duval uh, have, have adopted an ordinance just like this one to allow their hospitals to tap into the available federal dollars. Um, we do have uh, some representatives from those systems uh, who are here to, to say a few words of, of thanks and to explain the impact of the program uh, if you'd like to, to hear those statements. I'm, I'm seeing heads nod up here. So. Hi, everyone. Kelly Parsons, Quietech. I'm general counsel at Halifax Health. <clears throat> this local provider participation fund ordinance really does allow uh, the county's non-public hospitals access to federal dollars. For Halifax Health, this is um, solely limited to the Medical Center of Deltona as our non-public hospital. And as you know, Medicaid serves our most vulnerable population, but there is a shortfall for those Medicaid patients. And this allows us to tap into some dollars and get some supplemental payments for that. It is an ordinance assessing ourselves, which is a strange ask, um, but it does not assess any um, any any member of you know citizen at all. It is to to these hospitals and providers. Um, we just wanted to say thank you to Laura Coleman and Mike Dyer for their great support and working with them to put this together so quickly. Um, and of course, all of you, uh, thank you. We appreciate all your support on this. Good morning, Council. Corey Delmeyer, Chief Financial Officer, Advent Health, Daytona Beach and New Smyrna Beach. Uh, like my colleagues at Halifax, we appreciate your support of this ordinance. Um, I think the key takeaway in this is it's a local provider participation fund that it is a tax to us, the facilities that provide services to Medicaid patients where we go uh, underfunded for the cost of the care that we provide to members of our community. And this just allows us to tap into the federal dollars that are available that are already there. If we don't tap into it, they will go somewhere else. So let's take the money that we feel that we deserve and put it back into our health systems to care for the communities that that we're so entrusted to. So I thank you um, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you for making that clear. Um, be before you come back up, uh, Jim Cameron from the public would like to speak. Good morning. I'm Jim Cameron speaking today as a private citizen, taxpayer, but uh, Local reimbursement for hospitals for uncompensated care, that's something very much important to me. And I'll be the first to say that I don't know about, what is it, IGTs, anything like what Ryan or Aaron would know, you know, on your staff. But if there's any way that we can get taxpayer dollars from the federal and state level outside of Volusia County, in here to Volusia County, to help our hospitals cover the cost for that care that they provide. I'm for it. I'm for it. I mean, I remember, I think it was like 10 or 12 years ago, in Tallahassee, there was the issue of Medicaid expansion. That was a big deal in legislature. And I remember speaking at a conference up there, I mean, just with the hospitals as it relates to uncompensated care. I mean, so again, it all comes back to the local hospitals, the care providers. So I'm supporting it and I urge y'all to as well. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I think you've heard everything from me that you need. So if you have any other questions, let us know. I don't see any questions. To, and we have a motion um, to approve by Johnson, second by Lowry. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Was it seven to zero or six to zero? Seven. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, Thank you really all. Really Item nine, um, proposed vacation of a portion of the plat of Coquina K subdivision, unit two, map block 48. Page 46. Good morning. 
Tad Kaysbeer, County Engineer. Uh, the petitioners, Mr. and Mrs. Lozano, are uh, requesting vacation of a portion of the drainage and utility easement on the rear of their lot, lot number 58 of Coquina Key subdivision. Uh, like so many other subdivisions at the time, there is a drainage and utility easement around the perimeter of the parcel for the uh, development of their house and uh, potential swimming pool and amenities. They would like to vacate five feet out of the rear 10 feet for a portion of that, uh, uh, that uh, easement on the rear of their lot. Uh, there were no uh, issues. Staff recommends approval. Thank you. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve by Wheeler and second by Lowry. Any further questions? I think every, I don't know what the other council members asked, but I bet they asked the same thing that I did. Is staff good with this? Do we need it to, and staff recommends approval, so. I'm happy to accommodate the, the homeowners. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'm going to assume that was another seven to zero. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. That brings us to item 10. Uh, requesting a small scale future land use amendment um, at 1781 Taylor Road, Port Orange, by adjusting the environmental system corridor rural agriculture land use areas. Clay. Good morning, Clay Irvin, Director of Growth and Resource Management. Joining to me today is also Carrie Lusinger, your Chief Building Official, Carol McFarland, who oversees the Planning and Development Services Depart Division, and Ginger Adair, who oversees their Environmental Management Division. Um, I'd like to speak about both agenda item number 10 and 11 at the same time. You will still need to take two separate votes since they are two separate actions. And Paolo has requested that I ask you to please identify any ex parte communication before I go into my presentation, uh, specifically to item 11, because that is one where you're sitting as a quasi-judicial board. Any council member have any ex parte to declare? Danny Robbins. I did, uh, Chair, thank you. I was out at the site. I spoke to uh, both uh, Mr. Irvin and the property owner uh, in reference to his uh, situation and, and options uh, that are available. Billy Wheeler. Mr. Chair, I just, I received numerous emails and I think I've got copies that we've received here again this morning. Okay, we'll make sure that if we'll have to make those part of the the record so yes. if we have those we can do that this meeting and I, I, same for me I received uh, emails and then yesterday I met with the county staff um, from various departments and residents of the uh, of the neighborhood um, surrounding this property uh, Ben Johnson emails and staff Michael Dyer Paolo, would you like to address the email issue, please? Um, well, this is mainly for uh, for the, the chair. So the, the list of people who were in that room yesterday, I believe um, Jane West, Lori Sandman, uh, Derek LaMontagne, John Baker, um, Kay Berniston, uh, Nancy Vaughn, Susie Peace, um, I think Kat Perro, uh, and then staff was, was in there. As far as any uh, emails, so you know we've uh, taken that as part of the record. So you know, as, as the essentially the emails that we received up until yesterday are incorporated and distributed to council. In fact, you should have a packet um, of emails and pictures that was sent yesterday. So, but anything past that, we can't take into it because there's not enough time to process that. So we did not include that as part of the record. And Paolo, if, if, uh, would that include the emails that council members have received? Yes, to, to the extent that you know we're available to them, but um, just forward those those emails to, uh, I guess, the the clerk, and then yeah, and then we'll yes, we'll make that as part of the official record. Thank you. So, so Carissa, thank, thank you. you, thank you, Mr. Chair. All righty. 
What we're looking at today is an adjustment to our land use and zoning line. According to state law, every city, every county in the state of Florida has to develop a comprehensive plan. One of the elements in the comprehensive plan is your future land use element. You're supposed to have a map. The map is, to pro is supposed to show approved types of uses, so it tells you the what can be built. You're also supposed to have implementing ordinances of your comprehensive plan. That's our zoning ordinance and our land development regulations. So the, the, the zoning tells you how. In this particular case, we have a property that is located on the north side of Spruce Creek in an enclave of unincorporated surrounded by Port Orange. It's on the south side of Taylor Road and it's approximately five acres in size. This gives you a depiction of what is going on out there in regards to the land use and the zoning because what you see here as the land use under current is also reflective of your zoning lines. We are mandated to have a consistency matrix in our future land use element. That's a fancy way of saying you have your future land use map, your zoning should correlate. And in times where there's a discrepancy, the land use is the one that overrides. In this particular situation in 2002, there was an amendment to change the land use on this particular piece of land. It allowed for basically the establishment of an ESC, Environmental Systems Corridor Line, based on the adopted, or excuse me, based on the location of the wetland line of Spruce Creek. This is correlating to one of our policies we have in our conservation element. This is a policy which identifies that when staff originally created the environmental systems corridor line, it was based on data from 1989, 1990. So therefore the accuracy was not 100%. And it was ballparked for lack of a better term. It identified where we thought were wetlands based on infrared and other types of data. The policy states that if you come in and you've got a jurisdictional line determined by St. John's, DEP, Army Corps, etc., and include that buffer that's appropriate for it. So if it's in Norma, it's 50 feet. Outside of Norma, it's 25 feet. That would be the boundary of the ESC. In 2002, the applicant did not request that. What was requested was basically this 200-foot corridor adjacent to it. They identified concerns from a staff perspective and as part of the PLDRC from, or excuse me, Planning and Land Development Regulation Commission in 2002, was the ability to deal with drainage, but more importantly, they were looking at the wildlife corridor that is in that area. Immediately to the east of this property, if I can get there real quick, you will see that east, or the right side of the screen, is the summer trees development within the city of Port Orange. This shows that we do have development that comes down to, and is actually intruding into the 200 foot buffer that we're requiring of this property owner. And what was the understanding of staff today of what happened 20 years ago was that we felt that we had to have an additional upland buffer to accommodate wildlife corridors as well as potential drainage. This is a high bluff. It's a very sandy area out there, so it's well drained. And unlike many of the wetlands we have in, uh, that are tied to our rivers and lakes, this has a very distinct bluff. So the wetland line is pretty well tied to where the wa high water line is of Spruce Creek. So why are we here now trying to get this adjustment? And the current property owners came in and got a building permit for a home to be constructed. On uh, page 10-3 of your report is the, um, excuse me, that, not 10-3. There's an exhibit in there that shows the approved plans that were part of the building permit application. What Volusia County requires as far as build, building permitting is what we call a plot plan, a form board survey, and a final survey. Those are the three times that we look at your property to make sure the building's being placed where it should be placed, based on zoning, based on wetland standards, based on zoning lines, based on property lines. So the plot plan means nothing's built out there. Here's the raw land. Let's go ahead and put in where the home is going to be. 
That way we can identify if there's going to be tree removal, we gotta make sure you meet setbacks, if there's any issues with regards to drainage, et cetera. We can look at it and see that in our plot plan. Prior to commencing with vertical construction, we require what they call a form board survey. That is basically a survey saying, here's where we're going to put the house. The surveyor's been out here. We've put out the form board so we know we're either going to pour the slab here or we're going to construct the stem wall constructed walls here. We do that to make sure that it's correlating to what was issued in the building permit. If it does, proceed onward. If it doesn't, you have to address whether or not it's causing a need for a variance or if there's any other issues with how the home is proposed to be located. In this particular situation, we had a home that was initiated construction. Uh, we did hear some concerns in regards to clearing uh, because the area has an RARC zoning. It is tree exempt, which means they do not have to get tree removal permits, but there is this environmental systems corridor RC area, which has a limitation on the amount of clearing that can occur. And that's no more than 20% within the RC area. We had complaints that they had gone in, cleared beyond the RC area, and that we needed to address it. We went out using our own GPS information. We were able to you know, determine that it was right at around 16%. They needed to stop after, once they got close to 20%. The permit was issued, construction initiated. Um, the home was shifted so that it was not where was identified in the plot plan that was part of the initial building permit. So the home with the building permit was shown 25 feet off of the eastern property line. It is actually constructed further to the west. By doing so, and going back to this, this shows you the approved plan that was part of the building permit. As you can see, unfortunately, we had to uh, shift this to the side. So right side is north, south is to the left. To the bottom is your east property line and summer trees beyond that. That shows the 25 foot setback, shows the 200 foot setback that's supposed to be maintained through the ESC area and then over to the right, 45 feet for the front, 25. So as you can see, the square, which is reflecting the new home to be constructed, meets all of our setbacks and is clearly located out of the ESC land use and out of the RC zoning. Unfortunately, that was not what was constructed, and this is a little bit harder to see. This is that form board survey. And what basically happened is they shifted it over approximately 30 feet to get a better view. The owners of the property felt that that was a better location for their home. Unfortunately, there was not an update to the permit plans. We, the move was done without coming in with revised plans, which are typically required anytime you're going to shift locations on site, so that that way we could review it to make sure that we wouldn't be facing this situation. Again, an effort just to make a better location for their home, unfortunately, has triggered this need. So what does that mean? That means that the southwest corner of this house is approximately 165 feet from the wetland line established for Spruce Creek. That means it's intruding into the environmental system corridor land use and the RC zoning approximately 35 feet. When that was brought to our attention, we contacted the property owners and we said, listen, you need to come in and talk to us about this because this is very serious. Uh, land use is one of the critical aspects about what can and can't be permitted. And right now you're intruding in areas that we need to work towards. They made a request after discussion with staff to reduce the total area within the ESC. Staff is relying on the 2002 decision by the County Council. Based on that approval in 2002, it was 200 feet along. So anything that would reduce that was not consistent with the direction that County Council had given staff back then, and we continued to implement. But we did see an option to come forward with an alternative. 
looking at the reasons why we have the buffer, why the ESC line was established was for wildlife corridor and for drainage, increasing the area around the home and giving them a reasonable use of their property outside of the structure itself by 20 feet would mean that the total intrusion into the 1.3 acres of ESC that's designated on this property by 2,500 square feet. So if we can make up that around either side, then that way we would see that the general intent of what was adopted back in 2002 is maintained in that the total area that's within the environmental system corridor land use and the RC zoning is maintained. The application went forward to the Planning and Land Development Regulation Commission. Uh, the applicant presented their request. Uh, staff presented the alternative that I just put out. Staff is also requesting if the County Council decides to adopt this amendment to both the land use and zoning map to have a conservation easement over that area as designated environmental system corridor. This will add another level of protection to ensure that not just the current property owners who are willing to work with us on this, but also future property owners will be aware that they cannot go in and do anything with this property except for keep it as in its natural state. Obviously, there's going to be a need to get access to a dock that has been installed. Those can be accommodated with a natural trail, and there can be some accommodations for allowing for that to be maintained. So we can work in regards to make sure that it is usable. But for the most part, what you're going to see is that any kind of excessive clearing will have to be mitigated. Any impacts to the wetlands have to be mitigated. And by placing the conservation easement over top, we're ensuring that it's going to be protected and maintained in its natural condition as, per, as could be restored. Can I interrupt you a second? Yes, sir. You won't lose your place, right? I hope not. Um, there's so much there, um, and I'm writing things down, and I'm thinking, we're, we're never going to get back to this. Um, first thing I want to say is, is an opinion, that there's nothing um, I can do to change it at this point, but the, the problem began in 2002 when we changed the, uh, the zoning and the land use of this area. And, and that's a problem with what happens in the county a lot. We change land use and increase density and property that was supposed to be preserved is, is not. This is, was a wildlife corridor. It's on an outstanding Florida waterway. And, and I might add one that um, is impaired and that we need to protect. And um, you mentioned and you, you brought up a picture of the city of Port Orange that is um, rapidly encroaching on the on Spruce Creek. Um, I have I went to Google Earth and looked at the area, and there's houses in Port Orange that are right on the river to the I think it's north of them, and, and on the other side of the uh, of the creek. So it's imperative that we do everything that we can to protect this. Um, protect that uh, creek. It is an important waterway um, and the wildlife corridor to protect that. And then we have the, the equally important task of protecting property rights. And that's where I'm struggling on, on this one. Um, one of the things that would have been really helpful, we've already discussed this on a separate item today where we didn't have um, we didn't have current pictures of what the property looks like. And I, I've seen that before in months past. The pictures that we have show kind of a pristine, fully treed um, lot. And that's not what it looks like at all today. My concern is that if, if in the environmental corridor we can't um, we can only clear 20%. You said somebody went out there and said it was 16%. I, I've got a picture I can give her to look at. It's like 60% has been cleared. 
within how, the, how do we get 16 percent out of that again that was prior to the construction of the homes it was uh, yes so prior to permits there, there's probably additional clearing that's going on that we have to uh, again would require mitigation for in other words restoration of the area replanting of the native species that were there um, that is unfortunately not uncommon in some of the areas that have the rc zoning because many of them in a rural area people don't realize that they have this restriction, they come in clear, and then we have to go back after the fact. We do have some pictures. If the Whose responsibility is, is it to tell a property owner then that you can only clear 20% of an environmental corridor? If we are contacted, we will let them know. Unfortunately, if no one contacts us and, don't, don't, and the public don't do their due diligence as to what the land use and zoning on their property is, then, then they're ultimately responsible for the action that they're taking. Um, we have available on site or on, on the, the county's website multiple ways of contacting our zoning staff to get zoning valid verification letters. Uh, you can go yourself onto our website to determine it. Um, plugging in by address or parcel ID will bring up our. Uh, online map kiosk and you can look at land use and zoning at that point in time and if there's any questions staff is there to answer any questions that you may have about that but it, it, anytime that you have clearing of a property without the proper permitting was something that we have to address through a code enforcement aspect and that's where we go through and we identify the violation identify what the remedy is which is basically restoration and a replanting. And so all that happens after everything that we do today? Yes, sir. How staff went out and expected, inspected the uh, form board. It was, it was not just boarded, it was poured yes, at sir. that time? Um, I will touch on that and I'll have Carrie Losinger uh, correct anything that I have that I'm saying is incorrect. What is happening right now is that we are seeing that inspections are being called for and there's a giant push because of the rush to get materials. In other words, if you have concrete being delivered, you want to be able to get going. The um, property was constructed with a stem wall construction. Additional work had been done. At that point, Sean Milligan, our chief building inspector. And wait, wait a minute. You went out to inspect form boards and there was walls going up? Well, well, no, we wait for the form board survey to be submitted. What we heard from the applicant, in other words, the property owner, is he was trying to get ahead of the game. He was trying to get things going as quickly as possible because he was having a pour coming soon and he was having his trusses delivered. So Sean, out of a courtesy, went out to look at the building code items that had been constructed. And at that point, he said, everything looks okay in from the building code, but we've not got the form board survey. If you proceed, you're proceeding at your own risk because without the form board, we can't finalize the remaining inspections because we don't want to approve something going vertical at this point that would be in violation of the setbacks or other types of situations. Again, we were going out there to assist the property owner just from that perspective. Carrie, did I miss anything on that? Carrie Losing, our chief building official. As Clay kind of mentioned, we're having a problem with our customers and our contractors with supply line issues just like everybody else. Also the lack of, of labor. Uh, this was stem wall construction. They had prepared their footers. They were inspected, they were approved, they poured the footings. They came up with their stem wall, which is it was block. I don't recall exactly how high the block is, five or six courses high. Uh, at that point, they prepared the slab, they put the plumbing, first the underground plumbing in, that was inspected and approved. So that was that is the point where we would do the slab inspection. We typically do not approve a slab inspection until we have the form board survey. The form board survey tells us the finished floor elevation and the location of the building, so we know it's within the setbacks. That's where they were having difficulty uh, getting the surveyor out there. They were held up, uh, and again, as Clay said, out of a, as a courtesy inspection, we did not approve the inspection. We did not result the inspection. 
Uh, they were told we could not do that until we had the form board survey. As a courtesy, our chief inspector looked at everything, said everything looks good per the plans, meets the Florida Building Code, but I can't approve the inspection until I have the form board survey. It's reviewed and approved. How come he said everything looks good? How come he didn't tell them at that point that they were over the line? He was not able to determine that. That's the, that's the purpose of the form board survey. Nobody was. Determine that the setbacks are, are correct. On a, on a small single family lot, the inspector can go out and see the property formed up. And if something, you know, you can see a whole lot better if something maybe is, is off a little bit. This is a big piece of property. He looked at the forms, he looked at where the, the stem wall was. That's why we need the form board survey to have that final determination from a surveyor that the property is located where it's supposed to be. So at that point, um, we left it at the contractor's discretion. If they want to go ahead and pour the slab, start laying the block, or do they want to wait for the form board survey? So was, the, uh, with, was the homeowner uh, informed at that time that it was, could be hazardous to proceed without those inspections? And all, all I can tell you is that our chief inspector told me exactly what I, what I just told you. Everything is good, everything's per the plans, Everything's compliant with the code. If you pour, you're going to pour at your own risk if you continue. He did not approve the inspection. He did add comments in the inspection result. And I'll read exactly what he wrote. Was on site as a courtesy to verify work. Beam, beam is the stem wall, beam and slab are to plan. No inspection can be resulted until as built is accepted. So he, he put those in his comments, he did not approve the inspection, and he indicated to me that he told them that if they continued, if they poured the slab, continued with their block walls, they'd be doing so at their own risk. Okay. If the survey came back and there was a problem, which is what happened, then and that's why we're here today. Okay, before you go, Ben Johnson. I'm a little confused here now. When, when our inspector was out there, was the slab poured? No, sir. So when he was there and said to go at your own risk, the slab was not poured, walls were not up. That, that's correct. The slab so, was prepped and ready. Uh, I'm sorry. Prepped and ready, ready for, to be poured. But had not been poured at that time and was warned of the consequences. That's correct. W which is correct? You just said the slab wasn't poured. He just said it was poured. The slab was not poured. At the point on, on February 24th, when our inspector was out there, the slab was not poured. And they indicated to the, to the builder, everything met code requirements, everything met the plans. If you pour and continue with the pour and then start putting the block walls up, you're doing so at your own risk. Did that answer your question, Ben? We, we have been doing our best to accommodate customers and co contractors. We did this very thing yesterday, exactly what we did here. And we explained to them and we put it in writing uh, exactly what the situation was because I don't want to have to repeat this again and I know y'all don't either. I don't either. We're trying our best to work with our customers in these difficult times that we're, we're dealing with right now. And, and I understand that the, it is an unfortunate position to be in because there's as I read through this as I've talked to people in the neighborhood yesterday as I've talked to staff what I see is that grace upon grace upon grace has been extended to the homeowners and at every point there was there seems to have been an intent to just plow ahead regardless of what the law says of what they're allowed to do and you know but the libertarian in me um, understands that it's better to ask uh, um, forgiveness than permission but that doesn't work here this is a again an outstanding Florida waterway it's an outstanding place to live I understand their desire to have a good view. What I don't understand and what we're being asked to decide is either tell them to tear down their house and move it, which nobody up here wants to do. Everybody up here wants to extend grace upon grace again. 
But in order to do that, I need to know that the homeowner at some point will have some consideration for the property that he's on, the water that he, that he wants to look at, the outstanding waterway, and it's not been followed to this point. Out of 16, 20% that could be cleared, before we ever got here, 60% was clear. And I, I can put the picture up. Clay says he has pictures. All the property was clear. There's no, there seems to be no respect for the rest of the people that, that enjoy the, this waterway where they want to live. And so what assurances can anybody up here have that anything we require them to do now will be carried out? That, that's the struggle. And Danny, did you want to ask him a question before he proceeds? Okay. Is that Ken? Yes, there we go. See if it works now. How about there we go? Okay. Thank you. It keeps going <laughs> off and on. In regards to what can be done to ensure that the conditions we're putting or that staff is identified and your planning and land development regulation commission is identified is basically this. The conservation easement has to be drafted and recorded prior to us initiating the removal of the stop work order. So in other words, if that is what the county council agrees and wants to have done, before they could proceed on with any further action out there, they would have to have the conservation easement recorded. We would modify, obviously, our land use maps and our zoning maps. At that point, with the conservation easement and the ESC land use, it's very clear that that area is to be left alone. The only thing they would be able to do is do the minimum plantings that they have to do to, for the restoration requirements, and that's about it. After that, it would be left to be in natural state. These are the photographs that your staff... Wait, what assurances do you have that that would be done? Well, we would not allow them to proceed on with any further work. In other words, the stop work order is still in effect. They would not be able to proceed on with any construction. They would not be able to finish out the inspections. They would not be able to install the trusses. They would not be able to do the interior build out. They would have to, they would have to put all of that on hold until we have the conservation easement and have that recorded. But they, what if they do? What if they put the trusses up? Then we, we have the ability to take them through Code Enforcement Board and put stop work on and, and, and prevent. So you can, you can halt the uh, CO? Yes. Okay. okay, I'm sorry to interrupt, go ahead. No, 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 that, those are legitimate questions. What we're hearing from uh, the public is how are you going to prevent this from happening again in the future? And, and unfortunately in this particular situation, Emotions have gotten very charged about it. And so what you're seeing is that there's a, a concern with the motive behind why the Steinharts are doing what they're doing. From a staff perspective, we can't get into the motive. All we can do is look at the facts of what's going on in the property. And from a staff perspective, we're looking at what can be done to restore the corridor that was identified back in 2002. We feel that we cannot, we may not be able to hit the dimensional 100% in that we don't meet the 200 feet, but we can definitely hit the area and we can put in the conservation easement that was originally identified in 2002 and we can continue on and we can use that as a way to ensure that not only the current owners, but the future owners are aware. If they violate it, we have the code enforcement process to take them through that. And so, Again, we would be able to, you know, levy the fines that are appropriate. If it's irreparable damage, it's upwards of $500 a day. So again, we do have a means to enforce not just the violation, but also if there is any kind of impacts to that conservation easement. So these are some uh, photographs that your staff took. Uh, this is early on in this uh, process. This is looking towards the south. You can see it. They cleared out an area that's the creek uh, further in the back. If we could go to the next one, please. This is looking back towards the north. 
The majority of that area is zoned RA. So therefore, they are tree exempt and there is no exemption, or excuse me, no restriction on the amount of clearing that can occur in that area. So please understand that when you start looking at these aerials, anything towards probably the northern 60% of the property is RA. And that is an area that they do have the right to clear in. Could have the next photo. This is again looking at the building. This is looking from uh, Spruce Creek towards the north. As you can see, the, what would be the portion of the building on my left is the portion that's in, uh, sticking in approximately 35 feet into the environmental system corridor land use and RC zoning. And this shows you that they have vertical walls up. They have stopped at this point. Okay, next one, please. And this gives you an aerial show, uh, as you can see, it was taken January 29th, 20, 2022. As you, there's the dock that is constructed. There's the uh, stem wall at, prior to the pouring of the concrete. That gives you an idea of where it is. Um, it's hard to pick out, but those smaller buildings in that prior photograph are just to the, approximately just, um, see the red line on the bottom? That's where it's generally located. So that gives you a, a sense of the depth and everything else. To the north or to the top, you can see the single family homes that are in summer trees. You can see the uh, uh, screen enclosure for a swimming pool in that person's backyard. Uh, just for reference, uh, Port Orange requires a 50 foot up on buffer from the Spruce Creek as part of their resource corridor. Um, again, what staff is coming to you with in the Planning and Land Development Regulation Commission is identified as a mutual way of addressing a problem. The owners of the property, and I'm not going to get into motive or anything else, made a decision. Unfortunately, it, the misunderstanding of the building process in regards to moving the building and not asking for permission on that has resulted in this. We're not here to crucify anybody at the same point in time. We have to realize that there was a policy decision made by the prior county council as to where the location of that environmental system corridor line is, where that RC zoning line is. We are trying to respect that. The 2,580 square feet that this corner of this house is intruding into can be mitigated by placing that additional area on either side. That will ensure that we have the area that was originally approved in 2002 protected. As a, another measure to ensure that not just current but future property owners understand the importance of that corridor, we are requesting that the council make as part of the condition for the approval of the amendment to the future land use and to the rezoning to allow uh, to require a conservation easement to be recorded prior to the county staff releasing the stop work order on the building permit. I, I know that there's been some questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you want to ask your question now, Danny Robbins? <clears throat> yeah, that's fine, Chair. Thanks. Uh, just a couple things that I have uh, or I'd like to talk about. We're dealing with a uh, ultimately an arbitrary line. Um, there's some discrepancies there. I, you know, there's several things wrong with this. This, how this went down, uh, and the the blame can't all be put on the landowner. Indeed, this never recorded back 2002. We're dealing with it appears that your own uh, not admission but recollection of everything that also there's some old data from 1980 to 1990. Uh, there's no real tree survey that was done in this area. We don't know if it was actually underbrushing or uh, tree removal. There's not 60% clearing within the RC corridor. It's actually much less than that, not justifying it by any means, but much less than that. What I want to do is make sure, uh, like the chair, that, that some of this stuff doesn't happen in the future. But what we probably run into is the what-if game. And we can what-if ourselves to death, and we don't know what we don't know. And ultimately, what we can't do, uh, in my opinion, is um, keep keep the land or, or punish the landowner, you know, excessively. Imagine stealing a, a six pack and, and getting uh, sentenced to the death sentence. It's a little unreasonable. 
You know, and there's been instances uh, kind of in that own area within, I'd say, the last 15, 20 years uh, where, uh, whether it be in Spruce Creek Circle, a quiet place, where folks were just required to replant and not turn over their property to the government or the government to take their property and say they can't maintain it. You know, I don't know where the landowner sits on this right now, but I'm kind of curious why we've kind of skip that step or giving him the opportunity to not just replant uh own up take his licks eat that crow and uh replant some natural habitat uh to what was uh, possibly affected um i don't want to you know like like everybody else probably don't want to see your house get tore down you know i think that's a little much but uh to, to really go above and beyond and, and really nail this gentleman to the cross uh I don't think that's right, you know, but because uh, this happens all over and there's mechanisms in place that uh, to, to mitigate these issues. I agree that this waterway has to be protected, but without an actual site visit, uh, I don't know if you can get the full effect from just a picture uh, of, of where, uh, of, of exactly the, the terrain and, and, and what we're looking at. But I'm kind of curious to see, uh, was this an option? Did he have an option or does he have an option on the table? to replant whatever was in question, because there was mistakes made, and I, it's probably evident uh, uh, from a lot of different angles, whether it be uh, verbiage from the inspector on our, and even though it didn't give him permission to proceed, but everything looks good. Um, I, I think we gotta be careful with this one on all angles, but I just wanna make sure the, that we afford him the same opportunity as everyone else and be consistent in what we do and also to educate any landowners in the area that uh, how important it is to, to, uh, to preserve and, and protect this uh, area the best we can. Billy Wheeler. Wow, I probably spent two days just on this one item. This is the perfect storm. This is what we don't want to see happening and we're seeing it happen too often. Um, there's just errors flying all around. I, I do have a couple questions. Um, it says in January 2021, the owners applied to have the ESC RC boundary line administratively adjusted to allow the home to be built closer to the southern property line in Spruce Creek. Such administrative adjustments are authorized pursuant to the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance and it's here. I'm reading it on, <laughs> what does that mean? So it doesn't have to come back. To, to clarify, what happened in 2002 is the county council approved both the land use amendment okay, and rezoning. Okay, so that's referring to that. Okay, unfortunately, the staff back then did not modify the maps. Right. So the maps themselves reflected a different look. They were basically, and I, I'll find it in your document. Uh, there was a letter from Palmer Panton with an attachment that showed what was the previous error map and the adjustment we made to ensure that what was approved by the county council in 2002 was reflective in the land use and zoning map. This adjustment that they're asking for here, we cannot administratively change. That's why it's in front of you today is that one, it is flying in the conflict of what was previously approved by a prior council, and it's outside our capabilities of doing so. Okay, so then we're going on, it says in January 2021, the owners applied to have the boundary administer, wait a minute, that's mm -hmm. following approval of the line adjustment, the owners proceeded to obtain a building permit for construction of the home. Uh, the contractor for the property owner commenced with construction but shifted the location of the house without amending the permit. I, do we not have good communication with contractors that know that they're not to adjust without getting a revision and a permit? I just see lots of things where people were taking the liberty of doing, this is prime property of what we're all up here to try to preserve this you can't replace this and um it, it i i'm 
upset that the council is having to deal with this backload of errors and uh, uh, yeah, I don't even want to go there on who's the contractor, but the, the liberties that were just taken, and um, I can tell you right now, the only thing that I would even consider uh, approving is that the area, only the area of encroachment of the house and 20-foot maintenance buffer be calculated for the area of amendment. And the proposal affects only a 25 180 square foot around the house that may be mitigated by adding the equivalent area of the ESC RC to each side of the property um, that a conservation easement be recorded over the ESC RC area prior to release the, the stop order I'm, I just feel somewhere we have to let people know we're serious we're serious uh, we're serious on on violating these environmental things that we have set in motion. And, uh, you know, I understand construction and concrete and everything else is, is uh, hard to get, and when they get them and all that kind of stuff, but that, unfortunately, does not eliminate the responsibility of being given this wonderful gift of being able to purchase this prime property. Um, I'm, I, I just see a whole lot of situations here that I'm not happy with. Ben Johnson. You know, in law enforcement, we always said, don't do two things wrong at the same time because somebody's going to catch you. Don't be drunk driving and jump and run to a stop sign. And, and I'm very much a property rights person. And if I was normally looking at this, a simple variance, and I, I still don't know where I'm going because I'm, I'm torn. And, and if it was one thing, the variance, I would say, okay, let's let's look at it. But let's look at some things right here that really bother me. And I dug into this thing deep. A garage roof. It was designed to be one way. This is a garage on that piece of property. Correct me if I'm wrong. The design came in. And during the construction, it was done differently. Now, understand it probably is better. But the problem is, is it was done in a manner to where it wasn't inspected correctly. And, you know, a lot of these standards came in because of Hurricane Andrew. So it was added, oh, yeah, it's a better roof, but instead of coming back and saying, I'm going to do it different, I'll just do it my way. We have a boathouse on that property. That was supposed to be 500 square feet. That ended up roughly, I've heard different figures, 700 and some square feet, with also... Four ninety nine. I'm hearing difference on how it's measured, but also with poles left in the ground, that looks pretty obvious. That planning to add to it more. You don't just plant poles, twenty foot poles in the ground without thinking about doing more with it, because those poles are expensive. Mountains, it's expensive. So I, I, I don't go the idea that you put the poles in the ground not to do anything with them. You have land clearing that was done when you weren't supposed to. You know, the tree removal. And then you have moving the house. You thumb your nose at everything that's come along. And, and I have a problem, you know, if it was one little thing, this wouldn't bother me. I'd say, hey, let's just go, because I hate to see anybody spend their money and their, their lifelong dream, but you've encroached on every rule that's come about. I have a problem with that. And like I said, I'm very much of a, of a land use, you know, it's my property. I should be able within reason to do what I'm supposed to be doing. But we have blatant violations of rules all the way down the list. And, and I've got problems justifying in my mind how far can we go and how much are you going to do to fix this situation when we turn our back. Now let's go ahead and add to the boathouse. Let's go ahead and clear some more land. Let's go ahead and add a, a room onto the back of the house. This ends up in people and how they end up in the principal's offices because they don't follow the rules. And, and it is a real, it's a struggle with me. And like I said, it would not be a struggle if it was a one issue thing. I would not have any struggle whatsoever. I would look at it and say, let's make the variance. But I, I've got some problems here that I've got to listen to some more of it. 
but I've got my issues because of so many different, and it's not minor. One's minor. Four or five is not minor. That's when you start to violate all the rules and say, I'll just beg for the forgiveness. Beg for the forgiveness off one or two, not four or five or six. And therein lies the problem, uh, Ben, very well expressed. And Danny, I, I'm not sure I understand your reference, but I want to assure the homeowners that I, I don't believe there's anybody up here that is trying to crucify you. Ben just expressed it well. There's been grace after grace after grace, warning of what to do, what not to do. You proceeded to go and go along anyway um, and, and just keep building. Um, so now we're in this position where we have, we have lousy options. Staff has tried to come up with a reasonable option and we're all up here trying to figure out, um, Will this be the end of it? Will you follow through? And what happens with the next property owner that says, hey, I don't have to do anything that the environmental corridor says because they're just gonna, they're not gonna act on it. Uh, they'll warn us, we'll do it anyway, and the county council will say sorry because we're nice people and we don't wanna tell you to tear down your house. It's a bad position to have put in, have been put in. Um, Clay, can you tell me, or, or Paulo, either one, who, who was a contractor? According to our records, Ameritech. Who is Ameritech? Uh, Ameritech Homes. Uh, they're, they're the GC? For the permit, yeah, Amer Ameritech Homes, I believe it's Mike Bickerstaff. Uh, they are the contractor of record. Are they here? I don't know. Have they ever been to the property? I do know that uh, Mr. Bickerstaff has been to the property with our deputy mm -hmm. building official. I understand at the PLDRC meeting that the blame was put on a surveyor. Did the surveyor survey the property incorrectly? No, sir. What, what came out of it is plain and simple. The placement of the home was to the west to about 30 feet plus or minus. By shifting it over, it moved the southwest corner into the environmental system corridor land use line because it travels along on a northwest trajectory from the south or from the east side to the west side. So when you shifted that rectangle over, that corner got put into it. Then the surveyor came in and was measuring rather than parallel to the wetland line, he was going on a straight northerly to the line. So that created some confusions there. After we established it, our staff went out with our submeter GPS and verified the location. We've got it all wrapped up in regards to the specifics in regards to the location of the corner of the house, how much it is actually into the environmental system corridor. That's where we were able to come up with that estimate of 22,580 square feet. I think that's referenced on page 10-3 of your report for the land use and 1113 of your uh, zoning report. So after you went out to verify what the surveyor had said and, and did it, uh, properly, what what was there? The was it was it poured? Were there footers? Were there it, stem it, walls? It was construction. Okay. It, what you saw in that image that we brought up was in place. Okay. Barbara. And while she's looking for the image, Barbara Gertman. Um, That's an aerial, and then one more one more back. That. Clay, can you speak to the staff recommendation again? Because um, what, what I appreciate is um, when the staff comes up to a barrier, I appreciate that they are looking for an opportunity, an alternative to still service the customer and, and make the best of sometimes a bad situation. Mm -hmm. And that's what I believe the staff have done. So can you just um, repeat that? Yes, ma'am. When this, this came about, um, obviously we were concerned because the environmental system corridor area through Spruce Creek has been the uh, topic of many people's attention. Uh, you can see that there's concentrated efforts on behalf of the cities and counties to try and do something about it. As was been stated, it's an outstanding Florida water. So, 
are first and foremost, was there irreparable damage to the extent that what was identified as a needed corridor in 2002 was damaged beyond that limit? Looking at where the house was and giving them 20 feet, again, we came up with an estimate of 2,580 square feet of intrusion into roughly 1.35 acres, 3335. So in the grand scheme, that is not a significant impact if it's mitigated with that same area being placed on either side of the home. Mm -hmm. Because again, we're looking at a corridor. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, the area gives it a lot better viability as opposed to just a simple dimension. Now, I have to tell you if it was a massive violation, I don't think you would have the staff recommendation in front of you. Mm -hmm. The fact is, is that we had to look and see where it was landing in order to make sure there was still a viable use of that corridor mm -hmm. and still not impeding on their ability to use their property. <clears throat> we further saw that in 2002, prior ownership offered a conservation easement. It was drawn up, it was never recorded. We feel that this time we will not allow that to occur if that is something that the council feels is warranted in this particular situation. If you do, again, we would recommend that it be done and recorded prior to release of the stop work. The whole point behind it. How did it happen the first time that it wasn't recorded? I don't know. It, it was prior to my tenure here by about 12 years. <laughs> so uh, at that time, I was at Port Orange. So I don't know what happened here. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, I, I, just, I just appreciate um, staff looking at a broader way to still try to meet the need. However, um, we're in a time where we're trying to reduce the impact on our environment and, and the damage. And we need um, homeowners to work with us because what's happening is on the other side. When it's not their property, they're gonna hope they want to hold us accountable, right? And we've got to hold them accountable as well. And again, look for the best alternative and the best way forward um, with the least amount of impact. So um, I certainly support um, our staff's recommendation. And uh, Mr. Chair, if I, if I may, um, before you allow the applicant to, to present, um, just a few things on, on what you're actually looking at. So there's two items. Uh, one is the comprehensive plan and the other is the rezoning. And, um, a, a comprehensive plan provides this council with the largest discretion it can make on a land use matter. What you are doing is you are making policy. Here the policy is whether or not to essentially adjust that boundary that was set in 2002 um, in the way that either staff is recommending with the conservation easement or you know the way that the applicant is presenting. So that is that allows you to take into account a lot of information um, and opinions from the public because you are making a policy decision. So the standard is um, very deferential. Um, any information just needs to meet what we call the fairly debatable standard. And what that means is if, if two reasonable people can differ on an item, then you know a reviewing judge will defer to the decision of the council um, if it kind of meets that low threshold. So um, you know if. There's, there's some guidance on it. So if you check on, I guess, page 10, 11, all the way to 10, 12, you have the policies for the environmental kind of systems and the environmental systems corridor. So essentially your determination is, you know, will shifting it this, you know, in whatever way the council deems, um, does that meet the goals, objectives, and policies of those, those essentially those policies in there. Um, other than that, the other item, item number 11, is your standard, standard quasi-judicial rezoning. That's really dependent on item number 10. Fred Lowry. Thank you. I have heard uh, Mr. Johnson list the things that he listed a while ago about one after the other, and I understand that. 
uh, that that's not doesn't make me happy either. But things change in 20, 30 years, and I'm sure when people fail to file whatever the the mentality or perspective of environmental things were different back then, maybe didn't see the need. Can you kind of summarize? Obviously, there's some problems on both sides. Can you kind of summarize on the other side where maybe uh, things weren't filed or things were done to cause a little bit of fogginess about this? You understand what I'm saying? In other words, being fair and looking at both sides of the balance. In other words, uh, if there were completely no issues on our side, then I'd be very upset about this and be wanting to vote against it. But if there were some issues that would cause me to uh, look at both sides to see that there were certain things not done. I think that first and foremost, we've not heard from the applicant and we've not heard from the public. So I do believe that's critical for you all to hear from the applicant before any kind of decisions obviously are made. So therefore, I would allow for the Steinharts to be able to clarify because they may have a differing perspective on what's been said. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to, for you to come back though when they get done because uh, I'd like to hear the things that wasn't filed or whatever. We, we've met, things have been mentioned uh, well, I, in kind of gunshot matter, and I'd like to kind of see those listed a little bit if I could. Well, just to kind of give you the, the 10,000 foot view, what you see is that permit applications that, that require very specific plans that have to be signed and sealed to show compliance with the Florida Building Code, and there has to be information showing that it complies with all local ordinances. We review that by a multitude of staff. Those specific those specific standards are tied to the plans that we approve. As I was showing you with the, this is, uh, this image right now is available online through Connect Live. If you went to their permit, this is the permit plan that was approved. Those are our stamps. It shows the 25 feet, the 45 feet that are required on the sides and in the front and then it shows the 200 feet. And Chair, you were asking, like, couldn't our building inspector see that? The fact is, is that there is a large area that you could place this building within the RA zoned area. So at that point, we really wouldn't say anything until we saw the, the um, form board survey, because again, there is a considerable amount of space. So that's what we're seeing is that there's, um, I think a misunderstanding of how important those plans are and how adherence to what is shown on those plans is necessary. And if you choose to deviate, you have to come in and amend the plan prior to actually working. That in, in a nutshell is what has occurred here. Okay. Well, what I was getting at was you had mentioned there was something not filed some years ago or whatever. Oh, that was the conservation easement in 2002 by the prior pre, uh, property owner. And then you mentioned something about a surveyor uh, did not get, that, that's, that's what I'm getting at. There were the items along no, the sir, other there, side. Of no, sir, the, the surveying aspect, uh, you know, uh, there's a belief that the surveyor got thrown under the bus at the Planning and Land Development Regulation Commission. We just wanna make sure everybody, the surveyor was doing what the surveyor right, was supposed right. to do. So there's, there's a situation where it, we had to correct how the form board survey was depicted. And okay. that was basically it. Okay, thank you. Good morning. So before morning. I begin um, my speech on Valerie, this morning, I just wanted to say that it kind of breaks my heart more than this whole horrible situation that I feel like our character was kind of not, it's not true what was said and I feel Again, our ignorance has led us here, to be honest, and I feel like it has only hurt us because I didn't know and I don't think all the people that support us today um, knew that you could email you guys or, or have a meeting yesterday and all those things. And so I'm sorry, but we have made mistakes. Um, not all that you've heard. I've talked to some people behind me um, in person and asked them, like, why are you so angry? What did we do? And if you were to actually ask the staff, like, what have we done wrong? Some major things, yes. But, like, the dock was all right. And we've done our best as layman's people that we can to do everything right. And I'll tell you more about that. But the dock, they tried to say we put on the neighbor's property. Um, I will. Just hold on. 
but they had the wrong GPS equipment. It wasn't accurate. They came out with more, more accurate equipment. It wasn't on the neighbor's property. Then we started getting a lot of angry people coming at us because it was too big. So um, we had, when that all went down, we actually shrunk it from original plans and made it smaller so that it would meet the, the requirements from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which is 500 square feet. And that's where you were talking about, Mr. Johnson. We're yeah. 700 because the county's square footage regulations is 750 square foot over the waterway. So we noticed that the outstanding waterway is only 500, so we shrunk our dock to make it 490. The mistake we made was that... It, everything's permitted and done. It's completely finished. I don't recall. I don't recall no, what it says. No, sir, it didn't because we didn't realize that that when we, we there's two permit. There's actually three. Um, the first permit was to Volusia County, and we <clears> didn't know all of that was our first initial a uh, permit. And then we went to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which is actually under 500. And it's actually kind of confusing if you're just a regular layman's person. Um, if it's on a regular waterway, it's a thousand square feet. If you read further, it's an outstanding waterway. It's actually 500 feet. So we took off some of the walkway to meet that requirement. But our mistake, as just unaware, is that you have to get the plans redrawn, get them resubmitted, which we did. It was just after the fact. And during all of this, it didn't look good. But it was not ill-intentioned. And, and I don't think, are there poles that are not connected? I The poles that you saw or that so many people are talking about are the poles that were going to be the bigger dock now we're only doing the boat lift. We're not doing anything over the waterway. So those poles are staying up. They're basically there. We have a little walkway. It's like an H. So one side is a small upstairs, and then downstairs is the two boat slips that are over the water. It's but yeah, I mean, even to take it out would just <clears throat> be more work. And if you were to see it in person, there's no reason for us to continue that walkway. We're not here for the dock. I understand. I'm just saying. I just want to address that because it hurt my character. It hurt me because I don't want to ever think that like. You know, I'm that type of person that would just blow through stop signs. That is not us. It's not. And there wasn't a back room built or anything. I don't know. I don't know what you guys heard, so I just wanted to say that. But um, I'm going to say my piece now. Um, we've both lived in Volusia County our whole life. We grew up admiring Spruce Creek and the beauty that surrounds it. Um, Rich has been a fisherman, and I have an aunt that has property on the Spruce Creek. So, of course, it's always been a dream of ours, as it is a lot of people's. Um, as a teacher and a firefighter, it's it's only been a dream. It's to ever actually own a piece of the sacred waterway. Until 2021, our realtor called us with a rare opportunity to own this five-acre parcel. And of course, we didn't hesitate. We literally sold everything we owned and we bought it. Um, it was really a true dream come true. And since then, we've done our due diligence to build our home in respect of the beauty of the waterway. We're not a major land developer. We're not unaware of our responsibility to protect in this gem, although I will say we've learned a lot along the way. Um, we are everyday people. We're not versed in measuring boundary lines. We started this process by hiring a biologist to come out and mark the wetlands. And I actually have my own slideshow. I don't know if it's available. And while um, that was okay. our first, the first due diligence we did was hiring a wetland biologist to come out just so we knew exactly where the wetlands are, which is right there. It's basically the bank of the creek. Yes. Then having these properly added to our survey, <clears throat> and we were learning this along the way. I mean, literally, staffs just every day calling, trying to figure out what to do next. Um, they that we follow the correct guidelines and measurements. Um, we have cleared an area that was measured by Tom Hanna, which I know you guys already heard about. Um, and they also said more clearing. No, 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 no more, more clearing. clearing. We've actually let a lot regrow on the sides that came back because, again, we didn't know. The, and and I wish we did. We would never. We have no. We didn't gain anything from clearing anything like that. You know, there's nothing there. There's nothing gained. We can't see. And that's another thing I want to address. And I'm sorry. I keep skipping all over. But we did not scoot the house over to um, get gain, a better view. get a better view. That is incorrect. We actually scooted over to be more centered in the property. And if you can remember, um, the, the, the RC line is diagonal. So in trying to center the house a little more, we scooted into that line. It was not, you can't see any better here or there. It it's wasn't the intentional to go into anything. We just trying to get a, a little bit farther from the neighborhood, which was actually his house right there. He's the only one that 
is really been a, opposing us in this whole. Everybody else on the on the street that are our, our neighbors have been for us and over with us. Unfortunately, they're not here today. But they were. We had neighbors. They were here on the, the last PDR meeting. Deal. Okay, we walked with Brenda from Environmental, and she inspected our parcel parcel for gopher tortoises and other environmental impacts that may be affected. There was one that was found by the driveway and one at the front of the property. There were other things mentioned about how what happened to the gopher tortoises. I don't know where they find these things. They're in the documentation. But locations were noted and deemed safe to continue with permitting when we measured the home uh, for the home site. So this is where, and this hasn't been brought up yet. Can we go to a slide that shows the 200 foot line perhaps? Um, no, it may be on <sighs> the staff. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so on this one, if you, when you measure 200 feet, if you measure on the property line, the line, we are not within the line. After all of this happened, we just kept saying how, I don't understand, it is too, it's well beyond the 200 feet. And the way that you have to measure the RC line is not, it's actually at a 90 degree angle from the creek. So you would have to actually go on the neighbor's property and pull that 90 foot line or the 200 foot line from the creek to meet that measurement. So basically what she's, nobody depicted this in the beginning. They ultimately, all they said was stay 200 foot from the creek. That was it. No, there was no, nobody knew the 90 degree, not even clay, not, and, and nobody. There was one person that found that out after the house was up. So when they said stay 200 foot from the from the creek, we basically went to the corner line, came up 200 foot, and then went to the other property corner line, came up 200 foot, and flagged the line. We were behind it. Even moving the house over, we were behind it. Once we put, and being five acres, we didn't realize that it was a, this, we literally just moved it 25 feet is from here to you, basically. It's really small distance, but so, just to get away. Right, so then we found out that that's not how it's measured. It's measured 90, 90 degrees, degrees from, from the, the bank, line. which would be from the neighbors going this way, which put us in this situation. Um, so here you can see the survey was completed by Halifax Land Surveying, showing the house completely in the RA zone. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to us, the proper measurement is 90 degrees from the waterway and not in a parallel fashion. This miscalculation has placed us in an unfortunate position emotionally, mentally, and physically, financially. And as you can see from the image on the slide five, we cannot even view the creek from the home. Placing our home here with a corner of it in the resource corridor would not be something that we would ever intentionally do. Yeah. Can you give those back to him and you, you got to give it to the clerk, I'm sorry. Right. Okay. So, um, Mr. Brower? Chair Brower? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, whatever he's standing out, since I can't see that, is it possible for someone to email that to me or? or put it on the screen they're, they're doing that right now we just had them all collected and given to their clerk thank you so much okay so this mouse mi this miscalculation has placed us in an unfortunate position emotionally mentally and financially and as you can see from the image on slide five we cannot even see the creek from the home placing our home here with a corner of it in the rc would not be something we would do intentionally this error has brought our dream home build to a screeching halt and brought unknown effects from builders and banks and it cost us $5,000 to be here today. We have gone through the daily motions for the last two months while trying to calm the panic we feel not knowing the results of our mistakes. It has been a lot to bear. We would like to rectify our mistakes while holding up the integrity of the nature of the creek and also honoring our rights and dreams as a property owner. In regards to a conservation easement which was discussed in 2002, so we want to go forward and we, we want to work with conservationists. It's not that we are trying to just plow through and just, you know, clear this. We're, we're willing to plant. You can come out every year and see. You can check it out. Do what you need to do. Um, that is not our concern. Our concern was to build this home for our children. That's it, period. It was not to, if we blew through a stop sign, it was probably because we didn't know it was there and I mean, it was it, not intentional. We're not trying to put a neighborhood up. I mean, the people that are complaining are in this neighborhood with the whole house. 
All this neighborhood looked like this property at one time. And the people that are complaining have bulldozed everything in this property and put houses right on the creek. And I'm putting, trying to put one house 200 foot from the creek. Okay, so, so we would like to rectify this by not taking away any RC land. We're simply going to request that we can just move it. And when I say move it, it's still gonna be as close to the creek as possible. Um, <clears throat> and we would also like to do the conservation easement. Um, we've talked at length about this. We've already actually had it kind of written up. We are prepared for it. We know what it entails. We've done our, we talked to attorneys about it. We have educated ourselves. Um, According to the staff report, the 200-foot distance was discussed in 2002 to protect water runoff and the scenic view of the, the passerbys. And um, as you can see in slide six, and as you guys have already heard from others, it doesn't affect those things. Um, we do have a 50-foot upland buffer, which is hard to see on aerial, which is why I think, you know, when Danny says, if you're not there in person, it's hard to understand. The buffer is really intact. So you still have what you probably can't see much on aerial views because it's basically 50 feet straight up. It is still tons of vegetation that was untouched. Um, thankfully, uh, the Spruce Creek frontage on our property is still intact and it does offer the distance it needs to protect the stormwater runoff. Um, that line at that time was not like a scientific line, it was just an estimate. So it is with great regret that we found ourselves here today and we ask that you please consider this proposal, which still upholds the end goal of conserving the creek while also giving us our home. Um, I want to reiterate that we are going to keep the ESC use the same and we are willing to add area to equal the amount impacted. We are not asking for more. Um, we're just changing the location due to an honest mistake. Um, and we have had numerous letters of support. We had a lot of people here for the PLDRC meeting. Unfortunately, they could not be here today. They were adjacent neighbors. We've had other creek owners that are in favor. And um, it's heartbreaking that I have to stand here. I already knew it would be heartbreaking, but to hear some of the things that were said was a little much. Um, that was a lot. And I would like an <laughs> opportunity just to briefly speak after public comment, if it's possible. Also, I just want to reiterate that a lot of the video and pictures that you're seeing of the sugar sand and the clearing is basically where the house is. Obviously, the people that are opposing us are taking pictures of not like this. This is from our waterway. This, this is how much we've cleared. So literally, you, it's super thick. This, we enjoy and appreciate. This is what we bought out here for. I mean, look at that view. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we do have a number of members of the public that want to speak on this. Uh, William Steele. Good morning, Council, Don Hunts. <clears throat> um, my name is William Steele, and my family resides at 6049 Spruce Point Circle in Port Orange. We're in the Summer Tree South <clears throat> subdivision, which duly adjoins the property being discussed today. Uh, property uh, in, in question runs from south to north, and <clears throat> we adjoin that. The new house being built and the RC zone is directly by our home and adjacent neighbors. We purchased our lot in 20, uh, uh, 2019 and we moved in in February of 2020, uh, February of 2002. I bet I'm getting my things wrong. Um, so when we purchased the land, um, we saw that there was a resource corridor, the survey of the property um, behind us was owned by Hart and Jenny Long, and he was a dentist in a great family in Port Orange. We knew them, we rode horseback with them back there, went fishing, and as they got older, they wanted to dispose of the land and they subdivided three areas into five acre lots running from the creek north. Um, the, the property in question, of course, is the first one closest to summer trees. Um, in uh, late 2020, Thanksgiving, December timeframe, we noticed that there was clearing beginning we were very concerned knowing that this was our C zone. We began to look into it and found out that the property was sold in 2021 of January, even though clearing had begun and we have pictures of tractors and everything doing cleaning, 
clearing. The clearing wasn't in the northern part, which was RA. The clearing was being done in the RC. We were very upset, all the neighbors. Um, okay, so as that, as that happened, and they did get uh, uh, the rezoning using the 200 foot, which was what Mr. Long had suggested to the county because he wanted to subdivide the lots and wanted to allow that 200 feet uh, for people to have a little more room on the lots. Um, the, I guess I'm understanding now the land use was changed, but the zoning was not because the zoning map still showed that it was approximately a third of the property was RC and our house was way south of that. So any building would have been done far up above us. So we, were, we felt we were okay buying the property. Um, after they did get these, this 200 allowance, uh, the clearing in the RC zone did continue to a point where as council has said, pictures will show and uh, surveys will show that it is probably 60%, not 20. And that zone now is, uh, has taken every bit of buffer between myself and Southern neighbors so that we look at the side of this gray wall. If that's my time, I have a lot to say and I know council has a lot to hear. Uh, the, the, the RC is bulldozed, cleared, and graded. It is nothing but soft sand right now. In this area, okay, there has I'm, been I'm sorry, though. We got, we've got a lot of people that want to speak. Okay, the last thing. There's motorcycle traffic, all-terrain vehicle traffic, car traffic, truck activity. There's a trampoline, smoldering brush fires, firearms discharging, chicken coops, rooster coops, and this is all on the border. In. Okay. Uh, and, and the last thing I was going to say you. is we welcome the Steinharts. We don't want them to have to move anything. And when they talk about rebuilding the RC and they stay all around, okay. we would Thank like you. the RC to go Thank along you. with our property. You're going to ruin it for everybody else. You <laughs> called a point of order. Derek LaMontagne, you have three minutes. I hope you can kind of see. Is you got to speak into the microphone. Can you check if the camera's showing up? Yes. Uh, which one? You do see it? Okay. But you're burning time. Okay, great. Uh, well, that's something else. Can, can I start back on until this camera's working? Okay, never mind. Um, I just want to say that what has happened on this property nearly cost me my life uh, a little while ago. I should just say that I had to go to the doctor during the planning commission meeting due to health effects raised from stress and other factors that has gone on for the greater part of over a year on this property. I feel that what has happened here is a massive violation. I, am, I pride myself in calling myself one of the, an environmentalist and uh, serve on many statewide uh, you know, boards. I was environmental uh, chair of Port Orange and basically uh, this is the worst thing I've ever seen on the environment, ever. And I do this for a living. What has happened here is, is, is awful. It's not just the little modification here that you're talking about today. It's a, it's a series of, of things that include, uh, again, I, I, I basically have just been receiving nothing but, but comments from, from people living near there. Just, they're so sad. I, I just, I'm heartbroken. I mean, I am a person who's heartbroken. My emotion, my finances have been affected too. I, I've, I've lost thousands of dollars trying to figure out what's happened. I've not taken a job because, you know, this is more important. Uh, I want to just say that there is a solution, though. So I want to just come to say that I've I presented a map here that basically if, if the, the owner is willing to, to add more resource corridor to their property, then I, I, I think that could work. But what is currently pro proposed by the, the, uh, the staff is just it's not enough, for one, because it's nothing planted now. I think if they take the whole northern section and if they're willing to put that into RC corridor, that's touching Gamble Place. That's one of the places that needs that connection. We need to have a, a corridor along the east side next to the neighbors. If you say, I will put a, at least like a 50-foot buffer all along that east side plus something on the north, I mean, yeah, at least some, some more buffer, that will create some of that corridor. The purpose is to keep the corridor. So we don't, don't just have them, you know, creatures that are going to try to go along the creek but it's a super high slope. And just so you know, the, the quality of the, the, the statistics say that 
If you have a higher slope, the buffer is supposed to be bigger because stuff falls right into the water. So for an impaired waterway, we should be, according to studies by the UF uh, uh, Center for Wetlands, it should be over 300 feet. That's what it should be. So we're already encroaching under 200 feet. So it's a huge thing. So if you are willing to add more buffer all around the property, if they're willing to do that more than what's proposed today, then that perhaps is a solution. The other solution is just remove the foundation that's there now. And, you know, but one of those two I would recommend. Thank you. Thank you, Lori Salmon. Hello. My name is Lori Sandman, and I live at 2580 Spruce Creek Boulevard, and I'm here as a concerned citizen. I'll be brief. I sent two letters to the council, which um, the point of was to describe the, uh, the fact that it's larger than the single incident of, of mistakenly building a house. The house was built, and there were plans that are as built that are different than what was permitted. And the same things occurred at the dock, and the same thing apparently occurred in the clearing situation. Um, I am not here to criticize my neighbors or to criticize staff or to criticize any matter before this council. I am um, here because, and, and I wanna make it clear that I also am a believer in individual land, landowner rights. I'm here to advocate for those who can't, who can't, and I mean specifically the, um, the rare plants, the migratory and water birds, the endangered animals that share the community. And um, I just want to reference back, I was here for the uh, meeting talking about the Doris Leaper Preserve where we talked about investing a whole lot of resources in what is directly downstream from the Spruce Creek. So um, when I was at that meeting, I heard Mr. Young, uh, who was the presenter, speak of local imperiled species, the Florida scrub jay, the eastern diamondback rattler, the eastern indigo snake, gopher tortoises, great her her egrets, reddish hair egrets, snowy egrets, herons, the American alligator, and the manatee all live in this space. And, um, I want to be clear that there are thousands and thousands of these rare and endangered creatures that are residents of this community. And what we're talking about is the rights of one landowner in the face of the existence of a whole lot of imperiled species that depend on us being able to um, enforce the laws and the ordinances as they exist. Again, with no disrespect to my neighbors or to this council, I think enforcement is absolutely necessary as we watch building continue, and, um, and we need to take enforcement seriously, and, and I just would request that you take a look at my communication and, and read it in that light, that we can't continue to allow a single landowner to impact um, so many other very important plants and animals um, and also uh, residents. Thank you very much. Elizabeth Levet. Elizabeth Levet, uh, Volusia County environmentalist. Um, I just want to say to start, Ben Johnson, you deserve this. You about made me cry. I actually agree with everything you said. Um, yeah, so um, I, I feel for the applicants, um, but caveat emptor, if I were going to buy a parcel of property on um, an outstanding waterway, one that I loved so much, I would get great counsel. Um, if they're saying that the property line was moved, the property was moved, unbeknownst to them, the contractor did it, I mean, that all just kind of, you know, sounds wonky, but wouldn't their recourse be to sue the contractor? Wouldn't there be a recourse for them? 
Um, they made a naive decision to build a home and they didn't do their due diligence. And at some point, this council has got to be firm on following the rules. I mean, we've got this set of rules for this person and this set of rules for this person, and it changes all the time. Florida Statute 70406 governs conservation easements. It talks a good game about retaining land or water areas predominantly in their natural, scenic, open agricultural or wooded condition, retaining such areas as suitable habitat for fish, plants, or wildlife. And such conservation easements shall be perpetual, which means forever, at least in the dictionary. But then comes the sneaky part. A conservation easement may be released by the holder of the easement to the holder of the fee, even though the holder of the fee may not be a governmental body or a charitable corporation or trust. Yes, you read that correctly. Conservation easements can be very easily removed. Our state agencies do it all the time. For example, the St. John's River Water Management District routinely releases conservation easements. Apparently, Florida conservation easements are only good until a development deal comes along. This giant loophole in Statute 70406 must be closed to make the Florida Wildlife Cor Corridor safe in perpetuity, and we need perpetuity to mean perpetuity because it doesn't. So these are all just kind of decorative window dressings, if you will. Um, I want to I want to take you to an even bigger picture than this little picture here. You, there's development going on on the north end and the south end of Spruce Creek. Spruce Creek is going to be gone, according to the experts that I spoke to at the Wildlife Corridor Summit. And these are real experts like Tom, Dr. Tom Hochter, who spoke to me at length about the development of Williamson Boulevard going straight from um, Port Orange all the way through Farmton. Mori Husini Drive, whatever you want to call it. I think it's going to be called Deering Parkway, actually. But if this goes through, Spruce Creek will be destroyed. Their swamp will be gone, there will be a man-made lake, and the north end will be cut off completely. Thank you. What happened to the the county staff. <laughs> no, I, I'm serious. When I when I see the attorney or the or Clay go out with one of the count, I want to know what's being said. Um, this is a public hearing, and it needs to be publicly presented, not behind a closed door. Pardon me. Chair, before we know what's going on, let's just see. Well, I'm not making an assumption. I'm making an observation that Clay went in the hall with a county council member to speak about something, and I think in a, an important public hearing like this, it needs to be public. We have one more and ask. person. Right. We got the entire county staff deliberating this in the in the hallway, perhaps, and I, I want to know. We have one more member of the public, John Baker. Now we have two more. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chair. I understand there was a concern. Yeah, I just wondered why everybody was in the hall when I saw Clay go out with Mr. Johnson to uh, possibly to discuss this. This is a public hearing, and I want I want the public to have um, the benefit of that information, whatever it was. Okay, I'm happy to speak to it. I, any member of council can ask me a question at any time. They can do so privately or publicly. Mr. Johnson is free to address the comment. I have nothing to hide, I'm just doing my job. I'm listening to everything that's been said. We also hear it back there, but the idea is I'm trying to find a mutual solution all the way around to make sure we do what's right for all the general public. Because this is a very serious situation. It has long-term impacts. As a matter of fact, from what I heard from our attorney, that it, whatever we do here could affect us in future times and other court yes. actions. But I'm trying to find a, a mutual way that we can do something, and I don't know yet. I'm, I'm, right. I think most everybody knows which way I'm leaning, but I still would like to take and see if there's other solutions. Mr. Baker. 
Thank you, sir. John Baker, 9 Cunningham Lane, DeBerry. Uh, I attended the uh, PLDRC meeting and uh, there was an entirely different tone in that meeting than what I heard at the meeting we had yesterday with staff. Uh, the surveyor was thrown under the bus and uh, they did everything but tar and feather him in absentia. Uh, there was an entirely different attitude and, and narrative yesterday. We heard more of really what happened. I'm here representing the Environmental Council of Volusia and Flagler Counties. You probably have read my personal opinion, what I sent to the PLDRC, but our group, our mission is to find out what happened and to ask you and ask staff to implement policies and protocols to make sure that this never happens again because our resources and our environmental protection is getting a death by a thousand cuts and it needs to stop. Please implement the proper protocols and policies so that it doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have two more people. I, I want to interject something between Ben and I because we have uh, have have worked pretty hard to establish a a working environment on this council without rancor. I don't want that destroyed. I, this is really important. I agree 100% with, with the question apparently that Ben had asked. I just prefer that it, it be hashed out in public. In fact, I'm, I'm gonna ask it again when it becomes my, after these people speak that and I don't know if this is what you were inquiring about, Ben, but I asked yesterday, can we just, um, this is a negotiation apparently, can we require that the rest of the property be an RC um, or a much larger part of it? And, and I was told no, that that wasn't possible. Um, I, hope that, uh, I hope that we hear different today. I'm good. Okay. Uh, two, more, uh, two more members of the public, uh, John Nicholson. John Nicholson, uh, Daytona Beach side. I don't know about you all, but those graphics didn't tell me squat. Uh, I heard five acres, I heard 1.3 acres, I heard 25 feet, I heard 2,500 feet, but none, none of it told me exactly what I needed to know, all right? I hear the people that have lived there who appreciate the preserve, scared that some other things might be happening. Uh, that this will be happening over here, this will be happening over here. Then I hear somebody say, oh, it's a death by a thousand cuts, all right? The owners went in and they measured, and is it correct? Is it 500 or is it a thousand? Okay, if it's 500, then the dock is incorrect. So they had to cut it back. They did that. If it is at 90 degrees, personally, I would not have known that I had to measure by a 90 degrees. To me, that's an honest mistake, all right? So that mistake gave them 25 feet. That's me to the back wall. It, if you have five acres, that's huge. 25 feet is nothing. We saw a picture of a house in a clearing, all right? What's that in re relationship to five acres or 1,003 acres, you know, 1.3 acres? I don't know these things. The neighbors are, one gentleman is saying that the, the house was built right next to his house. I, I, I can't imagine if you had five acres, you would build next to the property line. So I, there's so many ifs, ands, or buts. Both sides are, are trying to make a point. And from what I've been given, I don't know who to believe. I mean, I believe them both. But it's so nebulous, and you guys have got to make a point. You can't dump on one person because they've done everything they could possibly do. All right? They're honest mistakes. The neighbors are saying, we want them to be happy. We want them to live there, et cetera, et cetera. Jeff, I think you've got the best idea. 
what can we do because the damage has already been done. 25 feet is not a whole heck of a lot out of one acre or five acres. What can we gain? What can the public gain? What can the river gain by adding more land to preservation? That's the clue. Thank you. Suzanne Scheiber. Suzanne Schreiber, Ormond Beach, Florida. Um, I don't know what just happened over to my left when all of the staff left, but I have to say that was fairly troubling. Um, I think that they should be here, and um, I wasn't planning on speaking until that happened, and I have to tell you, it's really troubling. Um, in addition, going forward from here, I'm, more con I'm, I'm concerned about what happens here, but I'm concerned about the whole wildlife corridor because that statement made, death by a thousand cuts, it's actually true. It's true across the corridor collectively. It is ongoing. So when you say you care about the corridor, you care about all of it. And I understand that this is a difficult position to be in. I've listened to the whole thing. I've even listened to some nasty comments in the audience of people sitting around me. Um, talking about each other and where they're from and they have no right and so on. Um, quite frankly, we all live in Volusia County and we do have a right. And I've been living here a very long time. And no, I'm not from some other state, you know, from recent. And collectively, the corridor matters. So what you decide today, it also sets a precedence for future and what you say. Thank you. Are all these um, names up here still valid, Ben Johnson? If I offended anybody, I apologize. It's not an unusual thing for us to ask staff to get outside to ask some questions. That is not an unusual thing to be done. So I apologize if I offended anybody. And also, we can listen. We hear. We got microphones here and back there. When y'all see us walk out, both places are so we can hear what's going on. And I heard a one environmentalist in the back come up with with his solution. And, and I got to thinking about how can we make this best for everybody? And that's what my questioning was back there is so basically maybe how can we come to a solution that's mutually advantageous? Damage is done. I don't like what you did. You already know that. So there's no sense in me beating you anymore. But the same token is, is how do we keep from making bad situation worse? Or how can we make this better? Or at least make it so it's tolerable to the neighborhood. So that's what that was about. Correct. And if we can find a way, and you're sitting here telling us that yesterday you had an idea. And I can understand where they're not going to go with that whole idea. But the real truth is they better start thinking about what can they do so they can salvage what you've done. That's a big thing right there. You, you might need to come to the table a little bit and help us, help us help you if we can help you, because I think right now, looking right here, I'm not sure that you've got the votes to continue on. So, so you're the one who needs to all of a sudden say, well, here's what we can do, or here's what we will do. Well, sir, I, wait, that's wait, why I wait before you start. If, if we do this, I've got to ask the council to vote to allow you to speak again. Every member of the public got three minutes and they're... This is not the quasi-judicial hearing. Okay. Okay. Be really brief. It's, that's, okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm not going to take much time. I just want to let you know that I, no matter what happens here today, it's not like somebody can come behind me and say like, oh, I'm going to do that because I feel like I'm still walking away with a loss. I mean, I'm, we, are, we are replacing RC land. I have to move an entire chicken coop because of the way that the staff actually you know, wants us to move it. Um, we also are cons doing conservation easement, which we have had so much disagreement about for the past month. I, we did not want to do that. We have children that go down to that dock, which will now be a conservation easement. You know, we realized that we had made a mistake and that sacrifices had to be made. We're not walking away scotch-free. That's the way that it kind of seems by some people. But to us, that's a huge loss. I mean, to us, a conservation easement is forever. I've never heard that it could ever be 
replaced or taken away. And that was something that we came here today ready to, and that didn't come easy. You still have to have it drawn up. You have to have it recorded. I mean, this did not come I mean, with you, no price tag. There's several of you up here that are property owners, including you, Jeff. I know uh, there's several people that I know that know you. Um, it'd be like somebody coming to you and saying, hey, your backyard, you cannot mow anymore. Like, I, I got to let it grow weeds, whatever it is, what it is. It I can't mow it anymore. So I'm basically, no we would. gave everything up in our entire lives to acquire this beautiful piece of property. Yes, it's a construction site. I'm building a house. But when it's done, it's going to be a beautiful house with trees, wheat. I have turkey oaks. I'm a, I am an outdoorsman far and far. I raised my kids fishing and hunting, not on video games and, and TV. So he's on that property playing nonstop. So yeah, there is There's guns, noise. four wheelers. We hang out out there. We're out there every day enjoying that piece of property that we <coughs> were lucky enough to acquire, not even acquire. We gave everything up in our lives, vehicles. We drive throwaway vehicles now so we could afford this piece of property. That, that might be a good thing now because they don't burn as much fuel. But So in, in closing, that's all I wanted to add was that we are not walking away from this yeah. with anything to gain besides our home. What, so. what that house went over that edge did not take okay. anything further out. It didn't take any trees out by that little move. We didn't take anything extra out. It was just a literally get a, a little bit farther from that neighborhood to not encroach on that neighborhood. Okay. I just I'll yeah. Yeah. take an exception with uh, since you called me uh, use my name um, it's a false analogy it, it's not the same as me not being able to mow my backyard it is a privilege to live in a wildlife corridor and you have responsibilities with that and it's time so I'm Ben has asked you to listen I'm asking you just be quiet and listen a minute Met Mr. Chairman, I ask a question, a couple, couple yeah, questions here, a mainly of Clay. Clay, if there's a conservation easement, it won't stop them from going to their dock, having a path to their dock, will it? No, we can, we can temp, again, structure the conservation easement, acknowledging that there will be a path from their home to the dock. Also, as it stands on this thing right here, if you do what you're talking about doing, they can still mow around their house. Is that not correct? 20 feet. And if they go outside of that, they cannot be utilizing equipment to go in there. And we may have to put landmines to keep them from going over. But. <laughs> no, sir. Uh, basically, a conservation easement, as, as the Steinharts have brought up. So some of those, some of those arguments you have right there just don't quite fit. That some of them don't fit. Now, let's go back to it because Jeff and I think I think everybody including that one over there is trying to find it. yes and he hugs every tree he passes you know what I mean so we uh, I, we're trying to find some way to fix this or, or at least mitigate it <laughs> may, may I Billy please yeah thank you um, so first of all Valerie, thank you. I feel your passion. I understand and I know I can see in your face how hard this has been. That's not our intent. It truly, truly isn't. But, you know, we do represent a lot of people and conservation is such a high priority with everyone. Um, Richard, I guess you go by Richard. Just step back and just listen a little bit. Sometimes you say things that makes my, my me question again some of the compromise that I may feel because, you know, when you're talking about, well, you can't mow and yet, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Well, when you're in an area like that, sometimes you can't, you know, um, just, just listen to what we're, we're trying to get done because we are trying to make this work in a, a roundabout way, or at least I am. I think the staff has had wonderful recommendations and I'm certainly in agreement with their recommendations and I stated them before. This is an error that's gone bad on four or five occasions. I would like to know, is the dock within the square footage or is it over? We've heard yes, no, maybe. That's just one question that I have. There's two points to clarify about the dock. Okay. Well, first of all, three. One. The dock does not really matter into the land use decision. Right, right. Second thing is how Volusia County 
and how DEP measured dock area are two separate ways. Well, see. <laughs> so first of all, DEP includes the slip area as well. What they're looking at is impacts to the wetland system. So when you t factor in the areas that he has for his slip and the walkways and those types of things, he is over the 500 square feet that DEP requires self-certification. That's not permitting. What it is is it says that they as a property owner are coming in building the structure of this size so therefore they don't have to go through an additional permitting process called an environmental resource permit. If it's over 500 square feet, they do. Okay. So what, the, what you're seeing here is that county staff in doing the, the investigation and following up on the complaints we heard, notified DEP and let them know that we've gone out there, we've done the calculations, here's what we've found, and it exceeds the 500 square feet. They would, you know, that is up to DEP, the Florida Department of okay. Environmental Protection handles that issue. In regard to the R code, we have 750 square feet as the maximum dock area you can have. I was able to pull up the plans on my phone. Right now they're at 717 square feet of walkway, dock, and boathouse. Okay. So they are right at the limit. Mm -hmm. They cannot proceed further with any additional beyond 750 square feet. Okay. That is part of the plans that were submitted for after the fact correction of the permitting. Because right now we have 380 square feet of a lower boat deck, 91 square feet of stairs, 472 square feet of walkway, then there's a 337 square foot sun deck. We are only looking at the sun deck and the lower boat deck for our calculations and that takes it to 700. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That helped with that. Now, getting back with you, Clay, one more thing. Um, when we're talking about this 2,580 square feet of mitigate, <clears throat> mitigation, can we, can we ask for a larger amount? I think your suggestion back there, I appreciate you bringing that, and we are listening to you, so I just want you to know that. Can we? Clarify the difference. Yeah. As far as expansion of the resource corridor land use, there would be difficulty at this point because, again, um, specifically, we have to provide for a buildable area that meets the RA, which is a minimum two and a half acres. There is, however, the possibility of extending the conservation area beyond what staff has identified. So if you wanted to make it such that a conservation easement would be placed over the property based on uh, the, the request by Mr. LaMontagne, that can be accomplished as well. Well, so here's my thoughts. You know, I think we're where we are. We, we want to, we don't want to stop you from living in your dream home. You know, that's, that's not, certainly not my intent. Um, I, I think the 2,580 square feet of mitigation, just in my mind, it mitigates. It just, it just gives back what, what, what was taken. I, I personally feel, you know, yes, there were a lot of naive decisions, and I, and I get that. This is a huge thing. Um, however, they were made. They were made, and we can't overlook that. So I, I just feel like there need, <laughs> needs to be a little bit more than just making up for the, the few square feet that they're over. They're, they're, it needs for people to feel the impact when they've overstepped something they have to feel that or we're just going to continue having these oh my gosh i didn't know you know and i i'm not i am not saying that everything was intended i'm certainly not saying that that any of your decisions were um, intended I, i'm just saying there's i just feel like we just need to go one step further in making things kind of hurt <laughs> so to speak you know i mean and, and nothing really taken away the joy of your land but to make an impact that we're, we're just not don't want to have these things continue to come forward to us because we have to answer to the public i have to answer to my own beliefs and um i just think that's this is a compromise and i certainly accept uh staff's recommendations and I think it needs to be recorded and everything else before the building permit 
uh, can move forward, any stop work order. But I would like to find something else that we can add to it. Uh, again, I like your suggestions. Can I just speak to that really quick? I like both. I actually did what Derek talked about, um, putting it RC along where the houses are. But staff came back with their proposal, so actually I was thinking more along the lines of him. I didn't know if we could merge them or if what you're asking, perhaps, because... Thank you for the compromise and willingness. That, that goes a long way, I'm telling you. To. It truly, truly does. It does to me, and I'm sure to some of your neighbors, they could maybe let up a little bit and see that you are trying. I appreciate I, it. And there should be enough land to do that because there's 2.5 acres that have to be for the RA, so there should be enough to play with, you know what I mean? And I want you to have your path so the kids can go down to the water. <laughs> um, Danny Robbins. Thanks. Just in summary, uh, just hopefully kind of get things moving here. Uh, we have PLDRC recommendation um, 7-0. We put people on those um, boards ourselves. We have staff recommendation. There's an enforcement plan in place um, for this. What we don't know is what we don't know. We can continue to what if this to death. Um, we better be prepared to make everybody uh, in the area along that creek all the way east um, uh, aware that uh, these same things can happen to them or have them turn over that land because we're playing the what if game uh, as well. But uh, the, the landowners are in agreement to this. Uh, you know, I, I think we probably need to, just in my opinion, all the answers are there. If, if there's something else or recommendation where people wanna go above and beyond that, it goes back to is the punishment <laughs> Or the, you know, is it is it fitting? Uh, are we going to take? Are we going to make it a point to take people's land? I don't know if that's right. Um, I just I, I think there's a balance there. Uh, I really do, um, and I think you know we just need to put this to rest. Mr. Chair, so I've been listening to the discussion, and and what I heard was a little bit of a proffer from the applicant. So um, so Miss Wheeler's uh, kind of suggestion on on the staff recommendation. And while we can't at this point in time, you know, put an RC zoning across the east property line because notice requirements and that's an actual rezoning, what you can do is you can, um, as, an, as a condition, um, extend the conservation easement 30 feet along the east property line all the way to the front property line, which is, you know, a conservation easement is a different mechanism than the conservation easement will be um, in the, to the benefit of Volusia County itself. So anything that happens to the conservation easement, whether it gets released, has to go through council. So you can put um, a conservation easement on you know, the east 30 feet in addition to where that ESC line and that conservation easement is a, a different mechanism of ensuring and in, uh, that the, uh, it remains I guess not. Can anybody annotate that on this map? So yeah, so it's That's a little bit, you can kind of see the whole, a, the whole length, 30 feet. Well, so because as a, the condition of the ordinance is to um, put a conservation easement on the revised ESC line, uh, council can also make it as a condition prior to the release of any stop work order that the conservation easement extend um, to the east from the east 30 30 feet on the eastern side all the way up to the front property line so that that protects that area provides a little bit more um, kind of uh, mitigation and you know kind of extends that wildlife corridor and that narrow strip adjacent to summer trees so that's that is kind of what I heard that's up to the council to determine if that is you know, an acceptable compromise and mitigation, or if the, the applicant is also kind of accepting that because they have to provide us the conservation easement, they have to execute it, and then we and it has to be recorded before we release the stop work order. Fred Lowry. Yes, I want to make a motion that we approve this with that addition that has been stated by our attorney. Mm -hmm. 
staff's Staff recommendation and, this and along with the this extra 30 this uh are we going to hear from the property owner before we take their land well, or we're not taking they, their land in addition well the usage uh, okay. they're but in a wildlife corridor there was an addition clause in there that's that's as long as they're good with it hey i think concern is the barn i just want to make sure because we do have a barn i want to make sure we're, we're within our rights because you know i don't want to have to remove that but i the barn is back where the X's are at that side. How far is the barn from? It's it's at 25. It's at the setback. So um, that's my only concern. Otherwise, yes, I think that's a good resolution. And I think it would make the neighbors happy too. Paolo, can we can we change the 30 to 25 to keep them in? Yes, it's, it's your condition. Um, I, I, I would like to add that to my motion that we make it 25 feet instead of 30 so that we not encumber them anymore. Was I second a, that. Uh, um, I think. I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead. Complete your sentence. Sorry, I, I think there was an initial motion um, from you, Mr. Lowry, for 30 feet, and then it was a second by. Okay. So you can. Yeah, there was a motion. <laughs> the, well, there was no second yet. She, oh, seconded, she seconded your 25. Yeah. Oh, okay. So there was no second. So we're good with it. We're, we're moving ahead with the 25 then. Is that the way? Mm -hmm. so you have a motion. So, so you have a motion and a second on that. So my understanding of, of how the motion sits is it's staff recommendation to adjust the ESC boundary in the configuration um, on here. Um, and to put a, uh, as, as a condition, the recordation of a conservation easement on the ESC line um, and 25 feet on the east property line all the way up to the, uh, the parcel boundary um, prior to the release of any stop work orders. Yes, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm um, good with that. I understood that. I'm good with that. We have a motion and, and now a second, that's still and now we're opening I, I up for discussion. Want, yes. I just want clarification. So that still has all of the staff's recommendations of the 20-foot maintenance buffer and all of that. Right. This is just in addition to that. Yes. yes. Okay, because yes. I want to make sure. reduce the 30 down to 25 so I don't encumber their barn. Yes. Right. So, so, so the, the staff's recommendations plus the 25 feet along the eastern border. Okay. Now I'll and the, second. And they're, regrow and they're regrowing down at the creek. But they have a pathway to the dock. Right. Yes. That's, that. Okay. That, that's part of the conservation yeah. okay. kind of easement. So of awesome. I second that. Okay. I have a question for for Paulo, for Clay, for Ginger Adair. Um, any one of you can deal with this. I just want to. I want to clarify a, a point. I have no feeling or need to punish the homeowners or make them feel the pain. My goal here is to protect the corridor and this land and not make it easier for the next next time this comes before us. Once we set a precedent, then you're almost um, entitled um, or obligated to do the same thing. Um, I want to protect the land. So my question, and this is really unfair to, to do to you, Ginger, and you don't have to answer this because it's 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 off the wall. But adding 25 feet to this side, does that do anything to protect the corridor? Good afternoon, right? Ginger Adair, Environmental Management Director. Um, so 25 feet is, is relatively small if you're talking about wildlife travel. However, um, certainly um, certain wildlife can use that as a corridor to get from the creek to the ESC lands that are just to the north. So it is a better solution than not having 25 feet. Um, if you're talking about a bear or, or some you know, really big animal, they typically need a corridor wider than that. But, um, oh. Uh, but uh, the, <laughs> the 25, I was scared, like, what was that? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, Don't the, say that anymore. The 25 feet um, will provide a connection between the, the ESC on the north and the south. So you don't see it as a hollow compromise? Uh, no, sir. It, I, it's certainly more land that's protected than is protected currently. Right. And um, I think it gets to the heart of the issue of, you know, they're, they're, they're providing the same amount of, of ESC and RC as was required in a little bit different configuration. And in addition to that, they're making this connection. 
Okay, thank you very much. Clay, did you not know where the redrawn line was, as was stated? You just couldn't find it without equipment. No, just for clarification, any time that you have a statement of 200 feet parallel to the wetland delineation line, it's measured the way we identified. I, I understood that. If there was miscommunications, that's fine. Um, that's okay. in the past. I've got to keep beating on that, but um, Ben Johnson, you want to beat it up? I just want to say one thing here. I want you to get a rule book of all the rules and read it because we wouldn't be here today. So y'all need to take in and start obeying what the rules say because I don't think you're going to get the same treatment next time around if we see you in here whatsoever. Or is it some, in a nutshell, you, you were wrong. You stepped out of line all the way around, and that's not acceptable. And this, is Apollo still down there next to you? This all has to be done before the certificate of occupation can... Well, no, you're actually, you're conditioning it prior to that, so prior to any stop work order releases, so they can't get any inspections, pull any permits and, until we get that recorded. So, you know, we've got a template conservation easement. Um, we just need the legal description, and then hopefully we can get that recorded once all of the time frames are gone through, and then that shouldn't take that much time. Hopefully that will be expedited. Okay. Can I, can I, I'm so sorry, but um, in saying that, would you guys be willing to do the CO or because surveyors, I'm the one I'm working with is six months out and I have to get the legal description for the conservation easement and we have trusses on the ground that we have tarped because it's been two months since we've been going through this. Would you be willing to consider? I don't think you don't need a CO for that. Do you? No, I just want to continue working so I get the trusses off the ground. And the conservation easement requires a surveyor to do the um, legal description and some other things, and they're really backed up. So that does concern me if I can't even continue work until it's recorded. Yeah. The condition was, again, predicated on uh, the release of the stop work order, so they cannot proceed with any construction activity on the single-family home. Uh, at based on the motion that was identified from the staff's recommendation. Council wants to allow them to proceed. That's your call. We would just have to have it done so that they wouldn't be able to be issued the CO if we didn't have the replanting plan submitted, approved, and completed, as well as the conservation easement uh, developed, reviewed, and approved, and recorded. Mr. Chair? So, <laughs> please. So let me ask you something. Can this be drawn up in a way that if we would say, go ahead, I'm just saying if, that if we see any deviation whatsoever, let's just say you don't want to have a deviation. Well, I, you know, I just want to make sure it's real loud and clear because we would, if that decision is made, that's really a stepping over our, our line, and I, I would want that to hurt real bad. Um, it was, we're waiting for what the attorney says, because if, if there's a possibility with that, we have to amend the motion. So uh, right now, the motion is that all of that needs to be done prior to the release of the stop work order. Um, you have the applicant kind of um, having taking an issue with that time frame because they're essentially stuck. You no, know, no construction can can occur. But that's that's up to council of whether or not you want to move that condition, I guess, forward in time a little bit to so prior to CEO is kind of you know prior to the house being habitable, which allows them to do the construction and the replant, replanting plan. Um, yeah, but right now, the way that staff has proposed and has the current motion is, you know, we need to get this recorded prior to any um, any continuation of any construction activity. Aren't those um, 
Aren't those two separate points of time that we can use? A stop order could be lifted, and then we have the CO where it could be, the CO could be denied if they hadn't done all that. Yes, so, so essentially the CO would not be issued if they, right. if they have not recorded the conservation easement. So, I mean, you have, that's, that's the requirement to either proceed forward with continuing work or to proceed forward with um, a CO. And right now, the, uh, the motion on the floor is you cannot proceed forward until you, well, with any construction activity, until you get the conservation easement. But that's up to council would, to determine the Would you be time willing frame. to amend your, to allow the lifting of the stop order and then the CO is our final bump? Can I amend my own motion? <laughs> I'll amend that way. Okay. So the, so. It can be enforced with this certificate of occupation. Essentially, they cannot have a habitable house. So, the, the, and I'm going to be blunt, the danger is that they can continue construction um, and then, uh, <laughs> you, Gary, you want to? <laughs> Sorry. County manager wants to speak to. The clarification is that per the Florida Building Code, they cannot withhold a certificate of occupancy due to zoning and non building code re requirements. So therefore, if they meet all of the building code requirements, he is obligated to issue a certificate of occupancy. He said what I was going to say. So that, that's what my, my problem with it is, is he, he can't enforce it at that point. Okay. Well, I don't know if that makes a difference to the council. Um, Barbara Gertman wants to speak, but I'm, I'll just say again to you, you see the, to the owners of the property here, yeah, I, I hope you see what we're trying to do. I, I, I don't want to punish you. I really don't. Um, but I've seen so many, staff has told me you, you've been given um, warnings. If you go further here, it's at your own risk and you chose to go further. Um, Every one of us up here feels like we need some kind of a guarantee that all this will be carried out. And if we do what the attorney just said we have to do, it's we're relying on um, on your word. Barbara Gartman. Um, what did, was there a mention of the time frame um, for the recording? No, it's it's prior to they have to record it prior to um, them proceeding. So the time frame is if they want to actually start construction, they need that recordation. There is no time frame associated with it. And there's no way for us to help to to expedite or support them through that. You can put in a time frame. Must be recorded. You know, prior to I guess sixty ninety days. Mm -hmm you know, 60, 90 days after the effective date and prior to the release of any stop recorder. That's, you know, if you put a, 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 a date associated with it or a time frame. I don't um, think that's the issue. The, the issue, which she, Ms. Gert, but I think what you're asking, what I'm hearing, is there any way we can help the private survey company come in and survey ahead of time. Correct. And no, we can't. <clears throat> we can maybe make a phone call and, and see what they could do. Um, but as far as us guaranteeing that, right. you know, that's totally uh, an issue with the surveyor schedule. There may be some relief on the horizon. I think some building activity is slowing down, but that would be, uh, again, I, I couldn't guarantee yeah. that they would uh, respond to, to any request like I said, as, a, as a realtor, <clears throat> I feel her her pain if she has product and trying to get something something done. So, but um, I mean, we're here today because of this this challenge. So, um, just trying to look for for paths forward. Um, so, I hope if there's something we can do that we that we will help. But. I, I agree not to, um, that we can't commit to it, so. Jenny Robbins. We say, we keep saying it's, it's getting old. We're not looking for punishment here, but in that we want to guarantee there, there's rules in place. There's a process in place. If 
he doesn't do these things, he gets fined. Goes from the code board. Then it goes through the lien process. And then there's a judgment. This has been going on, this happens, believe it or not, all the time. But there's a process for this, for, for checks and balances. But you know, at what point, at what point does this stop? Um, we want, we're looking for guarantees at this point in, in, in the stage, you know, and I think we're past it. We got, we made some headway today, but we're past it, but we, we, we're, we're, you know, there's no guarantee in anything, but there is a process in place where he can lose his property if they don't follow the rules. I don't know what else can be done right now. I think we're beating a dead horse in, in this, in this aspect of it. So that's just my two cents. Ben Johnson. Possible solution. We pass it, but with the caveat that they do an agreement in writing with us that says this will be done and handed to us. If not, that we can take y'all to court and y'all will be responsible for all attorney fees, etc. Then you kind of have to do it. But it gives us some kind of a legal paper in our hand that says it will be done. I mean, y'all think y'all are sitting here in good faith saying you're going to do it. But that way, you know, we know we got that, and it says, you know, and then y'all get your surveyor. You can continue on like you're doing, but you get the surveyor, but we have that in place so that if for some reason it does default, that we have somewhere to go to go after y'all civilly. Would that, would that accomplish what we're looking at? Um, that, that's, that's complicated. Um, and it's I, what? I, don't, I see a lot of attorneys shaking and our head. I, and I, um, <laughs> Legally, that's not, not advised. Um, what you can do is you can do something like um, uh, a performance bond, for example, for the replanting. Um, you know, you make them put up a performance bond in favor of the county, and it's not released until the conservation easement is recorded. Mm, that sounds like, so I like that. That's, that. That leaves it out of the CO, allows them to proceed, but you know, what, the, what that appropriate performance bond is, um, it's the cost of the yeah, that's, I need, I, I'll need an expert on this one. Okay, Ginger Adair again. So we use this tool sometimes in violation situations um, or on, on subdivisions. It could be used here where um, we could require a planting plan, right? That RC area needs to be replanted. Um, and that planting plan would be required anyway. So we require that. We identify the cost that it would be to do that planting plan. And then we ask for performance guarantee in the amount of that cost. And so how we use that typically is then if the property owner defaults, the county has that performance bond, we can perform that work on behalf of the owner, applicant, whatever. We, we don't ever have to do that. People do the work because they've given us a performance bond. But that's sort of a guarantee that they will do the replanting. It's an incentive to do the work that you say you're going to do. We could hold that performance bond until the replanting is complete and the conservation easement is recorded. I kind of like that. It typically takes the form of a letter of credit from a bank. So generally how you get that performance bond is you go to your bank, you tell them, here's what I have to do, um, and, and that you get a letter of credit from the bank that the county holds. So it's a letter of credit in the name of the county. Um, and if the work gets done, that letter of credit never actually gets used. Um, a little bit like escrow, but the money never actually changes hands. It's just a letter of credit. But the bank guarantees that in the event that the work doesn't get done, that money is available. Yeah, I like that. So I'm just curious of what kind of planting that, are we talking about replanting the 16% that we took out originally? Because we left all the large trees. All we basically did was clean the underbrush out coming up to the back of the house. So what are we talking about That's a question for I'm, staff. I'm basically yeah. going to be replanting nice oaks and stuff anyways getting there's trees falling apart scrub oak stuff like that and putting turkey oak and live oaks and stuff anyways that's just what I'm gonna do I think the I think staff has a required planning list of Florida natives yeah that you can that you can basically use. stuff like that I um it sounds like he will need some guidance in that because I I'm I'm hoping I'm pretty sure that they don't want to renege and that they don't want to be back here. Um, 
So, but we have to wind our way through this. So, because the emotion, the motion, and the, the second that we have on the floor doesn't include that compromise. So, um, I don't even know if you can Again, restate well, the motion. Well, I don't know if I can either, but I, I would be glad to add that as an amendment to the motion. Right. Those stipulations, sure, and, and that would be that instead of um, prior to the release of any stop recorder. It's that the applicant shall provide a performance bond and uh, associated replanting plan, um, and uh, for the for the replanting plan, and that replanting plan will not be released until the conservation easement is executed and recorded on the ESC area and 25 feet from the eastern property line all the way to the property boundary. Okay, I'm good with that, Mr. Chair. I mean, do you yeah. want to, do you want to treat that as a, a, a motion to amend the underlying yeah. motion? Yes, that's what he said. He, he was making a motion to amend. Do we have to? I And I would second that motion to amend. Do we Do we have to mention the stop order? But he did. Uh, that, no, that's that that's in there. lieu of, you've set a different time frame for the recordation. Yeah. Okay. okay. Doesn't have to be worded. All right. So let's deal with the, uh, the amendment as stated, and um, neither Fred nor I care to repeat it. <laughs> Paulo just did. Um, uh, is Heather Post still with us? Any other comment? Then I'll call for the vote on the amendment only. All in favor say aye. 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 Any the amendment said aye. Or the amendment? Okay. On the, gotcha. We have to do the amendment first, yes. according aye. to Robert. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think I heard everybody say aye, including Heather Post. So the amendment passes seven to zero. We're getting a step closer. Yeah. And um, there you go. yeah, we've got background noise. Now we'll go to the, um, the main amendment was to accept the county's uh, guidelines, their changes, and now the included 25 foot um, conservation area right wait a minute Clay yeah <laughs> conservation area on the west side of the property east, east. that, east. It, that east. is east he's been on the east side okay east. any further discussion on that please god no there being none um all in, all in, all in favor say aye. aye aye any opposed and that motion carries. And I, I'm honestly, I'm not making light of that with what I just said. It's been grueling for every nobody up here wanted to hurt you. Nobody up here and nobody in the audience wants to hurt the uh, wildlife corridor. And if we don't take it seriously, it, we lose it. Mr. So you got to put signs up where the bears have to walk. So that they Mr. Chair. I, I do want to just make one brief comment. I mean, the vote's already in and it's nothing to do with that. But I do want to thank you for your willingness to understand that this was a serious thing that we had to deal with. And it took a lot of time and effort on each one of our parts because we were all studying. So I hope your neighbors understand that you are trying to do the right thing here going forward. So uh, ease up. That was pertaining to the future land use map amendment changing the ESC and our mm -hmm. land use lines. We still need a motion for the rezoning, which would be altering the RA and RC zoning line. Is that item 11? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Yes. Mr. Chair, we do have public okay. comment on item 11. Who's speaking to me? You are. <laughs> and what did you send? We do have public comment on item 11. Yes, we do. I already had some here, and now we have a bunch more. I want to say something on 10. Um, but yeah, so let, we're just, I'm just trying to put item 10 to bed. Um, I just want to thank staff. But they did a tremendous job. This was a very, 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 very difficult situation, and they came up with a solution. And uh, I think all of us working together came up with something I hope will make everybody feel like you got a, a little bit in the game. Thank you. Okay. Now we move to uh, item 11, which is a quasi-judicial hearing. And we've already gone through ex parte, so we don't need to do that again, correct? 
Or would you like to hear it again? No, you already went through it. We, were, we opened 10 and 11 at the same time, so all okay. the testimony that was provided prior to, yeah, all the testimony applies to both items. Okay. So really, all you need is a motion and a second and a vote to. If you had any public comment, you would. We have a lot of it. For, for 11 as well? Yes. Okay. Quite a bit. Do you want to make a motion first? Or do you want to hear I, we, I need a motion first, and then we can discuss. I move approval for item 11, rezoning. Motion by Lowry, second by. Second by Wheeler. I can't make a second or a motion. I make a, well, okay. Then I'll open it up for discussion. And I don't see a council member, so we'll start going through these, uh, the public comments. Um, William Steele, you'll have uh, three minutes, and we don't require you to tell us, give us your address, or I don't, but just tell us your city of residence so we know where you are. We know where you are. Port Orange. My, my intent for this is um, we're all involved in this one way or the other. I wanted to take this opportunity. You know the facts. We know the facts. I wanted to take this opportunity to address the Steinharts and let them know we have nothing against you. We have nothing against your home, your family. We welcome you. We just don't want to see all the activity that's been in the resource zone. You have a huge piece of property, and instead of using that for your playground, it's supposed to be for the animals and for the creek. And we would just love to see that buffer rebuilt, which is barren now, and we're just looking at you know, so we welcome you. Okay, thank you, God bless, and hopefully we can get along. Okay. It's done. Okay. Uh, you're welcome, Lori Sandman. You're good? Thank you. Derek LaMontagne, come down and please speak into the microphone so that it's recorded for posterity. Can you hear me? Great, uh, thank you, yeah, Derek Lamontagne. Just uh, appreciate the second opportunity to talk. I basically just wanted to thank you. And uh, I, I know, actually, I just want to also say at the, the Planning Commission, I think also they skipped like the comments on item 11. So I do appreciate you taking comments on item 11. I mean, uh, because they are tec technically two separate things, although very related. If you recall, early this morning when I was here, I mentioned about that administrative rezoning thing and that's not directly related to this, but it has to do with just, yes, yeah, switching RAs to RC or, or RC to RA. The problem, as I see it, is that sometimes um, the process, it, it just it needs to be fixed. Uh, the whole administrative rezoning um, is, is not transparent. I don't think anybody wants that. And I do believe, I, I just, I'm saying this for the record too, that the rezoning last year that was done was done incorrectly. So I, I know that staff disagrees with that assessment, but maybe it wasn't unintentional. It's how it's been done for a long time. But the reason it was not correct um, last year when they, essentially it was two and a half acres of, yeah, the RA at the north and two and a half uh, at the RC on the south. And again, they just moved that line south. Otherwise, the entire foundation of their house is in the RC. It's not just the corner. And it is actually, it's my belief that it is or it was, and we've kind of found a solution, so I'm not trying to rehash things, but it's my belief that the entire house is in it and that the, the you know, the staff should not have uh, changed that, uh, even though, you know, they're citing in 2002. In 2002, the applicant only requested the north part. They didn't actually, and the staff never proceeded to um, do that part underneath, and that's why it was just last year. So the rules that applied last year were supposed to be followed and they weren't. I still think that's a problem that needs to be addressed. So obviously, you know, what happened with this particular parcel is relevant to these owners. I think they're hopefully going to replant things well and I wish there would have been a wider buffer than 25 feet, but that is that is a start. Um, and I, I do think the dock is way oversized. There, I believe, will be hopefully feedback and maybe investigation from the DEP on that. Um, I personally would like to revisit our dock rules as well because as a budding kind of river keeper of Spruce Creek, I'd, I'd like us to have some say in it because it really seems like, well, why are we duplicating the, the administrative work? Right? I don't want there to be more levels of government if the DP is already doing it, but also 
the DP didn't really coordinate with us, then like that's a, that's an issue. I really, you know, there's manatees obviously and other creatures that that we should revisit that. So again, revisiting those two issues uh, at a later date, I'm happy to present all my thoughts if I'm, if I'm ever given an agenda item on, on those because I have suggestions for ordinance updates and I think, you know, that would be uh, helpful to everyone. So again, thank you for your comments or for your time and, uh, and I do hope the replanting uh, of the conservation area goes well. I'd like to see the plant. Thank you. Perfect timing. Elizabeth Levette, followed. Okay, not item 11 is like it says here. John Baker. Did he leave? Okay. And then I have another one for Elizabeth Levette. I'm going to change that to public comments at the very end. You're staying till 8 p.m.? That's not going to happen? Okay. All right. So that is Elizabeth. Elizabeth. John Baker is gone. That takes care of all of the public comment. Any other discussion by council? Then I'll call for the for the vote on the um, zoning change. Um, I don't think I need to call the roll. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Was the vote seven to zero or six to zero? Are you still with us, Heather Post? Yeah, I am. Was that an aye? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries seven to zero. And um, we are, Fred Lowry is going to take a lunch break. The rest of us, you can find us across the street at the, uh, is there a, some kind of bar across the street? <laughs> uh, for single malt scotch. Oh, so we will adjourn. It is 1.47 or 8. Um, we will join until 2.30 for lunch. Thank you very much. This is Volusia Today, a public information radio program brought to you by the County of Volusia. Here is Community Information, Brian Vandal and Kevin Captain. Good morning and welcome to Volusia Today. I'm Kevin Captain, and I'm joined by my co-host today, Gary Davidson. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Volusia Today is made possible by our sponsors, the Daytona Beach International Airport, the Ocean Center, Volusia Recycles, and Votran Public Transportation. Good morning, Gary. Hey, good morning, Kevin. How you doing? I'm doing great. So we have, uh, we have a king on the show today, and we have some smoke. Yeah, we, we've, we got a little <laughs> bit of both. And, and, and a captain. <laughs> and I got to tell you, right off the bat, um, I'm a little bummed out. Uh-oh. Um, I think you know I'm a little bit of a music buff, and I know you are too. And, and the other day. Indeed. Yeah, the other day someone took all of my 70s records. Yeah, I still have records. What? Took all my seventies records, yep, and, and threw them in the fire. Oh my gosh! And, and you know what? It was a real wait for it, disco inferno. Oh, <laughs> but I'm <bum. Shh>. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Cue the heckling. That's all right. I can take it. Yeah, um, that's that's good. That's good. I think uh, only people of a certain generation will get that joke. Um, you know, I like to start the show off uh, a little lighthearted, but uh, you know, when it comes to fire safety protection and prevention, um, it's no laughing matter. Uh, knowing what to do, 
knowing how to protect yourself, your family, your property, uh, having an escape plan in case of fire, those things literally, they save lives. Um, fortunately, we have uh, two people here in the studio with us who tell us everything we need to know about fire protection and, and fire safety. Um, from Volusia County Fire Services, joining us today is Deputy Chief of Operations Joe King and Battalion Chief Scott Smoke. Thanks, Gary. Well, good morning, Chiefs. Thank you so much for being on the show with us this morning. Good morning. So starting off, uh, let's talk about Volusia County Fire Rescue. It's a big department. We have, what, 1,207 square miles in Volusia County. Just how big is Volusia County Fire Rescue, and how many calls would you say that you respond to in a, in a calendar year? So the county itself, we um, have 19 stations and uh, throughout the whole county. And yearly, we run anywhere from 18,000 to 20,000 calls, just county alone. Wow. So that's, you know, other municipalities will have run calls as well. But just Volusia County Fire Rescue last year was 18,809 calls. And 62% uh, of those calls are EMS. 2% uh, are pretty much your structure fires. And then the difference are, you know, hazardous calls, other type calls, small, you know, other fires, just not, not structure fires themselves. So your folks are busy. They stay busy. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about wildfires. Um, I think most, most people know that the hurricane season goes from June 1st to November 30th. Um, is there a designated, commonly accepted uh, wildfire season just like hurricane season? And when do we... Uh, most commonly uh, see wildfires here in Florida. Yeah, the, in Florida, there's no wildfire season. That's year-round. It all depends on rainfall, dryness, and stuff. But uh, I'm going to pass this one over to our mitigation officer, Scott Smoke, <laughs> and uh, let him talk a little more in detail on that. Yeah, so, um, you know, like you said, year-round is usually wildfire season here in Florida uh, because of the our drought and the rainfall, you know, precipitation amount that we get in different times of the year. However, though, statistically, our most active wildfire seasons is usually from March until maybe, you know, July, August time. Okay. Um, and then after that, it, it just kind of dies down a little bit in reference to wildfires. So how are the fire conditions right now? As of right now, we are getting kind of dry. Um, April is usually our driest month of the year. And so um, at, at an average, we had about four inches of rainfall in the county in the month of April. So we are in that dry season now where we're kind of getting a little dry out there. Uh, one thing that we measure is through our uh, KBDI, which is a Keech right. Byron Drought Index. And as of today, our drought index is 293 as an average for the whole county. So we are coming into that dry part of the, of the time where, you know, wildfires are pretty, pretty active on that part. So when you're talking about the KBDI index, that's the, is it the measurement of the moisture that's in the ground or the dryness and how to, what does it exactly measure? It actually measures the moisture in the soil. Okay. Um, zero being basically wet that's just saturated with water and then 800 is there's no moisture in the in the soil at all like a desert and so right now as an average here in the county we're at right around that 300 mark so there are parts of the county that are well above 300 pushing 400 and other places are like in the mid 200 range on that scale so, so where that, exactly is the danger zone um well right now with the the way we are our fuels are drying out um but we also look at other things like temperature wind the relative humidity so we are right in that that window now that if someone was to have a fire outside it had the potential to get a lot larger quicker if if we do not get onto it quickly so where can someone find out where we're at on any given day where that kbd i number is they can actually go to the florida forest service website and there is a link on their on their website that actually will tell you what the average of for the county and the different locations um, it actually breaks it up into little parcels, basically, and they can look at that for the county and as the state as a whole to see what the dryness and the drought index is. And I think, if I recall, that link is also through the county, volusia.org website Yeah, they can well. actually go to our website also, and we have a, a link that will connect you to that also. So if you go to the uh, you know, Volusia County Fire Rescue website, there is a link on there that will get you to the wildfire part of looking for that KBDI. So I know you said, uh, you know, April is, it begins to be a dry month. I think when we had some of the water quality folks here from environmental management, they mentioned it started out like there was a pretty good amount of rain in mm -hmm. April, but now things have dried up. And uh, what can an individual do when we're speaking of wildfires and we're in that dry season? Um, there's got to be something more that people can do on an individual level or personal basis. What are those? Well, the big thing is just be cautious when you're outside, you know, doing any type of burning activity, whether you're burning yard debris, 
um, whether you're you know, even driving down the road, don't pull off onto the side of the road, especially into the taller grass areas because the undercarriage of your cars are hot. And so when you park on the side of the road, it has a potential of getting the grass caught on fire and then it can spread that way. Um, people smoke and unfortunately throw cigarette butts out the window. Um, so we advise not to do that. Also, when you're towing the trailer, if you make sure that your chains, your safety chains are hooked up to your, your vehicle so that they're not dragging on the ground and, and creating sparks. So those are some big things. Also, you know, people like to do a lot of recreational stuff outside. So they'll go camping. So they have campfires, um, ATV riding out, out in the wilderness area. So, you know, lawnmowers, make sure that those type of vehicles have a spark resistor on them to create uh, or prevent the sparks from getting out on and sparking the grass or the vegetation on fire. A lot of great information there. Um, so, you no, know, a big part of uh, fire safety prevention is making your home as fire resistant as possible. Um, what kind of fire prevention steps can we all take around the house? Well, I think we can look at it in two parts. Um, wildland mitigation um, as outside your house, which there's setbacks. You can do 30-foot buffers around your house, um, trying to keep the debris on, you know, around your house um, cleaned up and away from your house, trees overhanging on your roof, um, as well as um, cleaning out your gutters, um, keeping pine needles and stuff off your roof, that's very important. Um, just having that defensible space um, for wildfires. Yeah. Um, the other thing, just fire prevention it, it is itself in your house. Um, you know, the, the big thing is extension cords. Everybody loves using extension cords. We should never use them for permanent electric. You know, a lot, a lot of people like to use it, um, run them under rugs, and, and that just creates an electrical hazard. Um, you know, people like using candles. Make sure if you use candles in your house, they're secure on a table. Um, you don't want to leave them unattended. They should always, if you could, always have, um, like, they're enclosed in a, a glass or something okay. like that so they can't tip over. And uh, space heaters is generally something that, you know, don't use the, the older ones, use the newer ones that are tip resistant, stuff like that. So there's a lot of things you can do in your house. Um, a lot of good information on the internet. I mean, our website, you know, go to the fire rescue um, website, but there's there's a lot of stuff when it comes to fire prevention in the house. You know, in the house, fire prevention, I've often heard about uh, people accidentally leaving uh, things that require a battery recharge, they, they leave them plugged in, like, you know, a razor, a, a cell phone, right. things like that. I mean, everything that we use nowadays, pretty much almost everything has a lithium battery. Right. So um, how safe are some of those electronics that we ha remain plugged in at home? Well, I mean, you had that issue with some the, the scooters, the razors, um, where they, you know, they say don't leave them plugged in, charging overnight, unattended, stuff like that, and that was some um, recall issues. Another one that people don't realize is nine volt batteries. People just throw them in the garbage, and you, you throw them in your junk drawer, and they could the two terminals could huh. touch against the keys or something metal in your drawer, and they actually show videos on the internet where they take steel wool and set it next to the battery and you'll see the still will get hot, you know, almost get red hot like a resistor and light a drawer on fire. Wow, so you I can do that, that with a nine volt battery. So when you change your smoke detectors out or throw batteries out, a uh, good method is to tape the top of the battery. Okay. Cover the, the prongs by taping it before you throw them out. And you really shouldn't throw batteries out in the garbage, but um, if you're going to dispose of them, tape the top of them. Please do it safely. Right. Jeez, I can remember just being a kid. Well, is this battery still good? The right. nine volt? You Put them on your tongue. <laughs> Put them on your tongue. <laughs> you know, also, when we're talking about the home uh, and home safety, obviously everybody knows that it's important to have a fire extinguisher in the home, but uh, how many should someone have in their home? I mean, I think the traditional thought is to keep it underneath the kitchen sink and, you know, some homes that might be an accessible place, some not. But what if it's been under there for you know 10 or 15 years and you've never need to, needed to use it? Right. How often should they be checked and what's the general rule for fire extinguishers? Well, the thing they say when you buy them for your house, or you go to Walmart, you buy them, you know, they're good for, they're generally good. You look at the gauge, if they're in the green, they generally say they're good. A good thing to do with them, some fire prevention companies will tell you, turn them upside down, hit them a little bit, because sometimes in moisture area, the, the powder, the, um, the material in it can, you know, clot and get, you know, clogged up. But generally, they're those are the type that you buy in the Walmart and stuff that you can't go and get them serviced or anything. Sure. Fire prevention companies will just tell you to go buy a new one. Um, now, the number of having them in your house, you just want to have them where they're 
accessible like in the kitchen you know like some people have them under the sink um, but the big thing with that is if something happens and you go for the fire extinguisher first thing you should think about doing is notifying you know call 911 because if the fire then gets too big it's then too late you know you might as well get the fire department coming heading in your direction so it, at least if there's an issue and one other th good fire safety note when using a fire extinguisher don't ever get yourself backed into a corner when you're always fighting a fire with a fire extinguisher make sure you have an area to get out behind you because if that fire gets too big you want to be able to just drop the extinguisher and go definitely good advice you know we're talking about home fire safety I, I think I know the answer to this next right. one but um, for the benefit of our listeners what's the number one cause of house fires well statistically it's cooking fires and sometimes unattended cooking fires but you know just um, grease fires but most of all it's it's cooking fires in, in the various amounts then you have um, I believe it's heating heating using space heaters, heaters. stuff mm -hmm. like that and then electrical fires or electrical wiring faulty wiring um, so it's inter interesting to hear that it's the the kitchen because uh, I've heard or at least read where sometimes it's it's very common in the garage that people have uh, gasoline and other chemicals in, inside a garage a lot of times you'll get stuff like that because the way they store chemicals or they they have their gasoline and non venting you know so they you know build up pressure in them they could you know knock them over um, or you store multiple you know paints and gas and stuff together um, but statistically it's the cooking and I've also seen products and, and not that we want to endorse any products but there is new technology that's out where some of the uh, extinguishing devices you can install in the kitchen, like uh, say above a stove or above the, uh, the burners that you have in the kitchen, are they effective? Well, they make, uh, it almost looks like a little puck. So it's um, like a, a, almost like a suppression type system that you can hang over your hood and it will um, react if there's a fire, just like a, a smoke, to, I mean a um, sprinkler, fire sprinkler would based on heat um, I don't really have a lot of data on that. I just know they're available. It's new technology. New technology. Yeah. I mean, we always, fire, fire prevention wise, we always look at the, the cold, hard sprinkler systems, alarm systems, but that there is systems out there or new technology out there like that. We're talking with Deputy Chief Joe King and Battalion Chief Scott Smoke with the Volusia County Fire Rescue. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back with Volusia Today. Get ready, it's time for another Volusia County Fire Rescue Fire Safety Tip. Another good tip for the kitchen is safety for the children. We want to create a three foot zone of safety around the stove top so that children can't access and get burned. And we're back. I'm Gary Davidson, along with Kevin Captain, and you're listening to Volusia Today, a public information program brought to you by the County of Volusia. So we're speaking fire prevention today, and uh, so Battalion Chief Scott Smoke, uh, your role is is in mitigation. So what exactly, what exactly is that role, and, and what is what is it like for you and your job every day at Volusia County Fire Rescue? So as our mitigation officer, I'm basically responsible for any outdoor burning that is done in the county. So if there is a wildfire, you know, I'll oversee that, those kind of actions. Um, anybody that's doing outdoor burning, whether it's yard debris, prescribed burning, um, anything like that, anything that deals with outdoor burning itself, that's the things that I kind of oversee and help mitigate and educate people on. No, there is, again, additional information uh, residents can find on Volusia.org about the, the burning ordinances, you know, when you can burn, what you can burn, what you can't burn, things like that. 
Uh, but, but you also work closely with the Florida Forestry Service as well, too. I mean, they, they must coordinate with you on maybe some of the big controlled prescribed burns? Yes, they do. So anytime there is control burning here, they do notify me. Um, a lot of times they do ask for assistance. So we do provide some assistance to them, whether it's personnel or equipment. Um, so yeah, you know, anything dealing with outdoor burning, you know, whether it's with Florida Forest Service, St. John's Water Management, private landowners, um, I help them with those kind of things. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about home fire escape planning and drills, um, the, the really essential part of safety. Um, in your experience, do a, a lot of families have a fire escape plan and, and what should a plan include? No, most families do not because they don't, they don't think this will happen to them. So they don't really have one. So we go out there as a, as a fire service uh, agency and we go out to schools and we try to educate the children and then hopefully we try to do some education in different communities, homeowners association groups, things like that. And we kind of tell them about home safety, how to have a plan, make sure everybody in the house knows what that plan is. When they do get out of the house, where do they meet at? So there's accountability for that. Um, you know, make sure you have two ways of getting out of a house, you know, whether it's through a window, a doorway, whatever that may be. Uh, teach the children of when the smoke alarm goes off what to do, what it sounds like. You know, do a plan or do an escape plan during the daytime and in the evening time when they're kind of like sleeping, what to do and where to go. Because uh, we do that kind of education for people all throughout the community. Do you find when you talk to school children about this that they go home and talk to their parents? Yeah, a lot of times when we have that, when we have parents calling us and uh, trying to set up, you know, some information, uh, either us coming back out there, we've attended many birthday parties and done some education on that, or we come to a community event, whatever that may be, you know, whether a neighborhood's having some type of event going on or a local community uh, function going on, or even a homeowners association. So we'll come out and we'll provide some information to them. We'll give them plans that they can do. We can give them some advice on what they can do for their own home for home safety inspection stuff and fire prevention matters. You know, I find it amazing when, when you guys are out and you're pr providing education to the public. It, you know, it's kind of like Gary and I were, were providing community information, but we're doing it to a multi-generational audience. And just like you are today, when you're, when you're giving fire education to different generations, you know, we would always teach that at daylight, daylight saving. That's when you change your, your clocks and that's when you change the batteries and your smoke detector. But now we're seeing with new technology, some of the smoke detectors, how long, I mean, those batteries last what, 10 years or something like that? And they're Bluetooth. Right. So uh, w what are you finding with those and, and how do you, what, where do you recommend as far as if somebody updates their smoke detector in their home, what should, what should they get? Well, for years they, they went to the battery, um, hardwired battery backup smoke detectors that for all houses were built. And with this new technology and a 10 year lithium battery, a lot of places are saying, you know, instead of checking batteries twice a year, changing batteries once a year, you know, why not just replace your smoke detectors you know, because generally smoke detectors need to be replaced every 10 years. Um, and if you look on, even if you have a hardwired smoke detector in your house, when you pull it down to check the battery, on the back there'll be a, a date, and that's the date of manufacture. And if it's 10, day, 10 years prior, you should just replace it, because nine times out of 10, the detector's not as sensitive, it's not gonna, you know, it could not operate correctly, but most are, are making the change to the 10-year lithium batteries. That's, and that, it that's, forget it. that's a yeah. great campaign all its own. Just right. switch out the whole detector. And we always see sales on them at our, our department and home stores. Right. They're, they're not that expensive. No, they're really not. I think um, I, I say this, but I think you can find them like $15, $16 a detector where even the hardwired ones you were paying, you know, a quarter of that. And, you know, you're, you're not replacing batteries. So when you look at the cost of it, it's like I said, set it, forget it. And 10 years, you mark it and change them. And that's a small price to pay for uh, pre right. an important amounts of prevention. So, um, talking about public education, um, tell us about your fire prevention uh, virtual classroom because that's really a cool and fun platform and a, and a way to instill fire prevention uh, practices in young children, isn't it? Right. It's it's a pretty neat um, platform set up. You know, where the kids and parents can go there and click on the screen. And and I got to be honest with you. You know, the last time I think we looked at it, I found myself flipping through the pages, hitting interactive stuff. I mean, it's, it's pretty neat with the information that's on there. I think one page you can click on it and get a tour of an actual fire truck where our firefighters are doing a video. Um, there's a lot of um, publications and books that you can click on. It links you right to the NFPA website. 
So there's a lot of stuff that you, just your kids alone, I mean, kids are better with technology today than we are. <laughs> they can get on and just play with it, but parents can sit with them and, and learn. But it, it's a pretty neat platform that's set up. And yeah, it is very cool site. And right. like you, I know it's primarily for children, but I've surfed right. on there. You get on there and you just start playing many with Many times, it yeah. There's, there's Hope nobody's watching and you look <laughs> over your shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we're, we're, we're coming up on uh, what Gary and I would call barbecue season. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously a lot of us that, you know, love to cook outdoors. And, and uh, you know, I know in your field with, with firefighting, you guys love that just as much. But uh, um, w what messages do you have out there for people who are, you know, firing up that grill, especially when it's in, in uh, dry, dry weather? Right. I, I mean, th those, I think those it's embers similar. go a mile, I said, I've heard. Yeah. I think it's similar to what um, Chief Smoke touched on with the mitigation um, you just got to be safe. Don't leave fires unattended. And especially if you're using like cooking fires or you, you got gr um, charcoal, um, don't just leave it unattended after. Um, if you dispose of it, put it in a metal can, make sure you cool it off. There's a lot of things, you know, three foot barrier around fires when you have any type of bonfire, cooking fire, um, keeping young kids and pets, you know, three feet, six feet away. A lot of things like that are very similar to the, the wildfire stuff that Chief Smoke talked about earlier. Excellent. We're talking with Chief Smoke and Chief King from Volusia County Fire Rescue. We'll take our last break and come back and close out Volusia Today. Stay with us. I'm Will Roberts, your Volusia County tax collector. If you're like me, you don't want to wait in line. Many people are figuring out how to get around the line but still get their vehicle registration. Here's how you do it. You can renew your tag online and either have your registration mailed to you or you can walk in and pick it up through our express lane. Uh, I renewed my tag online and I'm here to pick it up. All you have to do is log on to vctaxcollector.org forward slash renew. That's vctaxcollector.org forward slash renew. The online payment vendor charges a service fee for online renewals. The fees are listed at the bottom of the page. My office does not receive any portion of this fee. The next time you need to renew your tags, consider skipping the trip by renewing online at vctaxcollector.org forward slash renew. Do you enjoy helping animals in need? then why not join our caring and professional team right here at Volusia County Animal Services. We have immediate openings for several high energy candidates interested in becoming a part of our animal care clinic family. As a vet assistant, you'll be doing everything from prepping patients for surgery as well as assisting in surgery, even recovering those patients. Also prepping log records and helping with our field services and our casework. Vet assistants also help out during our special events, which are extremely popular to the public. Things like pet microchipping and vaccine events, as well as food drives. All of those things are incredibly rewarding, and you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you're helping pets right here in your community. To get more information, please visit volusia.org or call 386-248-1790. You'll be glad you did. Are you looking for a new adventure? Come on down to the Marine Science Center in Ponce Inlet. Watch as our staff cares for sick and injured sea turtles. You can also explore our marine exhibits, touch some stingrays, visit our gift shop, and stroll through the Seabird Sanctuary. Afterward, you can visit the Ponce Inlet Lighthouse. The Marine Science Center is open every day but Monday. And we're back. I'm Gary Davidson along with Kevin Captain, and you're listening to Volusia Today, a public information program brought to you by the County of Volusia. Thanks, Gary. So question, Chief Smoke. Uh, when we always talk about prescribed burns, what exactly is a prescribed burn and what are the benefits? So prescribed burning is we actually put fire in the vegetated area. Uh, we try to mimic what nature has done for many, many decades and centuries here in Florida. Um, so we do that. However, prescribed burning is done very methodically. In reference, there's a lot of planning and coordination that goes on with that. We look at weather conditions. We look at fuel moisture. We look at the time of the year that it is. We look at our smoke in reference to where the smoke will go for impacting the residents. Um, so those are things we have to look at. And of course, we have to coordinate with the different um, agencies and personnel and resources that will be helping out on that. 
Now the benefits of it is, again, you know, Florida was a fire-based community for centuries. And so a lot of the vegetation, a lot of the wildlife is very dependent upon fire in the, in the wildland area. So it brings back nutrients to the soil for plants. It helps with wildlife habitat, habitats um, for the wildlife to be able to live accordingly and to, and, and to thrive, basically. It's also for fuel reduction. If you have a lot of fuel that's built up and there is a wildfire, that has a, a greater potential threat to the, to the people that live in that area. Um, so we do a lot of prescribed burning to, to uh, eliminate the fuel reduction and also for the benefits of the environment itself. It stimulates new growth. It stimulates new growth. It brings, like I said, brings back the nutrients to the soil and to the uh, the wildlife that are out there. I find that fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. So real briefly, uh, as we get ready to close, uh, where can people get more information about fire prevention as well as the uh, services offered by Volusia County Fire Rescue? Well, if you go to the website, and it's www.volusia.org, it'll go to the on there, you can go to the division tab and go to fire rescue. And on there is where you can find that um, fire prevention platform we talked about for the kids. A lot of links to um, NFPA information, home fire safety information, as well as um, wildland fire um, information. But there's a lot of information there or contact information on who to get a hold of if you have questions. Very Excellent. Good. That's volusia.org. And you just go under departments and fire rescue. With that, we'll close Volusia today. Thank you, Chief King and Chief Smoke. Thanks for being on the show today. Thanks Thank for you. having us. With that, we'll close today's show. Take care, stay safe, and help your neighbors. If you have a comment about Volusia today, or if there is a topic you would like to hear featured, please contact Volusia County Community Information at 1-866-345-0345.
Okay. Uh, we'll give it a 30 seconds for... Glenn, are you here for item 15? We're going to table it. Uh, and I don't, with something with everybody saw you walk in the back door and they asked me, can we table this? You, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I, and you could go ahead and table it now if you want. Okay. Once you start the meeting. To have a motion to table item 15. Table 15. <laughs> Jeez. And are we tabling it? Are we, are we risk it? No, let's just table it. Okay, we have a motion to table 15. The motion was by Lowry and second by, second by Wheeler or Gartman? Wheeler? Mr. Chair? Yes. Can I ask why? Time. It's a really important item, and I would prefer to do it in a, in a workshop because I have a lot of questions. Other council members um, apparently have a lot of questions, so I just don't want to run through it. We're going to be here till 8 o'clock, and I, I would, I'm just concerned that it won't be given serious attention. I think there's been people who might be here wanting to talk about it and waiting all day. What's your feeling? Do they want to go ahead and talk? Let you talk? Yeah, let them do their yeah. You were here for public comments on it? We'll still, we can do that. Can we do that? That's turning. We can do that? Okay. We can. Yeah, because we. No, not to cancel it. To postpone it to a time when we can give it the time that it deserves because it's it's really important we would like to hear from you now and you can come back when we do it I, my preference would be to do it for a workshop where that's all we do yes okay that's what we came out with who's called well it's y'all's call yeah. i mean yeah. you've yes. been here Sonia. a long time mr chair i Dana. think it, it basically on it, if that's the case then you could open up the item take the public input and then continue it okay do you want to have input now or wait till we do it because you've been here all day okay okay we will we will open item 15 that we just uh, just did we even take a vote on postponing it okay all right does she already have these things for you? Can I get them? Chair Brower? Yes. It's me, Dana. <laughs> You're hidden behind that. Even he thinks the Lord keeps speaking to him. <laughs> right. So we have Dr. Lowry mo made the motion to table. Who seconded it for the record, but, please? Thank you, Ms. Wheeler. And before we vote on it, like we often do, we'll, we're going to open it up for some discussion by the public. Are the attorneys happy with that method? Yes, sir. Okay. So I have, uh, there's a lot more than three of you. We'll start with uh, Yancey McDonald from New Smyrna. Good evening, uh, Yancey McDonald. Um, live here in Volusia County for a uh, generation. Uh, re resident of Volusia County, my family go back for years but before the county was formed. <clears throat> And uh, the reason I'm here is, of course, item number 15, uh, which is to deal with a comprehensive plan and trying to pour uh, more stringent rules and regulations on us. With that, we just dealt with item number 10. You see what they just went through, and it's 200 foot, so I think you are trying to get more or somebody this workshop. We'd love to attend the workshop, though. But um, <clears throat> anyway, it's here again uh, to... Uh, to speak regarding that, uh, you know, all the stringent, it's pretty stringent as it sets now to me, I believe, because I own a lot of RC corridor and I um, own quite a bit of property, but I know a lot of others that 
own uh, the vast majority of property in Volusia County and they don't even know about this change as we speak right now I'd called some but they couldn't make it today because they had plans and already had reservations so um, it was kind of uh, short notice for everybody but <clears throat> so anyway that's our that's one of the main things it's just to me this is uh, nothing more than a moratorium I believe to kind of slow things stop things uh, movement of uh, I'm a contractor um, landowner and uh, and you know you start putting these regulations and cost and and uh, and it's going to kill the uh, kill the business here in Volusia County we're already starving you see the, the things that we're dealing with now you know big government and am I here to ask the council if they would uh, <clears throat> look at this of course you're saying we're gonna have a workshop look at this and to uh, leave the comprehensive plan as it is and I'm asking if you guys to vote no you know on that on each item if every one of them items that I see on that list that we're dealing with here each one of them there's 30 items on here and and uh, I'm against all 30 I'll be honest with you um, I think that some you know it's uh, I'm against all 30 of them really to be honest with you but um, I think that um, that with this uh, we're infringing on the you know our property rights and um, and more so um, you know it's invading invading our property rights infringing on our property rights and and uh, work hard today to try to maintain as as a rancher we work hard to try to maintain and and save the environment I mean we we do uh, so we're in a civil culture operation and ag and uh, it makes it tough today to deal with all these things and and so someday not my myself but uh, my kids you'd like to save it for their future you know for maybe they'd want to develop it with these regulations it'd be impossible for that to happen thank you Charles McDonald Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Um, I'm just here. I'm going to make it short and sweet. Um, I, obviously, I was here regarding uh, item 19 as well. Um, as it stands with that, I would just like to point out the effect that it's going to have on single families that are trying to move into our county. I understand <clears throat> that you guys are all about the environment, which I am too. I would consider myself a conservationist. I, I care a lot about that, and I've donated a lot of money to it as well. Um, however, you have to consider the difficulties that if you expand upon what's already in place, you're going to be severely limiting the possibilities for people like myself, a younger generation that can't, you know, we might not be able to afford large parcels, um, specifically involving the trees. Um, they're talking about expanding historical trees and things of that nature. Um, that's already a huge encumbrance on the landowners and uh, possible builders so you're just making it way worse and a lot more basically uh, uh, in a shorter way of saying it the only way you're going to be able to do anything is if you have a lot of money and you guys are going to have to have more land in order to work around all of these environmental red tape that you guys are considering putting up so um, I would definitely be um, interested in attending a workshop and talking to people about this because um, it, it does mean a lot to me. Um, I grew up here and uh, I definitely wouldn't want to see any further expansion into into making it harder for uh, for new citizens or younger people who are turning into adult or trying to turn into adults because it's next to impossible to do that. So. Um, if you guys would consider, uh, uh, I think you have already have considered tabling it and talking about it some more, I would appreciate that. And I'm not really for anything that I've seen on this thing so far. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary Brolette? You might be missing a... That's what I said. <laughs> French, 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 French Canadian, they call it. Uh, good afternoon. 
I've been here all day with you fine people. Um, I think the best thing you did all day long was just now when we got back here at 2.30. Because there is no possible way what's on this agenda right here can be talked about in this amount of time. There's no possible way. Um, a lifelong resident of Belushi County, been in my whole entire life, starting from Oak Hill, Florida, when I was born, raised in Oak Hill, to New Smyrna, to Sam Sewell. I've been in Sam Sewell 25 years now. I am a property owner in Sam Sewell. Um, there's a few things in here that need to be definitely addressed. Um, and the smartest thing you did, I commend, take my hat off to you people for, for realizing that. Um, anyways, um, I was going to go in farther details about some of these things, but I don't have to now because you already tabled it. Um, just thank you for the work y'all do. Appreciate you, all, all of y'all. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Chair Brower, Ms. Post would like to speak. We still have a whole bunch of public that wants to speak. Um, Nicole McDonald. Are y'all three related? I don't see an old. <laughs> hey, I'm Nicole McDonald, um, resident of Port Orange, and my husband, uh, his family actually helped form Volusia County, and we're raising our fifth generation in Volusia County. So um, we're large landowners, we're business owners. We employ about 40 to 50 employee, uh, residents of Volusia County. So, um, you know, we feel like there's already, we're, we're dealing with the building industry every day. We feel like there's so much on them already, and, and for ourselves, I mean, there's so much hoops to jump through. I mean, 10 and 11 just showed you, there's so much hoops to jump through. And I feel like there's too much already. And I feel like it's just too much government, too much on us. We're, we have rights as property owners, or we should have. So I feel like you're just really infringing on our rights and telling us what we can and we can't do. We choose not to develop our property, but when we leave it to our children, I can't tell you they're not gonna develop it, but you're gonna make it impossible. You know, if you're telling me a historic tree can't be removed what they just can't build there, what they're gonna pay taxes on it. Um, and how is the tax issue gonna work on these properties if you're gonna tell me I can't build within 300 foot of a resource corridor? Some of these lots are small, they're not that big. So you're telling them they can't build so they bought property and they can't build. People moving from out of state don't understand Florida. They don't get it. So you're kind of really limited everybody on what, what they can do. And I just feel like it's everything in it was terrible, it's bad, and it's just way too intrusive on, on our rights. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, Wendy Anderson. I don't see her here. She did. Okay. So we're we're done with the uh, public input. Um, uh, Heather Post, do you wanted to interject? Yes, I would just say if we're uh, postponing this again to to talk about and schedule a workshop, if we could maybe look at that schedule and schedule something today, get something on the books where it's not six months down the road. Yes, that would be a that would be preferable. I don't know if it uh, everybody in here has a different schedule. Uh, different calendar. Um, the next is the next council meeting as packed as this one. It's pretty packed. So, because now you're inching more into budget, so we will have the uh, CIP discussion at the next uh, next meeting. It does. I don't know. It looks like everybody's looking at their calendar. What I'm hearing up here is that the council would like a, a, a whole day, or at least the opportunity, start in the morning and see how far it goes. Um, which may put it in into uh, this Thursday. Mr. Chair? Yes. So I have on my calendar the, the Tuesday after the June 7th one, I have a placeholder for possible county council workshop if needed. That should be on everyone's calendar still. 
uh, it's still online. So I think we already have a tentative council workshop time frame available for Tuesday, June 14th. It says from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's got 27 invitees on it. On what day? day? Uh, June 14th, Tuesday. Oh, yes. So everyone should have that tentatively reserved already? It's on my calendar. You still have it open? Yeah. I'm, I'm asking the county manager. He'll have, he could cancel his vacation. Okay. Why don't we, let's try and see if it'll work. Can I get a, a motion to reschedule it for June the 14th? So moved. So moved. We'll give uh, Heather the motion, Gertman the second, and discussion. Does that work for everybody? Works for me. Okay. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? June Mike, wait, don't go away yet. Michael Dyer. Yes, sir. I, I, I don't think it needs to change your motion, but just make sure we're doing what you want. I, we can advertise that as a special meeting because that way you can vote and give us direction versus a workshop, which is that two weeks. Um, if that's acceptable. Yes, that's acceptable. Okay, then we'll uh, set it for June 14th at um, 9 a.m. 10 a.m. That's what's on there. Okay, at 10 a.m. We'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chair, can I also say, can we figure out a better way of maybe communicating this more broadly? Because I'm kind of surprised that if we were having it, that we had so few. One family show up. Yeah, yeah. And something, well, there's a disconnect somewhere because some of the core people aren't here that, you know, if they understood it, <laughs> that that's the conversation we were having. So I'm not sure why, but. If we can, um, what are we using? Take Newspapers. Look at how we are communicating. Yeah, about we'll put it out. I think part of the issue was this came up pretty quick, uh, because and really the intent today, uh, you know, was to get direction on a schedule that Clay had put together. So uh, I, I, I know a lot of people were at the last workshop that this came out of, so that may not have understood uh, the issues. That would be there so <clears throat> we'll put out uh we'll take a look with kevin and make sure that the uh, entire uh, community stakeholders all are aware of this upcoming meeting Thank you. <clears throat> all right i think that takes us to uh item 12 uh, Volusia County's old, own Cyrus Kalem to present the economic development data for the first quarter of 2022. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Council, Cyrus Kalem, Aviation and Economic Resources. So it's my pleasure to present to you the first quarter of 2022. Um, I want to be respectful of the time, so I'm going to go through the slides relatively quickly. However, if you do have some information you want to discuss, I'll be more than willing to go back over that slide if possible. And as you notice, typically uh, Ms. Helga Van Eckert would be here giving you the presentation. Unfortunately, she's unable to make it, but we look forward to her potentially giving the presentation during the Q meeting that's going to be held this Friday, May 20th. So one of the things I, I really wanted to focus on for this overview is, is really where we are with wages and where we are with regard to the unemployment rate. And it's a good barometer to tell us as to where we are with regard to our recovery from the pandemic. So if you're, if you're looking at this graph, it shows where Volusia County is in relative uh, position to uh, the country and also to the state of Florida. And the growth rate is consistent. 
And, and, and looking at uh, some of the more populous counties in the state of Florida, you see where our wages are at $44,395 for average wages. Uh, we're about uh, $10,000 below the Florida average wage. But if we look at the regional average with our neighbors, um, Flagler County, St. Johns County, Seminole County, uh, we're about at that median point. Also, if we're looking at private employment, the average wage by industry, of course, financial activities uh, is the uh, largest in terms of annual wages, but education and health services in terms of our employment level continue to be our highest industry, followed by trade, transportation, and utilities. Similar with the business establishments, once again, financial activities still remains to be the uh, highest in terms of average wage, but professional and business services in terms of establishments tend to be our highest industry in Volusia County. So as I mentioned before, education and health services is our largest employer. Uh, they lost about uh, 1,300 jobs uh, from quarter one. Uh, however, we did increase about 3,000 jobs in leisure and hospitality and 1,200 jobs in transportation, warehouse, and utility uh, to bring us to just under 7,200 jobs net. So as we speak about unemployment, this is probably the lowest unemployment's been in the past five years. If we're looking at the graph, we look at, uh, we hit our high point uh, during the beginning of the pandemic and then where we are in March, of 2022, uh, the uh, maroon line there, uh, this is about as low as we've ever been in terms of the past five years. So in looking at the numbers, our unemployment rate is 3.3%, just uh, slightly above the state of Florida at 3.1, but uh, solidly below the national average. So uh, I would say that this is a good sign in terms of where people are and, and people out there finding jobs and getting to work. This is Helga's favorite slide, and it kind of tells a story as to uh, where we are with unemployment as it relates to the number of people that are currently employed and the available labor force that's there. And so if we're looking back at the beginning of the pandemic and we see where we fell off the cliff, we've gradually worked our way back to getting people that are out there in Volusia County back to work. And so I think that's a good sign of about how we've been able to persevere through the pandemic. I won't go through the individual municipalities, but um, of course I'll, I'll, I'll come back in detail if you guys would like, but, and then also I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the uh, permits. I will um, speak to the uh, commercial new construction building permits. Of course, um, that value permit um, dollar amount is due to the Amazon facility that's adjacent to the airport. And then I, I really want to talk about this slide, and this is actually probably the best slide that I that we've had to prepare for yet. It just shows our key perf performance indicators with regards to how well we've done uh, for this past year. 5.3% with job growth, our average private wages went up almost 8%, uh, a 40% increase from the first quarter in 2020 in terms of housing permits, average home values from the first quarter of 2021 at 30%, a drop in unemployment down from the first quarter in 2021 and that drop was 2.3% to the 3.3% that I mentioned before. Um, a very modest increase in average home family income at 1%, but a 37% increase with commercial permits. Uh, average rents, of course, uh, that's, a, that's another topic for another day, but that's also up at 22%. So with that, uh, do you have any questions that I can hopefully answer as eloquently as Ms. Van Eckert?
But you must have done a good job. I don't see any questions here. It looks like we're creeping back. Hopefully we'll leap back at some point. We need more higher paying jobs. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's uh, one of the things that our economic development department is working on, especially with our existing businesses and our small businesses, getting them the support that they need. Right. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't think we need a motion to accept that report. So we'll go on to uh, item 13, the internal audit of economic <coughs> development incentives. Good afternoon, council members. Jonathan Edwards, internal auditor. Today I'm presenting the internal audit report of economic development incentives. The audit scope was uh, January 1st, 2014 through December 31st, 2021. And the purpose was to perform audit procedures to gain a reasonable degree of assurance that the county has controls in place to effectively operate economic development incentives um, through the application, the negotiation, and granting of awards, and that the county monitored the recipient's compliance with the terms and conditions of their awards, and looked for opportunities for improvements to help strengthen controls and increase efficiency, effectiveness, and transparency of incentives. To accomplish the audit objectives, I reviewed resolutions, laws, policies, and procedures, reviewed best practices and how the county implemented these, tested incentive agreements to ensure that all benchmarks were met and complied with the agreements, analyzed and projected property tax values of the business pre-incentive and post-incentive to determine the impact on the county's property tax revenues. The projections in the report and the analysis in my presentation only include the impact on the property taxes. The projections included in the appendix were very conservative. Other information such as sales tax revenues, uh, indirect and induced jobs created, and ongoing cost of government services were not factored in those projections. Um, these factors are not uh, public information and were not, required to re were not required to be reported by the business within the incentive agreements. Therefore, these factors cannot be included for audit purposes. Incentive awards provided by the county fall within two broad categories. Incentives the county directly awarded to businesses, and these the county managed. Um, there have been four direct awards awarded by council since 2014. In 2015, the council approved the Special Infrastructure Grant Program, and this program allowed for infrastructure incentives for developers that would otherwise not qualify for incentives, and there's only been one SIG award. In 2018, council approved the Water Quality Infrastructure Grant Program, and this program provides financial assistance to qualified businesses to improve existing or create new wastewater systems. The business must be located in unincorporated county and hold a valid Department of Defense or Department of Homeland Security contract. It also must be located within an environmentally sensitive area, and there's only been one of these awards given. For the county managed awards, there were six performance-based incentives given since 2014, and I audited all six of these. The other type of incentives um, approved by the county are the incentives that the State Department of Economic Opportunity, or the DEO, manages. These incentive awards are known as the Qualified Targeted Industry Grants or the QTI Grants. Each QTI grant is performance-based and approved by council before being awarded by the DEO. The DEO manages the entire QTI process from the grant application, the negotiation, and the monitoring for the job creation benchmarks. Upon successfully meeting and confirming that the benchmarks have been met, the DEO then pays the business. The DEO then will invoice the county to pay for our 20% match. <coughs> The QTI program was expired in 2021 by the state legislature. No new QTI monies are being awarded. However, any outstanding agreements are being honored and monitored by the DEO. If the business falls short of meeting their established benchmarks, the DEO will only pay a portion of the award. For example, if the business agreed to um, create 100 new jobs but only created 90, the DEO will only pay 90% of the award. From 2014 through 2021, the county awarded 26 separate QTI grants, and the DEO maintains an online portal that any citizen can pull the information from. Table three within my report lists all the QTI awards from the county since 2014. <coughs> As I stated, the DEO manages the QTI program and confirms the job creation numbers within the business. They provide supporting documentation to the county to support their invoicing. County staff appropriately reviewed um, all invoices and agreements. Uh, I audited seven separate QTI awards and found no issues to report. The business either met their benchmarks or if they fell short, the DEO and the county only paid up to their proper allocation of their award. 
This table provides a summary of all the different types of incentives that were awarded by the County Council. The audit report explains each of incentive award in detail, but I'll recap these very briefly for you. The first award was for Trader Joe's Distribution Center, Daytona Beach. The project was estimated to be $80 million and bring in at least 400 new to Florida jobs. The county constructed a new intersection signal and added an acceleration lane for entrance to the project site. The improvements were completed as agreed and the number of jobs created were confirmed to be over 500, which was 100 over the requirement. Again, all of the terms and conditions of the agreement were met. Prior to the incentive, the taxable value of the property was $53,000 and the county received $402 in property tax revenues. In 2021, the taxable value was $27.4 million and brought in almost $180,000 of county property tax revenues. The second award in 2014 was for One Daytona, which is a multi-purpose mixed-use development in Daytona Beach. The project was estimated to be $812 million and estimated to bring 7,200 jobs. It included office, retail, two hotels, research and development warehouses, and residential units. The infrastructure costs were estimated to be $53 million. To help offset the infrastructure costs, One Daytona requested $20 million from the county and $20 million from the city of Daytona Beach. The agreement required that 55% of the retail and commercial space be occupied by businesses that did not have locations in the county as of January 1st, 2014. It had to include a national or regional movie theater and have a, ma a major national outdoor outfitter anchor tenant and have no less than 50,000 square feet dedicated to public plaza, park, and congregation space. Representatives signed affidavits and provided supporting documentation to verify that the criteria were met. In fact, at the time, they exceeded the 55% goal and had 67% of new to Volusia businesses as tenants. County staff reviewed the supporting documentation and payments were made appropriately to one Daytona. Jonathan. Yes. I, I, I'm sorry. No. Go ahead. Quick, Quick break. break. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. This is still ongoing, too, the one Daytona, right? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so those aren't like final figures. Those are just correct. probably not even half done with what they have planned out there. That's what I understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. In order to provide the $20 million incentive, county staff provided council with financing options from the initial meeting in 2014. Council approved the use of $5 million of reserves and borrowing the remaining $15 million. The financing plan was to apply the tax revenues generated from the property and from the project to pay the principal and interest cost relating to the $15 million borrowing. In 2016, $15 million debt was issued for a term of 10 years at a true interest cost of 1.85%. The total interest payment over the life of the 10 years was set to $1.7 million. However, during years of 2017 through 2019, the county led a go-to-zero initiative on county debt. In 2018, the county paid off the balance and reduced the future interest payments. This saved approximately $1.1 million of interest expense. The county's net cost in this borrowing was just over $500,000. All the terms and conditions of the one Daytona agreement were met. Prior to the incentive, the taxable value of the property was $35.4 million, and the county received $267,000 in property tax revenues. In 2021, the taxable value was $130.9 million, and brought in over $864,000 of county property tax revenues. In 2015, council approved $2.25 million for infrastructure costs related to the Tanger Outlet Mall, which was an anchor tenant for the planned Tomoka Town Center project in Daytona Beach. The Tanger Outlet was projected to be 400,000 square feet at a cost of $100 million, and it was estimated to bring 400 full-time and 400 part-time jobs to the Outlet Mall. The entire project site, Tomoka Town Center, included a wholesale club, retail stores, hotel, multifamily housing, grocery, and out parcels. The projected annual sales were estimated at $288 million and a taxable value of $151 million. The projected infrastructure cost was $16.3 million and the incentive of $2.25 million provided by the county would apply to the infrastructure cost. The terms of the agreement stipulated that 70% of the business within Tinger in 2021, the taxable value was $174.1 million and brought in over $1.1 million of county property tax revenues. In 2016, Council approved $2.25 million to Embry-Riddle for infrastructure costs relating to their research park and business incubation center. The research park includes offices, labs, and a hangar space with direct taxiway to the airport. The research park would include a 10 million wind tunnel, uh, wind tunnel facility and be home to startup companies within Volusia County. 
The agreement required that a certificate of occupancy be issued, invoices and proof of payment for their construction cost. Additionally, that the county engineer would inspect the facility to ensure it was built as agreed. In 2017 and 2018, the county engineer conducted inspections and staff reviewed all of the supporting documentation. Embry-Riddle met the terms of the agreement and payments were made. Since Embry-Riddle is a tax exempt organization, they do not pay property taxes and therefore analysis was not performed. In 2017, council approved a direct award of up to four and a half million dollars for infrastructure costs related to the new international headquarters building for Brown and Brown. Their infrastructure costs were estimated to be over $9 million. It was agreed that the city of Daytona Beach and the county would equally split the infrastructure cost and that the city would manage the project relating to the infrastructure. It was estimated that the project would create 600 new to Florida jobs and once completed, the taxable value was projected at 37.2 million. In 2021, the county engineer inspected the site and reviewed supporting documentation, including invoices and payments related to the project. The total cost of the infrastructure was a little more than $7 million. Therefore, the county's portion was a little more than $3.5 million. Again, all the terms of the agreement were met, inspection was cleared, and the county paid the $3.5 million. In 2017, Council also approved a QTI incentive grant for Brown & Brown. That grant was for $4.5 million, of which $3.6 million was paid by the DEO and $900,000 by the county. In exchange, Brown & Brown committed to creating 600 new to Florida jobs by the end of 2024. As of December of 2021, Brown & Brown were scheduled to have created 150 of these new jobs, and the DEO has confirmed that 247 have been created. Prior to the incentive, the tax value of the property was $500,000, and the county received $3,600 in property tax revenue. In 2021, the tax value was $45.5 million and brought in over $298,000 in county property tax revenues. In 2019, the council approved a WQIG, or the Water Quality Infrastructure Grant Program, of $500,000 to Spartan to partially fund their wastewater system. Their capacity was 12,000 12, gallons per day and was upgraded to 20,000 gallons per day. It was to help support their current workforce of 600 in addition to future expansion of the business. Additionally, Spartan moved their headquarters from Illinois to their plant in Dillion Springs. The reimbursement agreement was that the county staff would inspect the project, review supporting invoices and documentation to ensure that the system was built as agreed and met all the environmental regulations. Upon inspection and review of invoices, all terms and conditions were met and the county released payment for $500,000. Prior to the incentive, the taxable value of the property was $4.4 million and the county received over $57,000 of property tax revenue. In 2021, the taxable value was $4.8 million and brought in over $59,000 of county property tax revenue. <clears throat> this table provides a brief summary of the different types of incentives that were awarded by County Council for the QTI program that were selected for auditing. Again, the audit report explains each incentive award in detail, but I'll recap these very briefly. But let me start with the last two on this table. Future Foods was listed on the DEO's web portal as a grant shared with the county. However, once I got into it in further review, the county was not involved in this grant. The 20% local match was provided by the city of Ormond Beach. Therefore, therefore, no further audit work was done. And Bimbo QSR was listed on the DEO's web portal as active when I started the audit. However, the company has since pulled out of the QTI program and the award was terminated by the DEO. <coughs> county uh, staff have since closed the purchase order for this grant. No monies were paid towards the incentive and therefore no further audit work was done. <clears throat> B. Braun Medical was awarded two separate grants, one in 2017 and the other in 2018. The 2017 grant was to create 30 new jobs by 2021. However, the company failed to meet this requirement and the DEO marked this grant as inactive. The county's portion was up to $18,000. However, the purchase order was closed by the county since it did not meet the job benchmarks and no payment was made. The 2018 grant was to create 100 new to Florida jobs by the end of 2026. Per the agreement, the company must create at least 20 new jobs by the end of 2024. The total award was $500,000 with the county share at $100,000. Since the company does not have to start meeting this cre uh, creation number until 2024, no payments have been made towards this grant. Prior to the incentive, the taxable value was almost $9.47 million, and the county received almost $59,000 in property tax revenues. In 2021, the taxable value was over $21 million, and the county received over $136,000 in county property tax revenues. 
Boston Whaler was to create 125 new to Florida jobs. The 20% local match was actually split with the city of Edgewater. The county share was only 6.4% or $40,000. By October of 2020, the DO confirmed that 253 jobs had been created and the county paid all $40,000 towards this commitment. Prior to the incentive, the taxable value was over $8.8 million and the county received almost $65,000 in property tax revenue. In 2021, the taxable value was over $18 million and the county received over $119,000 in county property tax revenue. And finally, Security First Managers was to create 165 new to Florida jobs by December of 2021. The DEO confirmed that 242 had been created by April of 2021. The county has paid $79,000 towards this $198,000 commitment. Prior to the incentive, the taxable value was $53,000 and the county received $389 in property tax revenue. In 2021, the taxable value was over $21 million and the county received over $129,000 in property tax revenues. I covered these amounts in the previous slide, but wanted to provide you with uh, a summary in one table for you. Again, the property tax revenues listed here only show the county's portion of the revenues, the schools, the cities, and other tax authorities are listed in detail in the report. All of the terms and conditions were met by the businesses. Essentially, the programs required that the business build the infrastructure and be reimbursed for actual costs up to the awarded amount. Except for in the Trader Joe's agreement, the county did not require the businesses to meet certain job creation benchmarks. The one Daytona and Tanger outlet agreements contained terms that their tenants had to be a certain percentage of new to Volusia businesses, and those were met and were exceeded. The agreements did not contain ongoing benchmarks for a certain time frame after completion of the project. For example, the QTI program requires job benchmarks for a set time, sometimes up to seven years before all the incentive is paid out. The division did not have written policies and procedures regarding incentives to help mitigate these risks. For example, documentation was not maintained or kept in the files to prove that staff had performed due diligence on the business before recommending approval to council. For example, ensuring that the business was not facing bankruptcy or that their auditors had a going concern issue. There was no documentation kept that staff performed a reasonableness check on the job creation numbers. And there was no documentation that a cost or benefit analysis was done to determine how much of an incentive is required to be given to influence the business to act. By not performing and maintaining this analysis, the county is exposed to two substantial risk. One, the county may be providing incentives to influence business decisions that would have been made without the incentive. And two, the county may be providing more money than needed to incentivize the company to change its course of action. A well-written policy and procedures handbook will also include procedures for staff to properly monitor the business as agreed to. For example, in one Daytona agreement, it stipulates that in year 2046, a net present value calculation be done by an independent consultant to compare the amount of the award with the amount realized. Any amount within that 3% variance is to be reimbursed to the county and the city of Daytona Beach. Staff files do not have any sort of reminder or tickler file for this um, agreement. Finally, the state statute requires that certain information be submitted to the DEO on incentives as well as be posted on the county's website. Staff have submitted this information to the DEO, however, it was not posted on the county's website. The Government Finance Officers Association has established several best practices relating to economic development incentives. They range from the creation of goals through the analysis, the negotiation, and the monitoring of the incentives. A summary of these practices are included in the report. Staff agreed with the recommendations and have already started drafting incentive policies and procedures to help reduce the risk involved. I would like to thank Cyrus and Helga and their staff for their assistance during the audit and also the property appraiser and his staff for providing important information on the tax parcels. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Ex explain something to me so I understand that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not following um, the slides you're using, but it's, uh, I'm looking at table three. Okay. It lists all of the... Uh, the businesses and the statuses there were um, QTI awards from 2014. Yes. Mm -hmm. 2014 to 2021. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's 26 companies. Three are inactive and 12 were terminated, which is like 58 percent are either inactive or terminated. Why? What? Why is that? 
So inactive means that they did not meet their benchmarks, but they might qualify for a future QTI if the QTI program was still going on. Um, terminated meant that they did not meet the criteria and they were no longer in consideration. For example, maybe they pulled out completely, like in the case of the BIMBO QSR, they just left the state completely. No, or left their no concerns of, of what that says of, about the entire program? Um, not from the county's perspective, maybe if you're looking at it from the state's perspective, since they manage the program, but the county's involvement is fairly small with the QTI program. They manage all of it. Um, they send us an invoice, and uh, once it's approved by council, um, once it's met the benchmarks. Okay. Any other questions? Barbara Gertman. Thank you, Chair. Um, but the but the QTI program was performance based, right? Correct. Based on what they agreed that they could accomplish or expected to accomplish. So if they did not, could not. Um, and I think it was also more of a time of a downturn. So I, I think that 58% doesn't concern me because we didn't have a heavy impact. And I think it was done at a time when they thought things would be, um, the tide would be rising quicker than it did. So um, yeah, so I, th I think that would be expected. Right. And, and it's great that that the, the state had more at risk um, or carried most of the risk than, than we did. We tried to give an opportunity to get people back to work and support small business. Thank you. Yeah. And the ones that the county managed, those were also performance-based. Yeah, and, that, and that's better, and I'm not, your goal in this wasn't to say we should or shouldn't do this. It was how are we doing it? Are we doing it the best possible way? Are we, um, are we managing it properly? And, and that's your role, and you've done it well. I appreciate the information. <coughs> For me, and this is no surprise to my fellow council members, that I think I have a, a slightly different philosophical bent that um, I, I like the fact that these are performance based. It gets around part of my um, part of my hang up with it. Um, I we just saw in the in the, the report that Cyrus did that we need more high paying jobs here, and I believe that if we spent the money to um, improve our existing businesses and not just um, to bring in new businesses. We need to do both, that, um, that we would accomplish that goal um, better. The, uh, you mentioned Florida, and I think I said this the, the last time, there are two Florida oversight groups, the Office of Economic and Demographic Research and the Office of Program Policy Analysis and Government Accountability. Um, sounds just like government, doesn't it? They, you got to name this long. Um, um, they recommended that the F Florida programs were shut down, and it says Florida state officials ended the Enterprise Zone program in 2015, but the important lessons were these. To the extent that the state funds supporting the incentive money could have been more productively spent elsewhere, and the business activity would have occurred anyway. The state actually forgoes revenues beyond the direct cost of the in incentives. So the only point I would might like to make, Iris, I would like you to take it back, is that this is why I support the incubator so much. And the program that you did with Embry-Riddle, I think is, is fantastic because it's it's helping um, new Volusia County entrepreneurs get established. And I, I just, I think we need to be careful to steer away from winners and losers. I know that your office has heard that and that's why we've now gone to an incentive program instead of um, just direct funding and, and hope it all works out. Um, I, I just wanna keep pushing us in that direction. Absolutely, right. absolutely. 
Uh, go ahead. Our small business and our existing businesses, of course, within Volusia County, our our main press is is business retention and expansion. So whatever we can do, the program that we have coming on board, Volusia Business Resources, is an opportunity for us to get those gears in motion to do just that. So uh, okay. there's there's more information to come. Uh, Ms. Van Eckert will be giving a presentation kind of highlighting some of the the opportunities and some of the success stories that we have with VBR. Um, the website is in the process of being developed and being uh, tweaked, and so we want to make sure that it's going to be all things for all people. Uh, One-stop shop virtually, and then we have ideas and goals towards doing something physical as well in order to help our existing business partners. Good. Uh, ben Johnson, don't go anywhere. I believe our incentive program has done what it's supposed to do. I, I do believe we always need to keep the, uh, make sure we, we put any checks and balances in it that we can to make sure it stays that way for future times. And then it's part of it's a, a learning program. But I think overall it's done a lot for Volusia County. For instance, Spartan probably would have gone somewhere else, taking their jobs to another state. But we stayed in here instead. We took their jobs from there and brought them here. Um, we could have lost Brown and Brown. Now it looked like we could end up a, an insurance mecca because we have several large insurance companies that have located here. And the more that come, that's typical history, the more that end up here. I mean, you know, they, other people follow. Uh, you take one Daytona, they still have 120 acres, 120 acres yet to develop. And, and, and we don't even take into account, and, and that's not the purpose of this audit, is how much sales tax do some of these places bring in? You know, that doesn't really tell us. Some of them don't bring in the sales tax. They just bring in the general sales to bring in the, you know, their wholesale. They bring in the jobs, and, and that's very good, but we, we don't take into account how much sales tax any of these areas happen to bring in and what it does to our area or to the surrounding areas next to them that continue to develop because of it, and especially when you're dealing with infrastructure, which is a lot of what we're we're putting in, taking aged infrastructure that we're going to have to do something in the future for anyway, including downtown Daytona, where whenever we got ready to do a, or get ready to do a courthouse, now we have infrastructure there that we didn't have before. So it just kind of stepped it up in advance. So these are, are things that um, I truly believe, oh, in a perfect world, nobody gives incentives, but other places do and give incentives, and we're bidding against them to get good quality jobs to our area and that's one of the biggest things we lack it's one of the things that most of us as parents are looking for because we're educating our children to go somewhere else and this is bringing in jobs that can keep our kids here and our talent in all the different universities and colleges we have in this area here so i'm very much for performance based incentives and i think we're meeting our mark i think it's a good way to go thank you for your report Danny Robbins. Thank you. Just for some clarity, to just put a couple of things uh, to bed in the community. We, we just don't arbitrarily just hand money out blindly with no expected return or no forecast of what we're going to turn long to, you know, get in return long term through tax revenue, right? No, not at all. Okay, so there's checks and balance. Absolutely. There's just, there's been this kind of um, idea marinating like we just, hand out money like it's going out of style and, and not getting a return on it. And I, to, I knew that wasn't the case. To add to that, just <clears throat> as you look at these, pro these programs were, uh, for the most part, all infrastructure based. So in other words, take the Brown and Brown. Uh, the money was really given to the city of uh, Daytona Beach, which then managed the infrastructure. We basically had uh, Big utility upgrades and stormwater work that had to be done in the downtown area. So um, there's also some traffic light upgrades and other things. So the money usually goes to an infrastructure project that supports that business. And, um, and something like that, especially it's a, in a place for redevelopment, and that definitely played on, uh, no into uh, the decision. And now you have infrastructure in place for other things that may come along associated or nearby 
that facility. And the same goes true for the uh, Daytona One and the others. The money went to either went to public infrastructure, uh, big water lines that went out to serve that area, uh, public spaces, streets that are open to the public. Um, so again, we never, like you say, write a check, and uh, it, it goes to uh, and is accounted for. Uh, by the infrastructure that either we build or they build. In most cases, it's best that they build it as part of their project. Yeah, I just, I just wanted that clear, because as, as long as we are getting that return, because this, this stuff trickles down to uh, janitors in our workforce who we are focused on, our lower income, uh, middle class. You know, these are their, their, their jobs that some of these, or actually all of them, kind of uh, support. So, you know, as long as we're balancing it, and it appears there's uh, many checks and balances for that, uh, just to echo what Ben said, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm for it at this point. Thank you. Fred Lowry. I just want to add, too, that, you know, when we have something come in like that, say it's brown and brown or whatever, it does help the small businesses because the restaurants and the paper companies or whatever that are all around that area are going to benefit from that. So in a sense, it, uh, it isn't just helping out the, uh, the big guy. Uh, those small businesses are located in that area or even maybe not even located in that area are affected in a positive way by that. And that's a, that's a great help to them. That's an excellent point, Dr. Lowry. Billy Whelan. Thank you. Yeah, Fred, I was going to bring those things up myself. You know, if you look at the list here and, you know, Synergy, look at them, you know. The, I mean, Doherty uh, Manufacturing, um, there's Boston Whaler, um, it's proving that uh, this is really working. And, um, you know, I'm all about return on investment. <laughs> That's why I have a financial guy that handles mine and I say, let's go for it. Um, this is, like you said, helping the small business people because they're going to be out there in the restaurants. They're going to be hiring the yard guy. They're going to be uh, uh, doing uh, purchasing clothing and, and every single thing else. And, and um, the, the different services that each one of those people require also. So I think this is, has been a very successful program. We've had a few that have dropped off, but again, it's all been incentive-based. And I can remember Brown and Brown when they came to us, and it was strictly for infrastructure. And I think that was shortly after we had the huge flood down there. And that was just a mess, and how we all knew that that was something that was going to have to be resolved and the timing was right let me tell you there's a lot of competition out there for these big companies and sometimes if you're not there just saying you know we want you here it's not just enough that we have sunshine you know it, it's just really not uh sometimes you have to pardon me yeah sometimes you have to entice them but again we're not just handing them a check it's incentive based. If they don't, if they don't meet up to their expectations, then as you can see, there's places that we didn't follow through. So, uh, so far it's worked, and I, I encourage that we continue that process. And thank you for all you're doing there for the small businesses and moving all of that forward. It's exciting times. Well, thank you very much, and uh, not to be self-serving of the Department of Aviation and Economic Resources, but. This also indirectly affects air service yeah. because if we're bringing in big business and those people that are going to pay high yield for plane tickets, the airlines are watching what we're doing as well. So all of these things are going to interrelate with one another to help all businesses in the county. Here, I'm, I'm glad that you, you brought up Brown and Brown, the, the, the discussion from the beginning was that it'll help all of the downtown businesses, people go to the restaurants, except that they built a restaurant in the bottom floor of it and they, they don't even buy the food locally. The food is bought from out of town and, and brought in. That's their choice. Um, will it still help the downtown restaurants? I, I don't know. Mr. I Chair? hope that it is. And I can only tell you, if you ride up and down Beach Street lately, I don't care what time of the day, there is activity. And that didn't happen just overnight. 
Uh, there are more people. Not everybody's eating in the brown and brown restaurant. They're out there on the streets. So I think it is working, and all of those people are finding homes. That's true. You know. Who wants to eat at the same restaurant every day? <laughs> There's a good ramen do, place my, and a good My point is, right when you give somebody th th millions of dollars in an incentive and say that their employees are all going to eat in, in the different restaurants, a different restaurant every day downtown, um, it matters to the public. I, I understand, but you're not hearing me, though. It matters to the public when they see us giving out their money. I... You, I'm thinking about the the businesses along US one or in South Daytona or wherever they're all saying, Well what when do we get a brown and brown so we get our infrastructure upgraded so that we can have more um, we can expand our business, get more employees here. It's just um, it's w when government picks winners and losers the people that, that are being taxed for that money that comes out of their business to go into somebody else's businesses, it doesn't feel fair to them. So I want to spend money. I'm not arguing with you whether or not Brown and Brown will include Beach Street. I'm arguing that we need to have programs and, and um, things that we do for businesses all over this county to elevate them to, and to make the county a more uh, more of a magnet to businesses around the world to come here because we have public safety because downtown is thriving and and it's beautiful um, because the water's clean and you can drink it because the fish can actually be found and eaten without getting sick um, and I, I like a broader approach than this um, than this approach, but this is where we are. Ben, you, uh, Barb Gervin. Thank you, um, Chair, and I, I think I hear you say often we are not a one size fit all, and um, to me, what a brown and brown does, um, it's a catalyst for an area that had been underdeveloped, underutilized, and an investment in a community overall, and trying to jumpstart and do infill and, and make a difference for that whole corridor that had been pretty much um, underserved for a very long time. So from, from that um, brown and brown building, you see, um, a catalyst for Midtown. You see new investment, a lot of new discussion about how that moves forward. And again, for me, a lot of times it's timing, right? It's, it's where we are today in 2022 versus where we were maybe five, 10 years ago. So the stars need to align, but you also have to have someone who can make that investment. And I think that's what that brown and brown is. To me, that's what NASCAR did with their $800 million investment, become a catalyst for an area, and you see the businesses around that started to reinvest because they saw you know, a much bigger picture for the next 20, 30 years. So I, I think it's not one size. Those are huge investments. But as you said, we also need to invest in the little guys that maybe aren't getting the same access and same reach. And we need to define and work with them for what they need, not try to match that to you know, the largest investments that happen in the community, but also appreciate the catalysts that are really bringing about change. Ben Johnson. Daytona started dying when GE left. And we ended up with a basically warehouses out there with very little of anything. And we start investing in there in downtown Daytona, your core areas. So what are we looking at at bringing in? Right now there's talk about putting up apartment and condo complexes in downtown Daytona, which currently what you have is at the end of the day, people go back to the suburbs and not supporting your core downtown areas. 
Brown and Brown, for instance, will take and make it viable to put these things downtown. Now you're going to have that walk and trade. It's going to wake up Beach Street. You walk in and bicycles, possibly golf carts, and you watch in a few years, it's going to pick up to Main Street, which is a beautiful street that's underutilized except two times a year to where you're going to actually have, you can have the Mount Dora type or the Deland type or the new Smyrna type businesses that's going all the time. We constantly hear over from John and his neighborhood about the downtrodden housing, which we're seeing some of those places already coming back. But those are quaint houses that when you start having people working downtown, you're going to start seeing them buying these places and fixing them up. So you're not talking about one particular industry. You're talking about total redevelopment of a downtown area over a period of time. And I see it some because I don't go over there as much, and so I see some changes. So I think this kind of development, the Daytona one, that brings people in, it has somewhere to go, I think this has really done a lot for our area, and it's kind of unfair sometimes the um, crap they catch for what they have reinvested themselves in our area, and I find that to be very sad. You got a beautiful park going in downtown. There's reasons for people to stay downtown today and to do further development to bring up our economy. And in smart growth, what do they say? Put it in your core areas and not do, not, you know, take up your urban sprawl sort of stuff. So I, I think this is where we want to go and what we need to keep doing. Billy Reeland. Yeah, I'm just going to go back again to, you know, Boston Wheeler. What has it done for yeah. that area? Uh, uh, Doherty, uh, Synergy, you know, and Holly Hill. I mean, you know, I, I think we are hitting it from all areas. And again, going back to Brown and Brown, you know, I that's my district. I don't really hear people talking too much about their restaurant because, you know, after, after their work day and they've plugged in their hours, they go down on the street and they go to the restaurant and have a drink and whatever else afterwards. Um, and they've developed this huge park across the street for the public. That area is changing. They just approved that great big apartment complex. And that was because of the catalyst that Ms. Gertman was talking about. And I think sometimes it takes that and that vision to see what is this going to play out? Are we going to be worried about where they're eating their lunch? You know, because they've made it easier for them, or, or what they're actually bringing as a whole to Volusia County, Daytona. And I know that was just one, one comment, Jeff, and I'm certainly not zeroing in on that. And if I sound, I, I am, I'm not. Uh, because it's the big picture. It's the big picture of the people that they've brought in that have the income to spend it here. And that's really, really what we've been asking for. It, it is a big picture, and I, I don't, I don't disagree with that. What, what we have to be careful of, and I, I, I might be the only one that's getting emails from restaurants on Beach Street that aren't doing well and that are asking for help, um, and that are concerned. There's, there's businesses that have closed on Beach Street. I hope that Brown and Brown helps it. To, um, to improve, and I have every expectation that it will. But what was distasteful and hard for the public to understand is when one of the richest companies in America says, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna build here, but only if you will give us X amount of dollars, and then if you don't, we're going to Atlanta. That, to me, I don't like a gun to my head. And, um, so the public's trying to, to uh, overcome that. A lot of them will never overcome it. Um, That's our only. Okay. Yeah, this is going to go nowhere. Thank you for your report. I need a, a motion to uh, accept um, so uh, moved. Cyrus's report. Motion by Gertman. And Jonathan's report. Yeah, I can't take credit for yeah, Jonathan. That was oh, Jonathan. Sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> that was the audit report. Motion yeah. by Gertman and second by Billy. Was that you? See what you started, Jonathan? I appreciate you, you doing that. That's why you're here. And, um,
and um, I appreciate the hard work. Any other discussion? All in favor say of accepting Jonathan's report, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, item 14, um, two council member appointees and one citizen appointed to the Value Adjustment Board. Mr. Chair, this is for the Value Adjustment Board and any count, county council member may nominate. We do have two council member appointments and one citizen appointment. Uh, to this board for the 2022 property tax season. I'm going to motion for Pat Patterson. I'll second that. Pat Patterson for the um, Value Adjustment Board. I think I appointed him last time. Okay, and is that for the citizen? Yes. Yes. We don't really need a second for that, do we? A nomination and a vote. Would, who seconded it? By Lowry. Okay. Um, let's deal with that one. All in favor of Pat Patterson, say aye. Aye. Any, op any opposed? Okay. Um, now you need two other, two council member appointments. Did we have two council members serving on that? Do they wish to continue serving? Are you going to publicly resign? <laughs> Sir, Mr. Chair, we currently have council member Johnson and council member Wheeler serving on the value adjustment board. And it's for what length of a term? It's from April 1st to the, re to the very last meeting for the 2022 tax season. You'll be here then. Oh, good. You're good? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> we'll re reappoint uh, Billy Wheeler and Ben Johnson. Oh, you wanted to do it? <laughs> ben does? <laughs> you better, never mind. Okay. All in, all in favor of reappointing um, our council members, uh, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion's carried seven to zero. That's right. God can't come soon enough. Excuse, excuse us one moment, please. Do we need a legal? Do we need a second for that or no? We had a oh. for appointments. We do. May oh, I we, have ha it? we had a second. Oh, may I have it for the record, please? Miss Wheeler was the second, correct? Yeah, she was for the. She seconded the citizens. Okay. Citizen advisory. I make the motion. I make Is the that motion. What all that was for? Yes, that was my whoop whoop motion okay. for <laughs> for anybody other than me to be on the value adjustment board. I thought you were so it was, an airplane. It was it was <laughs> Billy and Ben Johnson. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair, so, I just want to make it known that after I leave, I think I'm gonna come here every other Tuesday and I'm gonna make John look like a piker. <laughs> You gonna bring a newspaper? So, I'm so, a so the, but the point was we didn't have a second. You didn't have a, a motion. You made the motion. So we have okay. You just need a just, second. You just told me we you need made a, a second. Motion. So I have Miss Gertman making the motion for the reappointments for Council Member Johnson and Council Member right. Wheeler for the Value Adjustment Board, and then I, we need a second, please. I'll second that. Thank you. Second by Lowry. Does that change the vote? Everybody in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? I'm sorry, I'm really not trying to make a, a joke out of this. It's it's important, but um, pre 1923 Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad all of you can't hear the comments up here. Oh, can I got you? my mic on. I could. <laughs> Sixteen growth and resource management budget and service level. Yeah, 
believe so. He said goodbye to us over this. So I think he got no. Just because of the time now. Oh, there she is. We've got growth and resource, then we have coastal, and then we have leadership uh, budget. So make it interesting. We're from growth and resource management. We can't make anything interesting. We just make it long, long, very long. Today, we're here to talk to you about our budget and level of service standards. Uh, the presentation we have is pretty straightforward, um, no videos included, so we'll be able to get through and identify the critical issues that we're facing here, both in this current year and coming forward in the pending fiscal year for 22-23. Do we, oh, so I'm tap dancing over here while my PowerPoint is getting queued up. Um, what you're going to see is basically, um, the overview is that we don't have a lot of capital items. The majority of our stuff is tied into personnel because we are a service-based organization in that that's what we primarily provide. So going forward, this is an overview of our uh, department. As you can see, there's the administration division, which um, is myself and nine other employees, building and code administration, environmental management, and planning and development services. We are all an integrated team that works together to address everything from comprehensive planning to sea turtle permitting. We're going to go through it in order of building code, then environmental, and then closing up will be planning and development services. I will give you the highlights of the administration division if this will advance. It Oh, oh, I'm sorry, it is working now. Administration. In there we have five full-time employees, accounting myself. We have our operations manager to support staff, as well as a special projects coordinator over an impact fees. And I want to point this out. There is one full-time employee who basically is in charge of the administration and processing of impact fees. We acknowledge that as a problem and have um, identified right now some limited redundancy with our special project coordinator and then also with the zoning tech who uh, is in the planning and development services division. Uh, and technology, this is primarily our staff uh, assigned to addressing the issues that we have to deal with with our Amanda software and our Connect Live uh, interface for online permitting. This is all handled under our administration organization, so that hence the 10 employees. We've got oversight of the entire division, or excuse me, entire department. So what we're doing was we're coordinating the budgetary needs of all of environmental management, building and code administration, as well as planning and development services. Our, our function also collects impact fees, not just transportation impact fees, which is a county-wide collection. So we're collecting from both cities and counties for our thoroughfare roads. We also collect the school board's impact fee, which is a pass-through where we're able to keep an administrative fee for the processing of that and then handing over there to the monies. Then we also have the parks and fire services. Those are localized to only the unincorporated area. So if you're developing in the cities, you are not paying towards our parks fee or our fire service fee. This is something that we're looking at as part of our update that will be coming to you shortly. The Amanda software. I want to point out that Amanda has been around and up and operating for about 15 years. It's been since we started there, 14 years since go live on some of these things. Um, it is in need of maintenance. And uh, Amanda, it, any kind of permitting software is not an easy thing to implement. It is not a plug and play. They're not able to just buy something off the shelf, come in and put it in place. It does require an extensive amount of staff time and it is very costly to drop and put in a brand new one. So what we're looking at is, are we putting our money in the best investment right now for a five, 10, 15 year time frame before we would need to make additional changes? because we are looking at a 15 year time frame now where we feel that software is working well, the online uh, portal is doing well, but we see that they're coming up with an upgrade. So again, making necessary the mechanical changes to ensure that software can carry us forward for the next five to 10 years is where we're drilling down. 
Uh, one of the functions that we have is oversight of the community redevelopment areas. We have 17 of these throughout uh, flat Volusia County. Uh, several, there's two in Mormon Beach, there's five in Daytona Beach. So as you can see, we've got a variety of different things there. The main concern that we have is from a reporting perspective. Uh, there's a state requirement that we have to be able to have all of the information associated with the community redevelopment areas, how much they took in, what they've expended, is it consistent with their plans, out there and available online and available to the public for their review. All of this is tied to what is required. Um, I'm just gonna kind of give you our personal way of looking at when we're developing our budget. What are the things that are mandated by federal, state, local ordinance or the charter that we have to do? Are we doing it efficiently? Is there technology that can reduce staffing, those types of things? So that's our first step in, in making sure that we're doing things the best way we can for the county residents. So what you're going to see is that we have our mandate to follow through on the impact fees. You'll have our uh, requirements from Chapter 163 for regards to the community redevelopment areas. This gives you an idea of the fiscal year 21-22 budget. It shows you that, again, what you're seeing is that we are quite heavily personnel. The operating expenses are tied primarily to a lot of our uh, Amanda support and those types of things. This gives you an idea of our operating expenditures from both the general fund and municipal service district. Uh, you're going to see the temporary personnel. Uh, we have records that go back to the point in time where you have microfish or microfilm. And those are not easily accessible via our electronic on, uh, database, on base. So we are going back and making sure that we're getting these in a searchable way so that these records are easily found because we do get on a daily basis a record number of public records requests for people who are searching out old permits, old special exceptions, those types of things, and we have to be able to get those to them. Uh, you're going to see that software licenses, those are again according to our software, and for the most part, we're pretty much following suit with everything we've done in the past in regards to all the other expenditures. Uh, the one revenue fund that we do have in our administration function is the administration fee that we can charge for uh, the processing of impact fees. In the past, it was 3% uh, state law that changed several years ago said it has to be based on actual cost. We did the analysis and it's a little bit over 1% that we can charge to equate to the actual cost. Um, so. We have currently in our adopted budget a projected revenue of roughly $389,000. We know we're going to be very close to that, if not over. And I just want to say, as of May, we've already surpassed what we collected last year, which was $334,000. Um, one thing is that you're going to see is that we know that the impact fee system has to be improved. We have to have better redundancy with our staffing. We have to make sure that we've got accuracy and ability to respond to these needs. So one of the things that we're going to be seeking is the addition of a new staff member. That would not have an impact on either the general fund or the MSD because that would be paid out of the administration fee collected for the impact fee system. And that cost would go and be factored into our actual cost. So it will have basically a neutral effect on our budget. It will just be utilizing that revenue source to pay for it. As I referenced the Amanda software, uh, we are going to have to deal with the fact that the language that this software was originally written on is out of date and we have to bring it up to speed. It's no small lift, and so we have put, worked with our friends at IT and with the provider of Amanda to come up with an estimate of hours and those types of things. We've checked through it. It is going to be close to $400,000 from that operation perspective. 
just to give you a reference, I was hearing about a, uh, and I, I can't remember the exact location, there was a, two, a new software for permitting that was at $2.2 million just for the implementation of it. So what we're seeing is the uh, investment into Amanda at this time gives us additional time to utilize that software to its maximum extent possible before we have to go through and make an investment into a new upgrade. That will also give us the time to look at how we can save for that so that when it comes, it's not going to be a dramatic hit. And then I just talked about the issues that we're facing from the uh, lack of historic files and the need to be able to get them from this untrackable, unsearchable method into something that can be done in a matter of minutes rather than a minute of hours or days at times. So that's basically a personnel operation and that's why we're asking for contract em employees that we teach how to go through this and effectively make those changes. That's my portion of the presentation. Carrie's going to come up and take you through the building and code administration. Carrie Losing, our chief building official. Um, I feel like I've spent more time with y'all here today than I have in my first five and a half years in the county, but uh, it's all good. <laughs> so anyway, you see our, our organizational chart. Um, we have nine folks in code compliance and two in contractor licensing. Uh, the rest of us are involved with uh, permitting, plan review, uh, inspecting, and that, that's kind of where our heavy load is. Uh, we're 37 strong and currently only have one position unfilled, and that's actually uh, an apprentice plans examiner position. Uh, we've had the position for, well, at least a year or so now. Um, I'll talk more about how we're going into staff development, and this position kind of goes hand in hand with that overall plan moving forward. Uh, we do intend to fill that apprentice plans examiner position by the end of this year. We have four primary functions, contractor licensing. We keep a database here at the county, a uh, contractor registration database. It's not required for our contractors to register with us. It's a voluntary, uh, voluntary thing if they want to do it. But what it allows is we share that database with all the municipalities in the county. Contractor comes to apply for a permit and his information is there. And it's available to all the other cities. Uh, they can see that the, his license is current, his all insurance is current, and that contractor is up to date with everything. So they can apply for their permit through that process. Uh, if they don't do that, they have to come in every time they apply for a permit, bring in their license, bring in their proof of insurance, go through the whole process every single time. So. Uh, this is really a good service to our contractors and, and to our, our other local municipalities. Building Code Administration is our plan review and inspection process. Uh, all of our plan reviews and inspections are, uh, are carried out by licensed professionals. Uh, we're all licensed by the state of Florida through DVPR, uh, just the same way as contractors are licensed. We have code compliance. Um, Always the fun part of the job some, sometimes, but uh, very important uh, that we keep uh, uh, our properties up, you know, looking good and, and keeping our neighbors happy. Um, we do, uh, as you all know, we, we react only to complaints. We don't go out looking for issues. Uh, the only exception to that might be is if we do see a life safety situation, we are going to address it. And uh, we do take that very seriously. In our permitting processing, we talked about that in great, uh, great length a few weeks ago. Um, our permit center uh, just across the hall here uh, is our, our customer service center. Uh, uh, allows our customers, contractors to come in and uh, uh, submit whatever paperwork, permit applications, documents they need to give us. They do all the processing of, of the permitting. Uh, the, they send all the permit applications to the various reviewing divisions that need to see them. Um, it's a very busy place. If you ever get bored and want to see some excitement, just walk over there for a little bit. So our requirements, uh, first of all, Florida Building Code. And again, we spoke about this a few weeks ago. It's, uh, it's basically a state statute. The Florida Building Code is uh, adopted by and signed into law by the governor. It is a, the building code is a uniform building code required all across the state of Florida. Uh, we have to enforce it just like everyone else does, um, except for that one place we talked about last time. And uh, that may go away here in about a year anyway. But. Code compliance complaints are no longer allowed to be uh, 
uh, anonymous as of July 1st. Uh, uh, complainants have to give us at least a name and address. If they do not give us a name and address, we cannot act upon the complaint. Uh, we're still waiting to see how much of an effect that's going to have on our uh, overall activity. Um, you know, it's only been since July, so we have seen a little bit of uh, hesitancy on some folks' part to, to give us a, a complaint if they have to give us their name um, for obvious reasons. Um, so uh, we'll see how much that affects our, our workload here in the future. So talk about Florida Building Code and the state requirements. Um, all fees collected from building permits and building permit applications can only be used <clears throat> to enforce the Florida Building Code. We cannot take the permit fees that we receive and use them for our code compliance efforts. We can't use them for zoning, for, for planning, for anything like that. They can only be used uh, for our costs associated with enforcing the Florida Building Code. And that's the permit processing, the plan review, uh, the inspections, uh, and the administration of, of those things. We, those, those, those items have to be kept separate. And that is a requirement of Florida Statute 553. Uh, again, it's one of those requirements that we have to abide by. We talk to uh, complainants all the time, uh, try to explain to them that the code compliance process takes time. In the state of Florida, property owners have very, very strong rights, which is not a bad thing. Uh, we have to comply with Florida Statute 162. We have to allow uh, respondents time to, reasonable time to correct the violation. And then as you go through the process, we have to give them 30 days notice to bring them to code board, 30 days notice to start a fine if we get to that point. So the process takes, takes time. I know you all from time to time uh, hear from, from, uh, from your constituents that, you know, I, I put in this complaint three months ago, four months ago, and nothing's happening. It takes time, and we're, we're mandated by, by statute how we have to move forward with these cases. So we do move forward as, as best we can, and uh, depending sometimes on the, on the gravity of the situation, we will we'll try to move them quicker when we can. But it, overall, it just takes time. Building code official licensing. Um, again, we talked to, about this a little bit before. Uh, all of our inspectors, plans examiners are licensed by the state of Florida. Uh, licensing requirements have been in effect for 28, 29 years now. And uh, when they first went into effect, basically if you were doing inspections for a municipality and you said, I've been doing electrical, mechanical, plumbing, whatever, you filled out a form and the state gave you that license and you could continue doing that work. After that, then you had to qualify. You have to meet certain response, uh, certain requirements uh, as, in, uh, as far as experience uh, and various things. So a lot of those folks that got those licenses basically grandfathered to them going on 30 years ago, they've, they've retired and, and they've all left the industry. So it's harder and harder to get multi-certified, multi-licensed uh, plans examiners and inspectors. We're finding that actually we don't hardly do that anymore. Uh, we, if we get somebody comes in, they apply for, uh, they qualify for one license, we'll get them that license, uh, and then we look at other means to get them cross-trained for additional licenses. So, as Clay said, our, our operation is, is uh, people heavy, and uh, you can see here with, with our uh, adopted budget for co building code administration, um, the people is where we spend most of our money. And that's, that's not unusual. So just another look at it uh, and on a pie chart, you can kind of see that, that difference. Our top expenditures, we deal with three funds. We deal with the general fund, the building fund, and municipal service di district. The building fund, is th that is the part of our fund that is permit, uh, uh, permit related. Those are the fees, uh, the expenditures through the building code fund that can only be used for that purpose. So again, you can kind of see what our, our, our most expensive things are. Contracted services, we still use an outside contractor to perform overflow inspections when we need to. Right now, we're fully staffed with inspectors, um, but our workload has gone up and up, and we're having to continue to use the outside contractor uh, to make sure we, we take care of our customers. If you have an inspection request by 3 p.m., it will be done by the end of the next day, and we maintain that every day. So in order to continue to do that, if we can't do it with the folks that we have, then we have to send some outside to the contractor to take care of for us. 
Our revenues, uh, primarily on our general fund, you can see it's contractor licensing is our, our big uh, revenue provider there. That is the registration that we talked about through, uh, through the Connect Live system and uh, some of the specialty licenses that we issue here locally through Volusia County. And you can see our building permit revenue. We, we projected last year at budget time 2.2 million. We are way ahead of that right now. Again, activity is continuing to, to climb and uh, we, we anticipate that to, uh, well, it will definitely exceed 2.2 million this year. Um, so we should be in, we're in real good shape as far as all that goes. And then the other, the MSD, our revenues that we bring in are, are basically tied to primarily uh, special events, bike week, uh, those types of things, um, outdoor entertainment permits, uh, th those types of things. We do bring in some revenue through, through those. So our future challenges, as, as I've been saying, our workload has continued to climb. And again, a few weeks ago when we talked to you, we had some charts and graphs and, and showed you that uh, last calendar year, we issued more permits than we did in 2005, which was the peak before the, the recession. And we're doing that with a lot less people, but uh, fortunately we have some very quality, dedicated staff to take care of that for us. What we have done uh, over the last six or seven months is uh, we've brought in some temporary staff on our perm in our permit center to help us keep caught up and keep, keep pace with the additional load. There was also a change that uh, we are required now by statute to issue a single family residence permit within 30 days uh, of the time we receive application. We've had to bring in the temp staff to help us or we're not gonna meet that deadline. We have two temporary folks up front in the permit center and what they're primarily doing, one scans all day long. We scan permits, we scan building plans, we, we scan everything that goes in the system, we don't keep paper. If we didn't have that temp doing that, we'd have a permit tech back there doing that work, they would rotate through that, through that process and, and there would always be a permit tech doing that scanning. By having a temp doing that scanning, we're leaving that permit tech out front where they can take care of customers, uh, service our customers, keep the permit process going and, and get our permits processed and out the door when they need to be. The other temp that's up front is uh, primarily answering telephones and returning emails uh, and then doing uh, other uh, functions as we as we can use that person again without those two people we are we are we would be behind we were behind before we had those two temps and we brought them in and we we got caught up we got to where we need to be and we're providing the level of customer service that we need to we also have a, another temp um, helping us in the administration side and basically the same thing just picking up a lot of the overload that we're seeing right now so we are seeking additional funds in our temporary uh, employment lines uh, we need to continue with the with these temporary employees we had discussed possibly uh, requesting a couple of new full-time employees with the uncertainty of the building industry right now and, and uh, activity levels you know right now we're we're going pretty strong but um, you know hopefully we don't see another great recession but interest rates are climbing prices are climbing at some point the market's going to equalize and we're probably going to see a little drop off so uh, we really don't want to add new permanent staff that uh, we may not have work for in six months or a year down the road. So we feel like sticking with temp staff at this time is the way to go. Other challenges we have, uh, staff retention. Um, last few years it's leveled off a little bit, but we have had quite a bit of turnover. Um, I'm very pleased with the staff we have right now, and, and I've told them all, um, in, in all the activities, code compliance, inspection, plan review, and, and permit processing. We got uh, just a really great group right now. And I really, really hope that some of that turnover is gonna stabilize. I, I, we've got a good team together, and uh, uh, my hope is that we can keep them there and, that, and not have as much turnover as we've had in the past. And uh, I, I think we're gonna be able to do that. We're getting ready to take over, as, as y'all know, the new Smyrna uh, the uh, interlocal service boundary agreement. I believe it's July 5th is when we will take over those areas and we will resume building permitting and code compliance for that area. It's gonna add additional work. We were able to get some data from New Smyrna and we don't think it's gonna have a big impact on building, maybe like one or 2% of our current work. We're gonna see about a one or 2% increase in workload. Uh, it's the code compliance side that we just don't know. 
until we actually take it over and see what kind of complaints we get and what kind of cases we have to deal with, we just aren't really going to know how it's going to affect our workload. Now, when you take into fact that we can no longer accept those anonymous complaints, maybe these two things will level each other out. But uh, we, we're really not going to know until we get six months or a year down the road from that July 5th date to how things pan out. Uh, you have five code compliance officers that are in the field every day. The county is split up into five zones. You all know it's a big county. And those five people, they do the very best they can. They have a big area to cover, and uh, they, they do a great job. I talked a little bit about staff development. So we're looking at staff development across the board. Our code compliance officers all have uh, Florida Association of Code Enforcement certifications. They're not required to have those, and there's four levels of uh, face is what it's called. Um, but we encourage them to go through the process to get those certifications. It's not so much having that certification, but it is going through the process to get that certification. There are classes involved. There are technical exams they have to take. Uh, there are seminars they have to go to. They have to maintain CEUs to, to maintain their certifications. What we found is just by having those staff go through that process, they basically become better knowledgeable, more knowledgeable, and do a better job for the county overall. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of advantages for them to go through that process. We're, we're really starting to push some of our folks that have kind of been not, not going forward with that. We're, we're pushing them to go ahead and, and, uh, and, and ramp it up a little bit, and go for more of those certifications. Same with our permit techs. There's an International Code Council uh, certified permit technician. Uh, it's a certification, it's not a license. Uh, we have two of our permit techs currently that have gone through that process. Uh, they both came to me afterwards, and because we, again, we sent them to some classes and stuff like that, uh, that both of them came to me afterwards and told me just how much they learned and how much they realized they didn't know about what they did. So we're going to do that as well with the rest of our permit techs. We want all of them to be uh, certified through International Code Council. And then with our building inspectors and plans examiners, as I, as I said, we we have a hard time finding multi-licensed, multi-certified uh, uh, staff to fill those positions when they become open. There are cross-training programs that are out there. We have two inspectors right now in cross-training. Uh, one is a plumbing inspector. She's also a plumbing plans examiner. She's in a building, or building plans examiner cross-training program. It takes about a year. Another one of our inspectors is a building inspector. He's in the electrical inspector cross-training program. We're going to continue to per pursue this with our inspectors and plans examiners. To, to get them certified in uh, additional trades uh, so that they can do different types of inspections and, 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 and plan review for us. We're a smaller uh, municipality. Uh, we, we have eight full-time inspectors. You, know, you go to places like Orange County, Orlando, they may have 20 or 30 just electrical inspectors. We don't have that luxury. We need our people to be multi-disciplined, multi-licensed to where they can do various types of inspections and plan reviews. So staff development, we've, we've moved a little bit of some line items around to, to increase our budget in those areas with training, registration, and travel to make sure we can keep our staff uh, uh, licensed and continuing that staff development. And then finally, we talked about uh, you know, future development. We just don't know what's going to happen here. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the people that are supposed to know keep saying, oh, the bubble's going to burst and all this and that. But I guess we'll just wait and see. Um, construction, that's what it does. It ebbs and flows. And uh, uh, we, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But uh, right now, it's, it's rocking. We're staying as busy as we've been in a long time. So uh, I'm sure we're going to see some type of a downturn uh, at some point. We'll just have to see what that ends up being. And that's all I got. If you have any questions? You said you, you, you were having to rely more on temporary and contracted. How are you happy with the quality of people that you're finding? It's hard to find good people to hire, period. The, the temps we brought in, we've actually, over the last year, uh, two of the temps we brought in, we filled with positions that we had open. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes. Good. Uh, we're, we're very pleased. We have another. Good. Be good now. Yeah, we have we've had a couple of attempts. One that just did move up to a permit tech that, that came open. So uh, that's worked out real well for us uh, when we were able to move those people into permanent positions after they've been here a while. So. Good. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. All right.
tag team. Eve, we have Ginger. Afternoon. Okay, well, I'm Ginger Adair. I'm the Environmental Management Director. You see me all the time, so. Um, I'm gonna go through environmental management and, and all of the things we do. Uh, this is our organizational chart. Uh, there are actually 45 full-time people on this chart. Uh, we operate out of five different locations, right? So it's, uh, it's a little, uh, it's, it's complicated organization that we have. The bulk of our staff are here in the TCK and DeLand. Of course, the Marine Science Center is in Ponce Inlet and the Lyonia Environmental Center is in Deltona next to the Regional Library. Uh, our sea turtle program operates out of an office at 440 South Beach Street. It was actually the original beach safety headquarters. You probably remember it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our sea turtle program. And then our water quality staff uh, our, and our boats live at the land management field office um, west of here. So we're, we're spread out a little bit. Um, in addition to the 45 full-time FTEs you see on this slide, we rely on somewhere between 20 and 30 seasonal and part-time and full-time leased employees. Um, and those folks provide on average 22,000 hours of work every year um, for environmental management. The bulk of them are at the Marine Science Center and you'll see that when we get to the budget. Um, and then we also depend on hundreds of volunteers to accomplish our core mission. Um, so in calendar year 2021, volunteers donated nearly 14,000 hours of labor for environmental management projects um, worth approximately $375,000. So that's, of course, not um, shown in our budget anywhere, but that is a, a lot of hours spent doing, um, doing our good work in environmental. So our summary of operations. Um, we, of course, implement and enforce the Volusia County Minimum Environmental Standards and the Land Development Code uh, through review of development applications and issuance of permits for uh, tree removal, wetland alteration, Class Two, which is our uh, Indian River Lagoon overlay, and then enforcement of the Gopher Tortoise Protection Ordinance. Um, that is handled by our environmental permitting activity. And like Carrie mentioned, uh, our workload in that activity has increased 278% uh, over the last 10 years. Um, we have actually um, been using technology to increase efficiency. So for example, our environmental permitting field staff now have tablets that they take out into the field um, and they're linked to the plans that get uploaded into the, uh, our permitting software. And so we can um, read the tree surveys, make notations, locate gopher tortoise surveys, do all of the permitting operations in the field. So that's real time. So if we pass an inspection, that's real time pass. We don't, used to be, we would have to come back in the office, do all that stuff manually. So we've recognized some efficiencies there. Um, but we still struggle with the amount of work and the number of staff that we have in that activity. Uh, the second bullet there, we collect samples of surface water, saline waters, and storm water. I know we've talked a lot about water quality in our water quality team. Um, historically, uh, so a little bit about maybe some efficiencies. Historically, we sampled the sites and did all of the chemical analysis in a lab that we actually operated in Volusia County. Um, but other agencies like the Water Management District and the DEP, they're also out there doing sampling. So um, a number of years ago, we found efficiencies by partnering with the Water Management District where we have an agreement with them where we do the sampling and they do the analysis at their lab. So we no longer have to maintain a lab, which was an expensive proposition. Um, so they take all of the samples that we collect and do the lab analysis, but in exchange for that, we take the samples that they were taking, right? So no money changes hands, but there's a lot of efficiency gained there. So we're both kind of doing the things that we're best at. Um, you know, we typically sample about 90 sites, either quarterly or monthly, so that's a significant amount of sampling and, and then lab analysis. Uh, the third bullet, we engage the public and we develop outreach and volunteer programs that enhance conservation efforts and promote stewardship of natural resources. Um, that work, and then the fourth bullet, the managing our sustainability action plan and our regional resiliency action plan are both handled in our sustainability and resilience activity. 
Um, in the last several years, that activity has acquired or partnered on over one and a half million dollars in grant funding for projects related to resilience, low impact development, and public education. We just heard that we received uh, from the DEP a $288,000 grant to upgrade our sea level rise vulnerability analysis, and you'll be seeing an agenda item about that. So that's hot off the presses. Um, and we're currently waiting on a decision for an additional $75,000 grant for the low impact development project, which would include development of a design manual and um, ordinance language for our consideration. Um, and that activity also manages our very popular Explore Volusia program and our volunteer Volusia program. So that they've got a lot going on there. Uh, we also inspect uh, domestic waste, solid waste, biosolid operations, and small quantity generators of hazardous waste. That and our water quality program operate out of our pollution control activity. Um, we actually have about 3,700 businesses that we inspect that generate small quantities of hazardous waste. These are businesses that are not inspected by the DEP. So the DEP has a program for inspecting um, folks that generate hazardous waste, but, but it's based on an amount every, you know, that they generate each year. Those small quantity generators were never inspected to make sure that they're disposing of their waste properly. So we operate that program. We actually collect a fee for those activities that offsets the entire cost of the staff, and that's um, collected on the business tax receipt. Uh, we protect the endangered species habitat on our beaches, including areas for nesting sea turtles and nesting migratory and wintering birds. And we manage the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service incidental take permit and the associated habitat conservation plan for sea turtles and other listed species. That is through our sea turtle HCP program, HCP standing for Habitat Conservation Plan, and that's out of that Daytona office. So they manage the volunteer groups that do the morning nest surveys on the beach. They review coastal construction projects for consistency with our beach and dune requirements. Um, they do the light management, so looking at um, the sea turtle lighting ordinance, making sure um, businesses and homeowners are compliant. And we conduct routine uh, shorebird monitoring. Just sort of as an aside, but um, interesting, we um, average 648 sea turtle nests on our beaches on the 35 miles of Volusia County managed beaches. Um, and then um, this year we have introduced some new technology to increase efficiency. So those monitoring groups typically would go out, they would find a nest, mark the nest, they'd fill out a piece of paper with all of the information. They would provide that to our staff, our staff would then take that information, type it into the database by hand, go back out to that nest and take a GPS location. It was very labor intensive. Um, this year we have introduced technology, They're, they'll be using tablets to input all of that data in the field. So we'll have real time data um, every morning of where all the nests are, um, all of the important information about the nest and the GPS location. So that should really be a time saver for our county staff. And then, of course, we operate these two very popular environmental centers, right? The Marine Science Center and the Lyonia Center, Environmental Center. Um, the LEC is in Deltona. Of course, there's an exhibit gallery that teaches about our scrub ecosystem. We offer programs there for children and for adults, um, including school field trips, summer camp, um, school break camps, like spring break and winter break. Um, and then we offer weekly hikes and, and other programs in the Lyonia Preserve that's adjacent. Um, during the pandemic, of course, we had to close the facility, so we switched over to um, online educational opportunities so we could still reach out. Thankfully, now we're back open and everybody's happy to see all the smiling faces back at the LEC. Um, the Marine Science Center, of course, is both a public education facility and our rehabilitation facility for sea turtles and shorebirds. Um, Pre-COVID, annual attendance at the Science Center exceeded 100,000 people a year. Of course, uh, we were closed for al almost two years, over a year, year and a half probably, we were closed to the public uh, due to COVID. But we reopened this spring and now we're approaching pre-pandemic attendance on an average basis. So uh, everybody's very happy to be back at work. Okay, requirements. 
So what is required by state, federal, et cetera, codes? So implementation of the minimum standards for environmental protection, of course, are required by our charter and our comprehensive plan and the land development code. The management of the incidental take permit for beach driving is required. Um, that's our federal permit. So that has impacts for the Sea Turtle Habitat Conservation Plan Program and the Science Center. Then we also implement the Manatee Protection Plan, which is required by the state and our adopted Regional Resiliency Action Plan. Oh, and I just, I did want to mention, sorry, I was just looking at my notes. I wanted to mention, so the implementation of the incidental take permit, the Habitat Conservation Plan, there are very specific requirements in the Habitat Conservation Plan for this positions that we are required to have at the county. So for instance, we're required to have a protected species specialist. We're required to have the, um, the folks that are at that HCP program. And every year we have to actually provide an annual report to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that says that we still have those positions. We provide our budget and all of those things. So we don't have a lot of um, leeway in the positions that are in that program. Okay, budget. So this slide shows the entire budget for environmental management for the current year. Um, you can see personal services, about $3.4 million, operating around $2.5 million. Um, our total is $6.8 million. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just wanted to point out a couple things that, that maybe look a little interesting. Um, the grants and aids line item is uh, money that we have in our tree fund. So we'll talk about the tree fund. but. Um, that is available for grants to do tree planting projects. So that $71,000 is actually money that's budgeted every year that's available. Um, and then part of that is from our Manatee Protection Fund also that's available as grants to the Sheriff's Office and to the cities. And then that reimbursement, that $70,000 that's shown as a reimbursement, that's actually from our um, Public Works Department, and that is to support our water quality monitoring program. Ginger, before you move on from there, and back to the grant funds, you said it's available to uh, municipalities, sheriff's department. Is it available to any nonprofits? The Manatee Plan funds, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that, are, are only available to the sheriff's office and to the cities, and it's based on a specific formula that divvies up those funds. Tree funds are available to other organizations. There are some requirements in the code about how those funds can be spent. It has to be on a public land or land that's accessible to the public. So like a university campus or something like that where it's freely accessible, maybe a elementary school or something like that. But it's not just limited to municipalities. Okay, so a little bit of an interesting thing about environmental management's budget is we have several restricted funds, trust accounts. So we have the tree replacement trust account. That um, actually has $650,000 in it. Those funds are, when folks remove trees on development projects, they have the opportunity to replace those trees in one of three ways. They can plant additional trees on their site. They can... Uh, save trees on site that are not protected, so they can save small trees that aren't protected, or they can pay into our tree replacement fund. And oftentimes folks find it more expedient, may, maybe even cost effective to pay into the tree fund. So that's where that money comes from. The funds can only be used for planting of trees and you know a few ancillary expenses. Uh, so um, we use the money to, to do tree planting projects and we offer some of that as grants that we just talked about. So right now we have a project working with the stormwater folks to do plantings on the stormwater ponds, some of the public stormwater ponds. We're using tree fund money for that. Uh, the Manatee Conservation Fund, there's a little over $560,000 in that fund. That is money that is paid as mitigation for construction of new boat slips in the county. That's specifically laid out in our Manatee plan, uh, the cost of that. So it's $1,000 for every new commercial boat slip and $250 for every residential dock that's constructed. 
those uh, funds can only be used for the things here, on water law enforcement, education, and grants to the city. So like I said, there's a formula about how, um, how that money can be distributed. And the way that this fund was set up was that the first $500,000 that was collected was able to be spent based on the formula. After the first 500,000, we can only spend the interest on the trust account. So the first 500,000 has been spent and the, and the sheriff's office got annual grants that were nice, right? They funded on the water law enforcement. After that first 500,000 was spent, now all the money is in this trust account and we can only spend interest. So it's just small amounts of money every year. Uh, the money is distributed. The formula is 75% of the money available goes to the sheriff's office. Then 25% is split with the county and the cities based on our percentage of shoreline. So there's a sort of a complicated formula. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then our third restricted fund is the wetland mitigation fund. And again, that's uh, funds that's used as mitigation for impacts to wetland in the county. Uh, wetlands or buffers actually and then those funds can only be used for wetland restoration projects so here's our pie chart did we get all that yep so about 50 percent is personnel 37 percent operating that 8.5 percent is reserves that's for the the trust funds and um, just a note in the current year the tree fund is actually not uh, shown as reserve, it's budgeted as an operating expense. <clears throat> That's about to be changed. We're going to, in the next budget year, the tree fund will operate more like a true restricted fund. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. And then we have a little bit of capital improvement. That's at the Marine Science Center. We can um, talk about that specifically. And then the grants and aids are what I talked about, tree funds and, and um, manatee funds. So environmental management operates, um, with the exception of those restricted funds, out of two main funds. We have general fund operations and we have municipal service district, which is our environmental permitting activity. So in the general fund, um, our top five expenses are contracted services. Um, this is primarily the contact, contracts that are in place for the sea turtle program. So $156,000 of that is for Ecological Associates. That's our contractor that handles our habitat conservation plan and they do the sea turtle monitoring south of Ponce Inlet. And then we have um, $27,000 for the Volusia Turtle Patrol. They do the monitoring north of the inlet. And then $15,000 is for CFB Outdoors. And they do uh, the rut raking program that removes the tire ruts in front of nests that are due to hatch. Um, that contracted services also includes the $60,000 contract that we have with the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine for the vet that treats the patients at the Marine Science Center. It's actually budgeted as 60,000 in the current year budget. The contract went up to $84,000 this year. So it's not reflected here, but it will be in the next budget year. The temporary personnel line, you can see $312,000. That's a big part of our operating budget. Um, that is uh, primarily used at the Marine Science Center. That's those hours that we talked about at the very beginning. The $258,000 of that is at the Marine Science Center. Uh, the recreation and sports supplies, 130000 that's an, uh, probably a little unusual for you guys to see. That's actually the, um, where we purchase the merchandise for the gift shop at the Marine Science Center. Um, and that is offset by the sales uh, revenue, which is approximately $300,000. So we, we more than double the money that we spend on uh, merchandise. And then, of course, utilities, that's... Uh, primarily the Marine Science Center. Then in the Municipal Service District, again, that's our environmental permitting activity. Uh, contracted services is that big number, that 553. And the reason for that is because that is the balance in the tree fund. So instead of showing up as a fund balance, it shows up in the operating budget. 
but like I said, in the coming year, that's going to be segregated into a restricted fund, and it, so it'll look more like a, a fund. Um, the farm, garden, and nursery money there, that's where we budget the money that we would spend on trees out of the tree fund. So that's um, actually not um, ad valorem money right there, that's, or, or MSD money, it's really tree fund money. And then the temporary personnel, that, that's to help us in our environmental permitting activity, make sure that we can get those permits in and out in the mandated time frames. Uh, and then you can see the Wetland Mitigation Fund and the Manatee Conservation Fund, those are um, pretty small numbers, and, and that's because in the Manatee Fund, it's because we can only spend interest every year. Okay. So moving on to capital expenses. Uh, you can see in the current year budget, we have um, a replacement boat, motor, and trailer for our water quality program. Um, the existing boat is a 1989 Boston Whaler, so we've really got our money's worth out of that boat, but it is definitely time to upgrade. Um, so we are in the process of purchasing that replacement. Boston Whaler has a real opportunity here. We have been hitting them up. I know. But uh, so far, no go. So. Okay. Missing a great I know, advertisement. Such a great story, it right? It would like, be a look at wonderful story. I know. Uh, yeah, so far they haven't really taken the bait. But uh, We are also uh, trying to construct a storage carport uh, for our water quality boat. It's currently housed at the land management field office. Um, we're share they are being very generous, and they're giving us one of the bays in their pole barn. But um, really, it's for their equipment. So we're, we're trying to construct a, a cover for our, our boats. Uh, turns out that that $25,000 isn't nearly enough. Let's, we're going to roll that forward and ask for a little more in the next budget. Um, that, that was not enough, it turns out. So we're not doing that this year, but we're going to roll it. Um, and then the other things are, are, are you know, uh, GPS and camera equipment in the sea turtle program. Then the, the Marine Science Center, so I don't know how many of you have ever been under the building at the Marine Science Center, but there's hundreds of pumps and heaters and chillers and right all this equipment. So um, that 36,000 is sort of the annual replacement of the equipment. And, and you all know Chad McPhee at the Science Center. He's got this spreadsheet that is so detailed about every piece of equipment and what its expected lifespan is and when it needs to be replaced. So, so that's what that is. And then the um, construction project's $125,000. Um, the construction's been largely shifted to the ARPA funding, and I have a slide about that. Um, but there was, in this year, um, funds for renovations, some renovations at the Bird Hospital, and then replacement of the artificial reef exhibit. Um, that actually is a really large project. The 125 is just a portion of that. But it's going to be shifted into Port Authority funding um, with Jessica's um, cooperation on that. And it'll be themed based on the Lady Philomena that we sunk as an artificial reef. And so the new artificial reef exhibit is going to look like the Lady P. And it's, it's super cool, the, the conceptual drawings that we've seen. Um, and then there's just a little bit of capital in the Municipal Service District. We did get a new staff person th in this year's budget that was approved as a decision unit. And they, of course, came, you know, needed to come with a vehicle and a computer. Okay, ARPA. Um, like I said, some of the, or, uh, the bulk of the Marine Science Center capital was shifted to ARPA. Thank you very much for choosing to fund that. So at the Science Center, um, we have projects to, to create a commissary to get that food prep away from the um, turtle surgery area, a new raptor exhibit, um, replacement of, of the roof at our quarantine area, and then the creation of a new large animal quarantine, um, and $175,000 for replacing a, just aging exhibits, things that need to be replaced since we've opened. The big item, of course, is the new education building. That's $1.6 million. And we actually also, hopefully, fingers crossed, have a million dollar legislative appropriation that's pending the governor's approval of the budget. Um, so that would bring that new education building project up to $2.6 million, which would be fabulous. And um, this morning, this morning, 
uh, yeah, we talked about the, we let the contract for the design of that building. So, so that's moving forward. And then at the LEC, there's $95,000 in ARPA funding to replace aging exhibits there. We do have several sources of revenue. At the Lyonia Environmental Center, we have a little bit of revenue. The, those fees are pretty small. It's basically for programs and camps. Admission is always free at the LEC, so we don't have a, uh, admission revenue. We do make sure that we charge for camp enough to cover the cost of providing the camp every year, um, and uh, it's a very popular summer camp. And then the Marine Science Center, uh, we have about $637,000 in revenue budgeted for the current year um, for fees, and then $10,000 is what we budgeted for donations. Um, we, um, thankfully, this year, uh, we have actually accepted $135,000 in donations, so we're well above the $10,000 that we budgeted. We always try to budget that low because you never know what kind of donations you're going to get. Um, but we've been very uh, blessed this year with support from the community. And then, like I said earlier, we also receive revenue for that small quantity generator program. It's not shown on this slide because it, it's technically not applied directly to environmental management. It's considered a non-departmental revenue, um, but it's about $182,000 a year, and it supports the salaries of the staff that do that program. And in our MSD, our revenues are primarily from the permits that we issue. So um, you can see the, the different permits there and the total uh, budgeted revenue of $234,000. Uh, so the tree replacement fee, and um, that goes into the tree replacement fund. So it doesn't get um, credited to the MSD in any way. Um, so far this year, so we budgeted $234,000 in revenue. So far this year, we've collected $358,000. But a big chunk of that, one sixty-eight, dollars is uh, tree replacement. So that's going into the tree fund. Ginger. Yes. Um, what was the wetland application, $31,000? That's actually the application fee for wetland permits. From applicants that have wetland alterations on their property. Uh, just in case you're wondering, the permit fee for wetland alteration permit, uh, depending on whether it's concurrent with a development order or whether it's a standalone wetland, is uh, either $296 or $370 for that permit. Thank you. So revenue in our special funds, this is uh, estimates for the Manatee Fund and the Wetland Fund and the Dune Restoration Fund. And uh, our grant funds. So I said earlier we have a number of grants. This is the list of the grants that we have so far this year. You can see the bullet that says DEP grants, that's left blank because at the time we did this, we had uh, two grants pending, but we didn't know if we were going to get either of them, so I left that blank. We have now been notified about the $288,000 that we will receive from the DEP based on your approval when we bring it to you. Um, so that actually doubles this $280,000 number for this year. Okay, uh, future challenges. So um, implementation of sustainability and resilience measures to adapt to future conditions. And um, you know, we've talked a lot about this over the last several weeks. Uh, we are requesting funds in the next budget year to partner with the US Geological Survey to do a study for groundwater and saltwater intrusion. And um, we continue to seek grant funding for the vulnerability analysis. We, we talked about that in the low impact development standards. So to the extent that we can, we're looking for grant funding for implementation of these um, future issues. Um, again, the level of development volume versus staffing. We talked about the 278% increase in um, workload for the environmental permitting staff. 
in that time we have actually added two staff members but the workload continues to be higher than we can do I'm not my folks are like this past weekend I had two people here on Sunday all day just trying to catch up it's you know they just have a lot to do so we are requesting one new environmental specialist in the FY 22-23 budget and then you know one way to offset some of those costs our permitting revenue does not actually reflect the cost to provide those services um, the last time we did a deep dive into that uh, you know our revenue was only maybe 30 percent of the cost to provide the services that we provide so um, we're hoping or, or, you know our environmental permitting will be um, included in the fee study that's planned so that maybe if the revenue offsets you know some of that takes the burden off of the MSD a little bit and then of course you saw we have a really heavy reliance on leased employees and that works pretty well for us but leased employees have low wages compared to county employees um, and they have high turnover right because of course they don't have benefits so uh, and, you know you can get a job at Bucky's now for $17 an hour and I'm paying people at the Marine Science Center 12 or 10 or 11 dollars an hour right so um, we get a lot of turnover so we are requesting um, in the next year budget a, a wage increase for those leased employees to at least bring them up to be a little bit more competitive so what I'd like to do is pay people 12 or 13 dollars an hour instead of 10 or 11 so you'll see um, in my budget request a wage increase for those folks that's all I have thank you any uh, questions council thank, thank you. you very much Right. good afternoon <clears throat> let me make sure I know how to work this before I get too far all right very good <clears throat> I'm Carol McFarlane develop planning and development services director um, <clears throat> I'm gonna try not to drop anything <clears throat> excuse me um, the first thing that we're gonna look at is um, our our organizational chart this is really kind of a refresher course of um, what we talked about April 12th with the growth and resource management um, workshop so you've already talked about some of these um, I think the only one we didn't look at was the real estate activity that is a um, activity of one person the job there is to um, go through county surplus lands um, land donations land swaps um, and she also does some title work and helps out other departments that um, are buying and selling land and she works really closely with the legal department to draft up those deeds and leases um, so we have a really good um, activity there with someone who's got a lot of knowledge and, and shares that knowledge with the rest of the county when needed the land development activity as you recall is what I refer to as the horizontal development these are the permits for all of the site plans and subdivisions driveway use permits um, take a lot of the environmental permits the intake through land development and in land development we also have our FEMA CRS coordinator our community rating systems coordinator um, so she's kind of um, she's part-time FEMA CRS is about a 75 percent 25 split 75 percent of her time is working with um, the FEMA CRS program it's really coordinating a, a really huge project of all of the um, activities that we have throughout all of the county through the um, emergency operations center through environmental management public works etc um, there's a really huge list of activities that need to be done every year um, those are audited once every three years so um, that position kind of keeps a repository and tracking of all of those hundreds of projects that take place across the county every year um, and submits them in, uh, into the audit system for FEMA and that's how we uh, get our flood insurance rates for the the county as well so it's a really important um, position there in the land development department and when it's not audit season she does help with the land development functions the zoning activity um, again we talked about a lot on April 12th that is um, implementation of chapter 72 the zoning code 
um, anything that has to do with building permit reviews, also business tax receipts, and they do a lot of these non-conforming lot letters and zoning verifications. They actually work quite a lot with mortgage companies and title companies. Um, a lot of these mortgage companies and title companies um, automatically contact the zoning office um, when they're about to close on a, on a property to check the zoning on it. And it's kind of automated on the mortgage company side, um, but we handle those, you know, we, we actually have a person who touches each of those and makes sure that the banks are getting the really accurate zoning information for their closings. The planning activity um, is our long range comprehensive planning, um, as well as um, running our planning and development regulation commission and our historic preservation board. Mapping and addressing, it's a GI, our GIS group, Geographical Information Systems. They actually handle um, quite a number of countywide GIS shape files is what they're called. They do the 911 addressing, so there's a whole system that touches all of these other databases um, in the state. And um, also they handle all of our street maps. All of our street maps are, um, we have all of those shape files available publicly and um, they're available for download on our website and they also connect to a lot of different entities and organizations. So everything that in our planning department that the GIS group does on their street maps actually funnels through into Google Maps and iMaps and, and that's how we all do our, our routing on our phone, how UPS figures out where they're going when they do deliveries, et cetera. So that's the, um, the brief explanation to try to get into some of the details of our operations. This first bullet point here of managing um, land planning programs. This is all the responsibility of our um, planning activity. They have, um, they have five employees, I'm sorry, seven employees planning manager, three planners, and two administrative positions. And that's for um, all of our comprehensive planning, maintaining the documents, doing long range visioning, as well as code amendments, land development or zoning code amendments. Um, they also do a lot of public workshops. We haven't had very many because of coronavirus, other than the one on April 12th. We typically do like to go out into the community and do workshops you know, in neighborhoods, but we just haven't had that opportunity to do it um, for quite a while. Um, so it, it's a really important function for the long-term vision of the county. And, you know, I think we, we come to these meetings, Clay and I come to these meetings every time, and everybody's talking about the vision. Where are we going with this? What's smart growth? How do we keep our property rights while also protecting the environment? Um, so it's a really important job that we do um, at the planning activity. And again, there's seven positions um, over the last year and a half. Um, we've, we've had pretty high turnover. Four of those seven positions um, have had turnover. They really got a one-two punch, first with um, baby boomers retiring, and second with the, uh, the great resignation that happened um, last year with a lot of the younger employees just going on to better job opportunities. Um, and then again, in about two weeks, actually, the planning manager is retiring. Um, so now we'll be at five out of seven of those positions are, are brand new people. Um, we did have one employee, um, it was actually a promotion. She worked as an administrator and is now working as a planner. So we do try to hire internally, but for the most part, the planners in the um, planning activity have that certification from the American Institute of Certified Planners. So it's a very technical position um, that can't necessarily be filled by you know, someone who's just uh, has a really good college degree, they also have to have a lot of um, ability to either have that certification or to take the test to earn that certification. And because it's such a, a highly trained position, um, it takes about a year to train people to do those types of work. So, um, you know, it's really, we're going to be feeling the effects of that attrition over the next two calendar years. So, so it'll be tough, but um, we actually, we're pretty sure uh, we've got one more that um, is vacant that we need to make a decision on. 
Um, so we should be fully staffed in June. So we're all looking forward to that. Hopefully I didn't, I didn't jinx anything just now. Second bullet point is about zoning reviews of building permits, business tax receipts, um, and other such permits. Um, these are mostly done with our three zoning technicians. We also have a zoning manager and a zoning planner. Um, and it's not just the building permits that zoning technicians look at. They, not all building permits are looked at by zoning technicians and not all zoning reviews are building permits. So we, um, a lot of it is the numbers that we get from Cary, but there's kind of more to it than that. Um, so by tracking the trends for the zoning reviews, what we found is that um, we didn't have any, we, we didn't have comprehensive numbers for when the housing bubble happened in 2005, 2006, and 7, um, because Amanda came on board shortly after that. Um, but after we got Amanda and we've been able to um, track those numbers in the height of the housing bubble, we had five zoning technicians. So when the bubble burst, we were fortunate that we didn't have to let anyone go because we had two retirements that had been lined up. So we just didn't fill those positions as those two zoning technicians left. And then we haven't added anyone since then. So um, that's been quite a while, 11 years now um, that we've been operating with three zoning technicians. Um, when that when we had that first year, it was 2010, with only three zoning technicians, there were a little under 7,000 reviews that they did per year. Um, those numbers have steadily been going up. Again, it's not the spike that you see with building permits where the number just shoots up dramatically and has ebbs and flows. It's been steady progression of an average of 270 additional permits per year. So not enough in any one given year to say, oh, we really need to hire new people. But when you look at 11 years, that's 3,000 um, reviews that we are going up and we're not um, backfilling our positions from that. So we've really, um, zoning technicians really reached a, um, reached ahead probably a couple years ago. You know, maybe one and a half to two years ago is where we really started to see our performance numbers decline substantially to the point that uh, we weren't meeting our, our customer service goals. <clears throat> and also with only three zoning technicians, we're really vulner vulnerable to short-term staffing issues. So unexpected leave, vacations, family medical, um, those sort of things. Um, are, are just things that uh, they really spin out of control. Our zoning reviews spin out of control when we have just one person missing for that. And again, um, of those, it's five people in the zoning activity, three-year zoning technicians. We've had a, a turnover with the zoning technicians as well. Two of those three positions have turned over in the last 12 calendar months. Um, so again, we had a retirement, and then we also had a, a younger person who was looking for more opportunities. And actually, we. We gave him a promotion, he's still in the county, so we're, we're very happy about that. Um, but again, we're, we're at that rate where we have a lot of attrition that we have to catch up with. Again, it takes about a year to train um, zoning technicians how to do their jobs. So we are asking for um, a new zoning technician um, position in our budget that you'll be seeing in a couple of months. Um, that adds about $68,000 to the overall budget. That's a base pay of $42,000 a year. And one way that we've been trying to keep up with um, the zoning reviews is because it's, again, it's such a specialized um, position, you can't really just put out an ad for a zoning technician and, and get one off the streets and they start working. So what we've been doing is we've been hiring temporary staff um, through our contract services. Um, and giving them some of the more administrative or customer service, you know, customer facing roles so that our zoning technicians can concentrate on, um, on what, they're, what they need to do. So our customer service expectations right now are not being met. And I think we did talk about this a little bit on April 12th as well. Um, we like to have our 24 hour return phone calls for customer service. Someone calls and leaves a message, we should give them a call for 24 hours with their answer. There's usually a fair amount of research that goes on with each of those calls. So they're not, 
it's not like a call center where you can just answer the phone and come up with the answers one at a time. There's, there's usually a pretty good amount of research that has to happen. Um, so we started a rotation of phone duties with both our zoning technicians and our planners. Um, and the number of phone calls has really just been going up quite a lot. Unfortunately, the previous Planning and Development Services Director did not track general customer inquiry numbers. We're just starting to track those. Um, and based on preliminary estimates, it looks like we're getting about uh, 40 general customer inquiries a day and about the same number of zoning reviews that have to happen as well. So hopefully we'll have more information next year once we have some more analytics on how all of that plays out. And then we can start really drilling into the efficiency of those workers um, and how we can improve that. But in the meantime, we really need to study just the demand and, and this, this overwhelming demand that we have for permit reviews right now. Uh, bullet three is about the Planning and Land Development Regulation Commission and the Historic Preservation Board. Again, this is our planning activity. Um, so that's the group that had, we'll have five out of the seven employees um, changing hands here in just a couple of weeks. Um, so we're talking about rezoning, special exceptions, future land use map amendments, and variances, variances, and more variances. Um, that's really been taking up a lot of our, our work. Um, you know, you can see some of uh, those variances don't come to you guys. The Planning Commission, what you, you end up seeing are things like the Steinharts and the changes in environmentally sensitive lands and, you know, um, neighborly disputes, those sort of things that, and really try to, how we're going to protect our environment. But then with the variances, we're looking at shed setbacks and, um, well, you're, you're nine feet from the property line and you need to be 10 feet from the property line. So it's not necessarily the best use of a planner's time. Someone who has the American Institute of Certified Planners, it's probably something that could be handed off to a junior person or say a zoning technician <laughs> to work on, but we don't have enough zoning technicians to really loosen up any of the planner's um, functions. Um, so we've really got two different activities that are really stressed and um, not able to have very much flexibility. There, there is some job sharing. So what we did at first when our zoning um, reviews got really out of control was we took a lot of the planners and put them on work um, with the zoning reviews, got them caught up, but then our planning functions fell behind. Um, so now we're at a position again where our zoning reviews are starting to fall behind and we're already behind with our planning activity. So we really don't have any leeway right now. Um, we have hired a temporary worker to come in and help with, again, a lot of the administrative work. Um, but we're really just kind of waiting for these new positions to come in and everybody to get started um, and get their training backed up. And if, excuse me, I need to take the water. I'm getting a little parched. So last year, there were 155 um, PLDRC applications. This year, we are on trend to exceed that number by about 25, um, so 185 applications. So that's, again, we're, we're reaching this upward trajectory, um, but any of the delays that we're having right now are due to retention and attrition. Next slide, um, moving on with more summary of our operations. The first bullet point there is referring to uh, the land development activity and um, the work they do with site plans, subdivisions. Uh, they also work with parceling of land, so lot combinations, lot adjustments, vested rights, minor splits. Um, and again, keep in mind that our FEMA CRS position is also in the land development team. The land development team has um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I can't remember now how many it was they had all together. They have seven land development um, staff. They have the land development manager, an administrative aide, two land development technicians, which is similar to a zoning technician, and three planners. Again, one of them is, is kind of taken up with the FEMA CRS. Um, and we saw some interesting things with the land development team, um, again, because customer service numbers hadn't been tracked by the previous director. 
um, and we've now um, been doing that for enough to come up with some, some real projections. <clears throat> what we found is that our team of seven uh, reviewed 342 site plans and subdivisions, um, almost 2,000 applications related to parceling of land, combinations, adjustments, vested rights determinations, et cetera. Um, but they also, um, we're, we're at the fifth month now and we're projected that by the end of the year, um, we, we already have some pretty good analytics that there will have uh, had 24,000 customer service inquiries that our seven staff members have been handling. Um, so that's about 95 a day. Um, so we're talking about really an awful lot of customer service inquiries. Um, there is a lot of overtime being spent in the land development department. Um, we do uh, give them temporary staffing resources when necessary, and um, the when necessary just keeps kind of creeping up on us. Um, but they do have really good management there, and they have um, the people that are there have been there for quite a while, and, and some of them are, are starting to get you know be there for three years and five years. So we're getting really good performance out of them. The second bullet point is for the real estate activity um, and I think I already went over most of that um, that's land donations uh, they also do land auctions and process any mineral rights releases and land swaps um, again that activity is, is running really well right now and is able to help a lot of other uh, support a lot of other department activities when they um, sell lands or acquire acquire surplus properties the third bullet point here is our mapping and addressing um, activity. It used to be called um, graphics, but they do more than graphics. They do all of our GIS. And again, these are the countywide data that um, all of us use in our, our everyday lives. Um, so they process any new address that comes in, any rezoning, any change in the future land use. Um, but one of the biggest time sinks that we have, it's a four person um, activity, is when the property appraiser's office adjusts their parcel lines. You know, sometimes they shift them just a little bit to try to keep up with the new technology that we have in GPS. Um, anytime that happens, our four guys have to actually manually go in and find those connecting points again because it's zoning is supposed to follow the parcel line, right? Um, so again, as our technology improves and the property appraiser's office, um, you know, helps us every time they change their, their parcel map around a little bit, we have people that actually need to sit there with their mouse and click on all of those little points and get them to line up. So that's a really significant um, time sink for us. We do actually expect the property appraised. They just did some, I think a few months ago, um, and they're expecting to do uh, another batch of them. It's not the full county in a couple of months. And we've actually decided to not adjust our shape files this time around because they are projected again to do it again next year. So we're gonna, we're gonna be a little offset for a few months there, maybe even a year um, before we can have the, the staffing to really sit down and go through that information. <clears throat> and um, again, I do want to point out that uh, a lot of our activities, three of our five activities, zoning, land development, planning activity, um, are really have a lot of ability for cross-training. Again, it's planners, it's the AICP planners. Um, if you were a planner in a city, you would be doing all three of those. You would be doing the planning and the zoning and the land development. But here, just because of the sheer number of, of permits that we're talking about, we have to separate them um, per the uh, different commissions and public hearings that we have. Uh, so one thing that we've been doing to really help um, keep up with demand is we've been cultivating a cross-training program um, for about the last six or seven months. Um, we've, this has allowed us to be more flexible. So again, we can move planners into doing zoning tech positions and a uh, little bit of vice versa. And we also have land development helping out with some zoning um, functions. And we've also come up with a crisis plan for our permit reviews so that when we reach certain numbers of backlog, 
Um, we automatically have um, different staff um, will change their daily tasks so that we can stay flexible and keep up with the, um, the demand without necessarily having Clay, you know, explain or me tell people, you do this, you do that. We have an automatic system that kicks in. <clears throat> and one thing we've also been doing is um, we came up with rotating plans for our lobby. <clears throat> We do really want to stress um, warm welcomes, having people come in and feeling like they're, um, you know, being being talked to and, and um, have things explained to them. Um, so we've really been focusing a lot on our, our customer service in our lobby. Um, one thing that we found too, again, where we will have better customer service numbers next year, but from right now, what we've seen over the last few months, I think what we're going to find is that those numbers are are really astronomical. They're really going to be big numbers. Um, so one thing that I have uh, looked around at what other cities and counties are doing with the customer inquiries is um, they have been making people pay for these general inquiries similar to what we do now for a zoning verification letter. If you have a zoning question and you want it on letterhead, you have to pay, I think it's $40 to get an official response. A lot of counties have been doing that um, with just even more basic questions that should probably be answered with a phone call or an email because they are also experiencing not just the increase in permit review, but just the number of people calling all of the people now who want to do side projects. They are now working remotely from home, so they want to have, you know, build that new shed by hand. Um, so just all of our volume has increased a lot, not just the permits, but also the call volume. So we're seeing what a lot of counties doing are, um, they're having people fill out forms and waiting two to five weeks for answers on their customer service inquiries. And they're charging um, $200 to $500 for that. Again, we charge $40 for our zoning verification letters. Um, so we may end up, um, again, if we continue to have staffing problems, if we don't get another zoning technician um, position, we will may have to start looking at that. And is that something that we want to do? Um, certainly, that's that's not what our what we would all like to do. We like to have that small town charm, and we like to um, feel like we're giving everyone individual um, and special service. Um, but that's just the reality of what we're dealing with right now in planning and development. <clears throat> I just realized Ginger's phones are right there. So um, I went through uh, what each activity does, and now I want to describe um, how that all plays into um, not just our expectations, but what the state requires us to do. The state um, has, uh, last year, I think around June or July, they implemented um, very, I guess, shot clocks is what some of the people are calling them, where if you submit your single family residential permit and on a certain date, the county has 10 days to provide a response. If it's not a single family residential permit, there's 30 days. Um, so we went from, you know, a fairly loose um, way of reviewing them, just doing our best. Um, it, it's really been unfortunate that that new law comes around right as we start to see these really heavy demands for building permits, as well as you know having problems with staff retention and attrition at the same time. Um, so that's our main requirement that, that we're really butting heads with. And again, we end up having to take people off of you know, non-essential or assignments that don't have such a heavy um, deadline and putting them on those projects so that we can meet all of those statutory requirements. We also have to deal with the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity um, and the Volusia Growth Management Commission. Those are for uh, future land use applications of a certain size. Um, and the way that works is when we get a future land use application and we have 45 days to, pro to schedule it for a public hearing. Um, once that first public hearing, or, sorry, this public planning commission and then county council, there are certain time frames that um, I think it's 15 days after 
uh, the county takes county council takes action. We have to send it to the Volusia Growth Management Commission, and then within a certain number of days, we have to send it to the Department of Economic Opportunity. It's about a three to four month um, process. Um, so what we find happening is that decisions that we make today, they really suck up our calendar for the next three to four months. So as we're trying to be flexible dealing with building permits, which can be really sporadic, just even week to week, um, we find that we lose a little bit of flexibility there. One thing too that our planning activity has done just based on necessity is um, since we do have those state requirements of how quickly we have to process these applications, our, our code, the county code, requires that those applications do a pre-application meeting before we can accept the real application. Those do not have any state required deadlines on them, so we've been scheduling those a little bit further out. I think right now we're at about a month to a month and a half of if you call and say I need a pre-application meeting for a future land use amendment, um, we, we have, you have to wait a month or two to get into that pre-application meeting. And then once the actual application is submitted, that's when the shot clock starts. So again, that is not a, our preferred way of doing business, um, but with our staffing issues and the permit demand, um, it's really been the only way that we've been able to meet the state requirements. So. Um, as you can see, the theme that I'm trying to give us here is that um, we do have customer service level of service issues. It is directly tied to our budget as well as um, factors that are outside of our control, such as the economy. Um, but we certainly have, have a need um, for additional staffing. <clears throat> And the fourth bullet there is about concurrency and you know road level of service, um, solid waste capacity, utility capacity. Um, when we aren't reviewing things in the way you know the timeliness and the completeness that we need, we do start to if things are done too quickly and any bad decisions are made uh, or just not made at all and you have to wait for too long. Um, there can be a direct influence on our concurrency levels. We haven't noticed any of that specifically yet, um, but it, it's certainly something that as this problem kind of mounts and mounts and mounts, and if we do start to fail to meet shot clocks, it is possible that um, things could get approved that we don't necessarily want them to be approved. And that, would, that would definitely be unfortunate. <clears throat> So to go over um, some of the numbers now, um, oh, I do want to point out real quick. So the one thing that's not on this list of state requirements is long-term planning projects. The state had had certain requirements for our evaluation and appraisal report. There used to be a whole slew of long-range planning um, projects that the state required and what we've seen every year since basically the housing burst um, seems like we're still dealing with the fallout from that economic um, situation that each year the state kind of takes away uh, preempts more of our abilities to um, have certain long-range planning options and they're removing some of the requirements of the complexity and the analytical data that used to be required from our comprehensive plan amendments um, so what you see there then is that when we're up against such permit review um, shot clocks, what ends up falling behind are the projects that don't necessarily have to have a deadline. Um, you guys set the deadlines for a lot of these long-term planning projects. Um, so we're, we're still definitely meeting those um, standards, but it is possible, just like we talked about at the Growth and Resource Management Workshop, that we could be doing more of these long-term planning projects. We definitely have staff member who are capable of doing it it's it's just having the time um, we have to have our supply meet the demand uh, planning and development services budget numbers are incredibly boring it's all staff um, we're all about staff we do not have a fleet we do not have buildings that we own or maintain um, no no boats that we can go on go exploring on rivers with it's just all staff um, <clears throat> and you can see that it's a total $3 million budget and $2.2 million is on personnel services and the operating expenses are at seven, 762000 mm -hmm. 
capital outlay is a very small number. What that is um, is basically like our plotters and in the large format scanners. We have a couple of those in the department. So again, not a whole lot of equipment. This is also a fairly straightforward uh, pie chart here. Again, personnel is 74% and operating expenses is uh, 25%. The real estate activity is part of the general fund. Um, so these numbers that you see on the left-hand side of the screen are uh, that one person activity that deals with county surplus lands and whatnot. Um, so we're not talking about a lot of numbers there. Um, <clears throat> um, there is some maintenance of building and grounds we've received, we've been donated or, or um, found surplus of some lands that had some really dilapidated buildings. So we've had to take down, um, demo some of those buildings and really make the property safe. Um, professional services, uh, I think we had to hire a title, a title company to do some work on um, one of our contracts that had a, a, a storied past. And training is 550, we're, we're trying to get our um, get our employee to uh, closer to getting the what they call the certified land certified land researcher the CLR the municipal service district is everything else in the planning department um, what you really see there is um, these service charges are the administrative service charge and the departmental administrative fee those are the um, the parts of our budget that we we in planning and growth and resource management don't really have a lot to do with. Those are the service charges that are given to us by the maintenance and facility of, of the building and of the equipment. So um, that first and third number there on the right are, are not anything that um, we have the power to change. Our membership fees, um, $123,000 a year, do you want to point out 115,000 of that is for our annual membership with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council. So we're actually only paying for our AICP planners. Um, I think we have a couple of um, CFM certified plan play managers. Um, we're only paying 8,398 out of that. So most of that, um, vast majority of that is the, the Regional Planning Council. Legal advertising is all for the Planning and Land Development Regulation Commission. Um, we are on track to meet that uh, for this coming year. And our temporary personnel, um, we are on track to, to have those same numbers, but what's happened is it, temporary personnel was in our budget previously for scanning. Um, we also have a lot of really old microfish and um, really, we have a lot of maps that are basically disintegrating where they are. They're from the 50s and 60s. Um, we're doing our best to store them really well, but they're now in a position where we can't feed them through a regular large format scanner. We actually have to lay them on a flatbed scanner um, because they're just too delicate to touch. So um, we used to have a, we paid for one full person to a contract worker to do some of those scanning needs and be, because of the demand in our permanent activity we've actually transferred that temporary personnel um, dollar amount to our customer service lobby so our um, our bottom line the 49,000 will we expect that will continue for this next coming year but what that person will be doing will be different <clears throat> our revenues um, Total adopted 439,000. We are actually pretty far over that right now with our revenue. Um, and I think uh, Ginger and Carrie have explained a little bit that that the numbers that we're getting right now are, you know, they get adjusted at the end of the year. Um, but just to give you a couple of numbers, um, right now, five months into the calendar year, we have received or billed $659,000 um, in revenue. So the 210,000 that you see for utility permit fees, um, so far it's been 370,000. Um, the planning development fees, um, so far it's, we've um, billed for 202,000. And what this really shows is that um, that goes along with just the increase in the permit demand. More people are submitting permits, so we're, we're getting more revenue from the application fees. And of course, it's uh, 
probably don't have to say it, but uh, our revenue does not cover our expenses. <laughs> So just to summarize some of the um, challenges that we have moving ahead um, into the budget year is obviously the increased workload and the customer service expectations. Um, you know, we, we kind of, if you, we're in a position where if we handle the workload then some of our customer service skills um, start to, to fall apart a little bit. Um, so we're definitely asking um, the council to please consider with the new budget requests, um, one new zoning technician position. Um, we also have a lot of um, a lot of really interesting and varied feedback from the public as to whether they want to see you know additional environmental and sustainable you know sea level resiliency long term planning. We've heard a lot of that a lot of that today, even though we didn't necessarily talk about that um, those topics. So there's um, there's a lot of people that feel really really strongly on both sides and. Um, we would like to get into the mix of uh, making some of those decisions and doing that public outreach. Um, so that's definitely things that are gonna come up in the next 12 months that we have to um, address. Staff retention and attrition, I think we're definitely in a better position today than we were even six months ago. Um, but again, because of these positions are so technical, uh, we do expect to feel the effects of attrition for at least the next year and a half and also uh, lack of electronic records of historic files. I believe Clay um, will be um, putting in a request for that for additional temporary staff um, to handle scanning. Uh, we are not going to put that in our budget. What we've done with a lot of these historic files is because um, GRM as a whole has so many of these historic documents, we've kind of decided to have a more of a department-wide priority list instead of each division handling their own. Um, it was just really the best way to save money and to have a really cohesive approach um, and order, you know, methodology into coming and breaking into it. So I definitely want to support um, Clay's request for that. <clears throat> we will also probably have um, just, and this is very, very minor stuff. It is not within the top five of the operating um, expenses. Um, our conference room equipment will probably have to be replaced um, fairly soon. It's, it's fairly old. We've had a couple of... Um, had to have our, our speakers and our microphones serviced a few times in the last two months, so um, fingers crossed that we can, we can get through the next budget cycle with that. And with that, um, that wraps up the presentation as a whole. I appreciate being the last one to go, and we are here for questions. Yes, you have two more budget presentations to go, but we're done. So you're busy. And you're getting busier. Are you noticing any slowdown at all because of su supply chain issues? No, in fact, it's yeah. the opposite. People are going really fast. They said, I've got this material on hand. I need to use it, spend it, um, get that permit while I can because I may not have the supplies two weeks from now or a month from now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You summarized it so well, I could have kept that to, to one <laughs> sentence. The return of Jessica. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm happy to be back. She's waiting for her breakfast. <laughs> She's bringing us uh, sunrise. Best picture around. You haven't seen this one yet. Good, e good evening, my name is Jessica Fentress. I am the director of the Coastal Division for Volusia County. I am more than happy to go way in the weeds if you wanna go there. Please call me back, ask me questions. I'm gonna keep it a little upper level. Anything you want me to dive into, I'll be more than happy to jump there with you. This is Dunlawton Beach Ramp. Uh, ISB will get its time to shine, but I just thought this was a fantastic photo that was very fitting for this presentation. So right now, the Coastal Division has 27 full-time employees. Uh, you have myself at the top of this Coastal Programs Director. We have two activity project managers. One of those activity project managers is over your port projects and then your capital construction. Your second activity project manager is over the operation and maintenance of your beach and your beach infrastructure. Your construction manager does all your construction. Your three project coordinators do your uh, contract inspection for the beaches and then your services supervisors over all of your in-house maintenance staff for both your general fund and your inlet parks. 
Um, you've got three maintenance supervisors and then two trades workers, two maintenance twos, and 10 maintenance worker threes. We run a very lean office with the, the level of quality that comes out from our staff, uh, our dedication. And please remember this is a 365 day a year from 6 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. and sometimes 24 hours where you have folks that are, are out there trying to give you the best quality customer service experience at our beaches. We're gonna go through two funding uh, sources. The first is gonna be your Ponce de Leon Inlet Port District. Once we run through that, I'm gonna hit you with your general fund uh, numbers as well. So I'm gonna break it up and do two presentations. So we're gonna do the Ponce de Leon Inlet and Port District first. This is our current year adopted budget. And I've got notes on the right-hand side for impacts that we're looking at for next fiscal year. Personnel services, we have $479,623 for personnel services. Next year, you are projected a slight wage increase. Uh, group insurance is going up and then Florida retirement system is also changing. You've heard all of this before. The one thing that we did this fiscal year that was very proactive and based off of feedback in our inlet parks is we added a dedicated animal control services officer to the parks. They will be at both New Smyrna or Smyrna Dean's Park and Lighthouse Point Park uh, full time, primarily on the weekends, Thursday through Monday is what we're aiming for and all summer holidays. This should help cut down on a lot of the concerns that you get from your constituents in Ponce and New Smyrna. Operating expenses, we have $1,192,277. We are anticipating this to go up due to inflation. Capital improvements, we have $200,000, uh, and that is primarily your artificial reef program. Capital outlay, $34,950, and that is mostly your park UTV replacement, gate replacement, things like that. Grants and aids, I do wanna bring this up and highlight this. The Port District provides a grant opportunity for your local municipalities located within the Port District. The Port District geographically is approximately everything east of I-95. So your Oak Hill, your Edgewater, your Daytona, your South Daytona, anybody who has a waterway, public waterway access project, the Port District is a grant opportunity to provide, um, will help with construction, we will not help with maintenance. We also have money in our grants and aids account for grant match for invasive plant removal and derelict vessels. Uh, the invasive plant removal is primarily focused at our two inlet parks as part of our land management plans. You have $1,150,000 um, transfers and that is mostly your port capital for a long-term construction project for Lighthouse Point Park. Comprehensive boardwalk renovation similar to what we did in the Smyrna Dunes. Uh, the theory here is we save our pennies so that we have a big project and we've saved up and paid cash for it. We're also contributing to the Marine Science Center's new artificial reef exhibit since we have not been able to do a deployment for two years due to the US Army Corps of Engineers using our reef site for staging for the jetty project. And then in reserves, we have $3,167,006 and uh, that's about 10% of our current revenue plus future capital per council policy. In total, we have $6,368,933 with 6.3 full-time funded uh, positions. Your funding sources are the taxing district, the park entrance fees, and pavilion rentals. Breaking down your revenue sources, you get $2,447,632 from your ad valorem tax assessment. If you remember last year, we went to full rollback on the Ponce de Leon uh, Port District. You get just over $1 million in pavilion rentals and park fees. The pavilion rentals is very small compared to your park fees. And then you've got about $13,000 a year off of miscellaneous investments for a total revenue of $3,490,958. So what are the primary operations of your Ponce de Leon Port District? We get this question a lot. The primary role is that we act as the local sponsor for the federal channel project at the Ponce de Leon Inlet. We also act as a coastal project fund in support of public waterway and coastal facility improvements within your district. What does that mean? So the United States Army Corps of Engineers is an entity that is responsible for maintaining the inlet, maintaining the navigational depth of the inlet. We act as a local sponsor basically just to help provide with greasing the wheels, there is a local uh, contribution that they could ask for. They have not asked for it yet. Uh, good news, it hasn't been announced publicly, but I will announce it right now. We just got $6 million awarded to the United States Army Corps of Engineers for another inlet and uh, 
dredging of both branches and the inlet. This will be similar in size to what they did in 2018, 2019, where we partnered with the Florida Inland Navigation District and we did the entire ICW. And we also partnered with the Coast Guard and did their basin at the same time. So you had three different projects occur with one contractor. It was an efficient way to run the project because you reduced your um, mobilization and demobilization costs significantly by partnering all those agencies together. We're getting another one. It's gonna happen in 2023, 2024. Same size, same volume, same partners. Um, this is a really big deal. It just got appropriated through Jacksonville, United States Army Corps of Engineers. So really excited about that. Hmm. I mentioned the grants. Again, if you know anybody looking to do coastal waterway public access improvements within the district, we have a grant mechanism to partner with our municipalities to improve those accesses. The other thing we do is we operate and maintain Smyrna Dunes Park and Lighthouse Point Park as they are both federal and state lands immediately adjacent to the inlet. Our operating expenses, your top five um, contract services, your, your biggest thing there is your park tolls. Uh, we also have invasive plant removal we talked about and then you've got buoy maintenance for your artificial reefs. The buoys pop in, we gotta go pop them back out. We are a seasonal business just like uh, everything on the beach. So we, un we recognize that and we have um, seasonal staff that we bring on board for our summer. That also includes sheriff detail, law enforcement detail, and the control detail when needed, and um, just part-time staff to help you know, boost our numbers. We have indirect, indirect costs, which are basically your administrative service charges. Professional services is $90,000. That's a one line item hit for beach profile monitoring. We basically track how the beach moves uh, on a, an annual basis, and it's required as part of our inlet management plan. And then we have your maintenance of your grounds and facilities uh, coming in just at about $72,800. These top five um, operating expenses make up approximately 75% of your operating budget. And that's where most of it goes. The rest of it is tied into materials, utilities, tools, uniforms, dumpster service, small, uh, small items that we just, we gotta do, you gotta pay the bills. So our future challenges for the port district, uh, short-term staffing shortages, just like everybody, when you are paying your maintenance workers um, less than $13 an hour, they're working outside in very hot temperatures. They're working as early as 6 a.m., as late as 9.30 p.m., 365 days a year and all holidays. It gets hard to find people. So we're going through the same uh, staffing issues that everybody else is going through at the moment. If you know anybody that would like to work at the inlet parks, pick up some trash, do some janitorial, and uh, do doggy leash law compliance, send them my way, I'll send them an application, we'll get them through leased employment, and we'll get them out there. It's a great retirement gig. We're also short-term concerned about the inlet stability. Uh, as you can see in this picture right here, we have a shoaling problem. It structurally does not function. And then we have a park capacity issue at both inlet parks. It's well known that if you do not get to Smyrna Dunes Park by nine o'clock in the morning, you will be waiting to get into the park. It's a one in, one out at nine o'clock in the morning on the weekends. Uh, we are at max capacity every single weekend there. Lighthouse Point Park, we can fit over 250 vehicles in that park. We still close to capacity. Usually it's your major weekends or it's when you are unfortunate, you have a midday high tide and you just can't put as many people on the sand with their vehicles. So they all find their way down in Ponce Inlet. Long term, um, Again, you have your inlet stability, part of our inlet management plan. The Army Corps of Engineers, Department of Environmental Protection, Florida Inland Navigation District, and the County Council has adopted the inlet management plan. One of the mitigation strategies as part of the inlet management plan for stabilizing the inlet is a southern jetty extension, which on the aerial you can see here, you can see your sand basically wrapping around the bottom jetty going in the inlet and it's shoaling up just like we all know it does. Mm -hmm. uh, that's long term. We'll have to save some money. We'll have to work through that to get there. It's, it's not my five-year projection at this time. And then long-term, I'd like to do a park capacity expansion. There would obviously have to be a lot of public feedback on that. Um, there'd be a lot of, we lease the land. Both inlet parks are leased from state and federal partners. So we'd have to get their buy-in before we even had a project. Any questions before I move on to general fund? Yeah. Real quick, yes, Fran, you, you made news with the dredging. Yes. When will it begin? 2023 and 2024. 
is when they're anticipating for you to see a dredge to show up. And any idea yet where the sand would go? We are required in our inlet management plan to send 60% of any dredge volume north of the inlet, 30% south of the inlet. Right now, we only have one permitted dredge disposal area, and that is south of the inlet. Before I went on leave, we, the county, submitted a permit application to the Corps of Engineers um, and a, a bunch of federal agencies to have a North Beach disposal area in Ponce Wilbur. If we can expedite our permit review application as part of this Army Corps dredge project, that is a win all around, and we'll be able to put material north of the beach in the Wilbur Ponce area, not right, not just on top of the, the jetty. I'm, I'm talking Toronita and, and that area. Um, at this time, the only permitted place I have is south of the inlet, same place we did the last one off of Sapphire. It was called the wedge, the dredge wedge. If I can get the north one permitted as part of this project, we're going to split it. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Yeah, it does. I'm just, I'm just picturing where where it seems to be needed, and it seems like it's mostly in the south end, you know. So Rattlesnake Island, for, for those of you that are watching or are not familiar with it, is this little polygon in the bottom center of the picture. That is a Florida Inland Navigation District disposal management area. So basically it's material from your ICW that they pumped up there to dewater. Um, we have nowhere permitted to place it at this time. You would have to have a permit to place it on the sand. You would have to have a permit to place it in the water. The only permitted disposal area we currently have for dredge material placement is at the disposal area between Sapphire down to about 10th Avenue. And that's where we did the, the dredge disposal back in 1819. We can do that. Um, I am trying to find a way to make a bargain. Uh, it's very expensive and the tune that I found is in the, the six to $7 million range. But if you think about where it's at, it's gonna have to be slurried, put into a pump and then pumped somewhere. I have one slip line that runs through the Southern Peninsula and that's at Sapphire Street. I can run it through there, but then I have to go out in the ocean and move it south and that's a lot of pipeline with a lot of boosters. There is no other way to get across the island unless I go above land further south. I, I know what you're thinking and, and we can, if you, I know what you're thinking. It would be very expensive to go there. I think you're thinking the same place too. Well, <laughs> we're, we're thinking what the homeowners are telling us down there and the property owners. And if, just looking at the beach, the cliffs. <laughs> Microphone, please. Or well, is there anything on the forecast? I know we talked about it, um, I think last year, Jeff. Uh, there was an, an, a natural kind of um, narrow portion down there towards Bethune Beach and, and just south there, is there any chance, you know, granted we'll have to wait for a storm, but um, another natural kind of small inlet down there, you know, where somewhere we can grab sand? If you're mm. going to get a new inlet that's natural from a storm, it's going to be probably near your JB's camp. Because if you stand right there at Pompano uh, at Atlantic Avenue and then look west, you'll you'll see where it'll happen. It won't take any store. It won't take any houses out, but that's where it would happen if it was going to happen. We do not have any land that is not on federal. So federal land is the only place that you would have the ability to do what you're thinking. Right. Because right now we've got you've got either Mary McLeod Bethune Beach Park, which I don't think is would be the place chosen. And then whatever else you have is in Canaveral National Seashore. Everything else is residential. Is it more cost effective to look at those big granite rocks, like hard, kind of more hard armament instead of pumping the sand? It comes down to uh, what our residents in the Van Clee Kyles area are experiencing right now is you have to be able to show the state that you qualify for having an armored structure on your property. And that comes down to the residents being impacted and not the soil being impacted. At what point, just so, because we, we get called, that's one of the things I've been getting calls on here probably the last six months. At what point can we tell them that 
or, or does the house have to be kind of teetering into the, the sea? Uh, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. I mean, at, at what point? Because it's literally in some spots 90 degrees straight they, up. The Florida state law on who is allowed to have seawalls and armament is based on the vulnerability of the structure, not the soil. And the structure does not include a pool. The structure includes the residential area, the, the building itself. Um, what we have recommended is for the residents to try and get the law itself modified so that they have a larger buffer. Anybody that believes that they are at risk of losing their building or they believe they should be warranted to have an armament of some sort, I would highly encourage them to hire a seasoned coastal engineer who knows the laws, knows the requirements, and can navigate them through a system. Um, just hiring a contractor and expecting the contractor to get the permit is not the way to go. And I think a lot of people have started with a contractor and not gotten the engineer. Does that answer your question? Okay. General Fund. Personnel services, we have $1,363,733. This, uh, again, is projected wage next year increase, and then group insurance, and then the retirement system as well. We're going to dive into our operating expenses. You have $6,779,587. And again, we're going to talk about labor and uh, price increases associated with labor and fuel. We are not requesting any capital in FY23. This current year, we got a maintenance truck for twenty-six or $65,000. $1,180,000 for the continuation of the Spruce Creek dredging project and then rebuilding of aging coastal infrastructure. Your aging coastal infrastructure is your dune walkovers. A total of $9,388,320. You have 20.7 funded full-time equivalent positions. And then your funding sources are your general fund, your beach access fees, your concession fee, and then your pavilion rentals. So our revenue funding sources, gross beach access fee revenue, $6,816,814. If you remember $4 from every beach pass sale, whether it's daily or annual, goes to a special fund called your Beach Capital Fund that is set aside to do capital improvements to your beach infrastructure. That is what is paying for your International Speedway ramp. It's paying for your Silver Beach ramp, your Dunlawton ramp, our major, or your off-beach parking lots that we're building. Um, once you pull that $1,220,035 out, you get a revenue to the general fund of $5,596,779. Before any bills are paid, okay. you have five hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. That is your franchise fee from your beach concessionaires. It's their annual fee for the exclusive right to do business on the sand, and then you bring in about fourteen thousand five hundred dollars on pavilion rentals at like Sunsplash Park, Frank Rendon, Mary McLeod Bethune Beach Park. Total revenue budget is six million one hundred thirty-six thousand two hundred and seventy-nine dollars. So a summary of operations. Um, we operate and maintain the county's beaches, your beach access, and your associated amenities. This is a quick list of what we have. Uh, you may see public showers noted there twice. Just to clarify, you have 58 public showers at ramps and beach approaches, so dune walkovers. You have an additional 36 showers in your parks for a total of 94 public showers. You'll see sport courts noted on the bottom right. That includes your splash pad. So we have a lot of public access. 37 miles, 17 of which are driving. We also manage major contracts associated with the operation and maintenance of the beach. We may have 27 staff members in our division that are full-time employees, but we have over 330 people out on that beach trying to give our residents and our visitors the best, most possible beach experience they can have. 
That includes your beach toll contractors, your janitorial contractors, your beach maintenance contractors, your portalet contractors, your concessions contractors, and then we have a couple miscellaneous contracts that we use pretty significantly, like landscaping and signs and, and irrigation and stuff like that. Top five operating expenses, contract services. Again, your beaches, your beach maintenance and your tolls are your major one. Um, janitorial and landscaping come in at number two, three, number two and number three. Maintenance, this is our grounds, our facilities, bathrooms, repairs, all the maintenance things you can do on the coastline, $2,207,424. When you have 94 showers and a lot of restrooms, you pay a lot in your utilities. We spend $245,000 just on our water bill alone. Um, materials for maintenance, $185,000. You have over 130 dune walkovers. There's a lot of wood. This also includes things like um, nuts and bolts for playground. Painting, paint, toilet paper, things you don't think about that you need. Soap dispensers. So it's a lot of money, but there's a lot of things that we purchase. And then again, we supplement our staffing with seasonal personnel as well, uh, approximately $154,000 a year. Our largest operating expenses make up 94% of our total operating budget. The remaining budget is things like vehicle replacement, um, insurance, communications, uniforms, dumpsters, stuff like that. Future challenges for the general fund. Uh, again, staffing shortages. We went over that previously. If you know anybody looking for a job, we're hiring. And then we're going to have contractor rate increases due to inflationary pressure, basically your labor and your fuel. Your folks out there picking up trash on the beach, it's getting harder and harder to get people to pick up trash for $12 an hour. Um, you'll see a contract rate increase in tolls. You'll see it in your beach maintenance. You're going to see it in your janitorial and portalettes all this year. It's going to happen. And then unauthorized events. I know that the focus on unauthorized events usually goes to first responders, but when you have a crash party at the beach, they trash the beach, be it tearing the ramps up or literally leaving their debris on the sand, it costs money to remove it. And that's stuff that we just don't know if it's going to show up or not or what the, the demand's going to be. And then you have aging, aging infrastructure. Um, New Smyrna and south of the inlet is was very lucky during Matthew and Irma. Their walkovers sustained very little impacts to them. We're feeling those effects right now because they have reached their maximal sustainable life of those walkovers. Your hardware is literally rusting off. Um, so we're working and we're, we're programming it in and we're doing what we can with our in-house trades workers, but ultimately there's some of these walkovers have to be completely replaced. And they'll be replaced to new standards and, and you know they won't be four feet wide. Long-term, you have a new toll contract coming up. Um, your current contract cannot be extended past October of 2023. So we're going to have to have some interesting conversations on what the new toll contract will look like. Will we move to an automated contract? Will we have a contract? Will we have a hybrid contract, person and automation? Uh, with that comes unknown costs because we just don't know what kind of infrastructure is needed for that. Do I need a data connection and a pedestal at a ramp? Do I need a new gate that automates by itself? Um, and we don't know what the fees might be on that as well. So that's that's something we'll be talking about in the future. And then as Mr. Robbins and Mr. Brower brought up, beach nourishment is also a question. It's long term, it's out there, it's questions you're getting. I don't really have a fund to throw this in to bring up as a long term challenge. So I it's in the general fund just to bring it up. That is all I have unless there's additional questions. Yes, sir. Is there any future plans, any dredging down south towards like Cedar Creek? I know they kind of experienced some shoal issues down there. And is there any other places that have plans on? Within the channel of the Intercoastal Waterway, it shall be dredged in the 23-24 cycle is what I'm hearing. If it's not within the ICW channel itself, then it is on the onus of the users to dredge it themselves. The county has not traditionally dredged down there at all. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. 
Play it your back. I thought it was going to be Dana Page Pender. Oh. Got the Blues Brothers coming down. <laughs> nice. <laughs> This is like the big finish. The big, the big finish, finish yeah. and they're going to go at a very quick speed. Yeah, we only got 125 slides to go through, so it should be quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just pick up with 124. 124? <laughs> Thanks. All right, so Aaron Van Cleek, uh, Management Budget Director. I'm going to start us off with just going over the County Council uh, budget and service level review. So this is the County Council budget for 21-22. You have your personal services and your operating expenses listed out there. Um, as you guys obviously know, your personal services is 50% of the state formula uh, per the charter. And then your reimbursements there are the reimbursements from other funds into the general fund for your services. Uh, your operating expenses are broken down as follows. You have your memberships uh, for various associations at 87,403. And then your contracted services uh, follows that, uh, followed by the state of the county, which your state of the county is actually offset by the sponsorships. So whatever's budgeted for state of the county expenses, we also budget the sponsorship money the same way, so it's just a wash. Uh, and then you have event sponsorships that we budget annually at $40,000, and that is the max uh, voted on by council, and then it's a $1,500 uh, per sponsorship. And you have your registrations and travel and your printing cost. Your largest operating expenses make up 78.9% of your total operating budget. And then your remaining operating is for legal advertisements that are required by state statute, your communication charges, property and liability insurance allocation, computer replacement fees, um, food and dietary, office supplies, et cetera. That's the other 21.1%. And then just a, a real brief slide on the summary of operations. You guys know you have the five district representatives, the one at large, the one chair. You pass the ordinances. You review and adopt the annual budget, which we will be talking about in more meetings to come. And then you appoint the county manager and uh, county attorney. And if that wasn't boring enough, I introduce Mike Dyer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> Uh, Tough crowd here. Dear. So, w welcome to National Lawyer Appreciation yeah. Day. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so, your Department of Legal Services is the title uh, given to the department by county charter, and it's your county attorney's office. Uh, we support counsel and staff, uh, work to provide legal options, and probably most importantly, help to solve problems before they do become legal issues but sometimes that's unavoidable and we defend them. Um, we provide services to county government and also to some constitutional officers under the participation agreements that council had approved as part of Amendment 10. Um, we did update our mission statement uh, to provide high quality, effective, and efficient legal counsel to Volusia County government. And we really have worked hard to kind of focus as a team on improving communication with council and staff, uh, intentionally objectively explain the law, provide legal options to decision makers, which are not your lawyers, uh, and work to improve relationships and communication with Volusia cities, um, which really came into play with the pandemic for sure. Um, just want to give a very quick overview of some of the things that we touch upon, and I know you get the annual report from our office, so I won't belabor it too much, but this is election season, as you know. Uh, we're going to have a big time commitment with your canvassing board uh, coming up. We just, a number of us just went to the state mandated training for that. They're telling us to set aside up to one third of the calendar year for <laughs> canvassing board activities. And uh, Kevin Bledsoe has been involved in defending the legal challenge to Senate Bill 90, which was the election bill that passed by the legislature uh, two sessions ago. And that's now pending uh, in the 11th Circuit uh, Court in Atlanta. Probably the thing that, uh, one of the most visible things we've been involved in was helping staff and the constitutional officers implement Amendment 10 timely. And the way that constitutional amendment was drafted, Volusia, we were the first out of the box. We had to implement it first. 
Miami-Dade, a couple of the larger counties are now have in the process of implementing that, have contacted us to find out how we went about it. So it'll be interesting. Didn't we get an up. award for that? We did, and I um, just we, wanted to bring we that did, up. Um, uh, well, we've won another <laughs> one as well. So I was going to announce at my time, but as long as we're talking about yeah. it here, you have received an award from the Florida Association of Counties for Best Practices Award for Amendment Ten. And last week, we were notified that the National Association of Counties. Uh, had awarded, uh, given an award for the county's work with the constitutional officers on that. So that was nice recognition for that work. Monetary award? Unfortunately, no. Uh, there may be a, a gift certificate to, no. Okay. Uh, so uh, last year, we defended 85 open lawsuits. 44 of them um, were uh, filed in that year against the county or constitutional officers. About 90% of the litigation that we deal with are items covered by your self-insurance fund. So personal injury lawsuits, for example. Um, we have sovereign immunity caps, but it basically anytime someone sues, they always allege they're seeking the maximum. Um, and this year, there was some discussion in legislative session about increasing those caps, which would be a, a cost to us. So we're monitoring that every year. but. Um, but they're remaining at that level for now. 29 cases were resolved through a variety of means, uh, four by jury trial, 12 were dismissed, and 13 settled. Um, we received 59 notices of new lawsuits that are they're required to notify us before they file suit, and we had seven, uh, 70 open workers, compen workers compensation claims last year. Um, we occasionally, the county is a creditor, in bankruptcy proceedings. So we had about 30 proceedings in federal court we represent the county in. Uh, we're obviously involved in the bridge litigation, uh, which is uh, a big case. Um, we have trespass appeals. We had four last year in front of one of your special magistrates, typically uh, Beach Patrol, if they uh, issue a trespass order to somebody on public property, they have a legal right to challenge that. And so we have to conduct a hearing on that. Sometimes we find ourselves in a, the administrative uh, court system. Uh, last year we had a five-day trial. Uh, Russ Brown uh, handled defending a permit that DEP had given the county for a beach walkover in the New Smyrna Beach area. Um, we have been involved in the opioid litigation, seen a lot of activity on that. You approved a settlement today, seeing really the settlements come in, um, and you establish an interlocal agreement. You've had tremendous participation with your cities. Uh, only a couple chose not to participate. They're gonna be uh, providing proposed spending plans to you for your approval with the regional funds and the individual funds of the county also would be subject to your approval. And those, as you know, have to be used for opioid purposes. Um, last year, we had a week-long jury trial uh, on eminent domain uh, to complete the East Central Florida Rail Trail product. Uh, rail trail project, which was funded by the state. And occasionally we have to defend uh, challenges to county ordinances. Uh, we have a number of suits pending now involving your zoning code, specifically your uh, short-term rental restrictions. Uh, there were originally five lawsuits. There are two remaining um, that uh, we are uh, dealing with. A few years ago, the legislature adopted a, a, a process for risk protection orders. Um, we do work with the sheriff's office on that and handle those hearings. Last year, there were 99 uh, risk protection proceeding, uh, petition proceedings filed. And our team was also involved in defending uh, the, law, uh, the statute against the legal challenge. Uh, we also are currently uh, named and a legal challenge to the state's open carry and stop and frisk laws, along with the state attorney's office. Um, and that's currently, uh, that, and, that, and that's on, on appeal, but we were successful in that. Uh, we are also involved in recovery of funds in favor of the county. Um, EVAC, for example, uh, a little over $100,000 in the probate process, $130,000 just pursuing claims of the county when its property has been damaged. Uh, and at the leadership of your property appraiser, 
we have worked to file suit to collect $225,000 uh, in homestead exemption revocation. So essentially, homesteads that should not have been granted were revoked and suing for back taxes. You uh, timely completed your decennial redistricting process. Uh, we were involved in drafting about 41 ordinances on a wide range of topics. Um, we're actively engaged in communicating with staff and you on with John Booker on the status of the state legislature. Just to put it in context, there are 192 bills since 2020 that had a county impact that we've been monitoring. So county government, cities are a common subject of these uh, bills that could have very big consequences. Um, and we were involved in implementing the council's uh, sponsorship initiative for naming rights and the restart of your bus bench advertising program. Um, you have a number of boards that you appoint. Um, we staff 15 of them. There were about 130 meetings last year that we attended. Uh, just your code enforcement board alone uh, heard 845 cases. Um, your PLVRC, roughly 140 land use applications. And we worked with your ECHO and Forever Committee on updating your rules for those programs after they were renewed by the voters. So aside from litigation, there are about 568 new files we opened last year on projects. Um, one of the initiatives we have started recently was offering training to employees on open government laws and doing this virtually. Uh, we recently completed training for management uh, with every department division of the county, um, and we provide annual training to many of your advisory boards. Uh, Heather Wallace uh, has worked with your staff and serving on your bargaining teams, and we've had several settlements as well. And we continue to be involved in the challenge, uh, or excuse me, the collection matter for Medicaid funds with the Bless Volusia Hospital Authority. Matter of fact, we have a hearing uh, on that next month. Um, we're involved in reviewing or drafting a large number of contracts, about 450 last year, and about 880 competitive solicitations with your purchasing staff. With Public Works, uh, one of the big accomplishments last year that Council approved was renegotiating with your cities, led by uh, your County Manager's Deputy County Manager, for a new and a local agreement for your local option gas tax. How those monies are shared with your cities, that got accomplished, which was, which was terrific. Uh, with public works uh, we're involved in drafting contracts but also animal abuse cases um, sabrina slack uh, handles those cases was involved in three uh, abuse cases and resulting in the rescue of about 21 dogs with growth management um, sometimes we're involved in real estate um, acquisitions such as the loop purchase um, sale of property um, writing an agreement with Flagler County for intergovernmental coordination, um, working with council as they, you work through whether or not to amend your zoning code on short-term rentals, and just dealing with annexations. Uh, we receive petitions where uh, individuals are seeking to become part of a city, and we have to review them because there are certain criteria you must meet to do that. With economic development, we're largely involved in dealing with contracts. Um, whether it be grants, uh, purchase of agreements. And with the pandemic, with the airport, you, you have approved a number of amendments to your concession and facility use agreements um, related to the federal funding you've received. With human resources, um, we're involved in assisting them when they have employee disciplinary cases, investigations, ADA accommodation requests, and occasionally we'll have complaints filed for discrimination with a state or federal agency. And we had two last year um, from a state agency and we'll defend those. Um, basically my tenure in this position has basically been the pandemic so far. So uh, yeah, and so hopefully you kind of turn the corner on that. But one of the things that we started uh, was actually a suggestion um, by the city attorney for Ormond Beach asking the county to take a leadership role uh, in starting weekly conference calls with the city attorney. So we did do that throughout the pandemic. That was very helpful, I mean, to get to know them, but also we were all dealing with the same thing. Federal orders, state orders coming, litigation filed, and just trying to advise you and staff on what our options were. And we have transitioned to monthly 
calls now that have uh, really gone through the pandemic just to keep that conversation going and sharing information, which has been very helpful. So just to close, some of the changes that we've made since January 2020, um, combined with the proposed budget that we're submitting uh, to you this year, it'd be a reduction of eight positions in the department for last year and for this year. It's about 25% reduction. Uh, in positions uh, valued about $565,000. Uh, we're also proposing a reduction in our operating budget of just shy of 17% for this year. Uh, some of these savings have been accomplished through, uh, we have reduced the number of deputy county attorneys. We're failing from three to two. We have Kevin Bledsoe with our leading litigation team and Heather Wallace uh, for our operations team and Paula Soria and Russ Brown as senior assistant county attorneys. It's been important to me that individuals not be assigned to a particular area and they never leave it. So we have worked to emphasize cross-training of attorneys because quite frankly, you never know what you're gonna get hit with on any given day. And I know that was an enjoyable part of the job for me, was to have some variety. Um, and we have really increased our use of technology, uh, thanks to you. Uh, last year, you approved a contract for us to convert to a electronic file management system. We are working this year on that. Gina Carolyn is kind of leading the implementation of that. Um, basically, going all digital. Um, this is gonna save us money uh, for basically the same products. We save about 13.7% largely because we'll be able to reduce our off-site storage costs. That will be unnecessary. Um, with regards to our budget, about 85% of our budget is people. Um, we are planning on, th these are current year figures, so we will be proposing a reduction to our operating expenses budget, uh, as I explained. Um, and also we'll be reducing uh, positions, which will be reflected there. Um, our expenses, um, about 78% of them would include things that you honestly you would expect, our publications and subscriptions. Um, we are really, we have shifted almost entirely to digital resources, no longer buying paper books. Um, that has saved us money. Um, and so we're, we're starting to see the beginnings of that. For example, we're planning on reducing our subscription budget from um, by over two thirds uh, in the coming year. The remaining expenses uh, are training, communications, computer replacement supplies. Um, uh, I've shared this story, I know with several of you, but when I started in the pandemic hit, uh, we had all desktop computers. We didn't have a webcam among us. And so uh, we have, we now have been able to upgrade two laptops with our leases and uh, hopefully with the next, because we lease our computers, all our support staff as well. So it's really made us more, uh, better to deal with the unexpected, work from home if need be, work on a weekend and without having to come into the office. So that's been very helpful. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. All right. So you're you're reducing your budget by seventeen percent. Does that mean that the operating budget? Okay, so it doesn't mean that Paulo and Kevin are working pro bono. No, not yet. Uh, Paulo is uh, just buying a house, so he he's going to have a mortgage to make. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but thank you. And uh, are you up? All right, Aaron. Aaron's going to give the first part of my office, and then I'll jump in. Go ahead. So I just want to clarify real quick on the computer lease. We don't actually lease the computers. We own the computers. We pay a service charge to replace them uh, when their life expectancy. Like our so, vehicles. Just like our vehicles. So it covers maintenance. I'm sorry. Too. Basically, what they're paying for is their new computer. Correct. After they made it, the areas made an initial investment, then they save for their next one so. <laughs> sorry <laughs> all right so this uh just gives you a visual 
a picture of the county manager's office. Some of the pictures might be a little outdated, but yeah, especially the. First one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't afford a new one for me. So. Yeah, who's the guy in the far left? <laughs> exactly. I was young one. Uh, that just gives you a little visual of the org chart and how they are uh, broke down. Um, so the county manager's office is a little unique, and it's not just the county manager's office. You guys know you get council support staff that are assigned to the county manager's office. You have your record staff that is assigned to the county manager's office. Um, so that kind of goes into this chart. We will be reallocating the staff a little bit to different units so that we can segregate those costs out of the county manager's office um, in the 23 budget request. So you'll see that shown a little differently when we show the budget in future. Um, this is a breakdown of the 21-22 adopted budget that includes all staff that I just mentioned. You can see most of it is personnel. It is very little operating. The reimbursements work the same way. It is reimbursements from other funds uh, for the services of the county manager's office so that the general fund doesn't bear the, the whole burden. Uh, this is the breakdown of the operating expenses. The property and liability insurance allocation is the largest operating expense in the county manager's office, uh, followed by temporary personnel. Um, the temporary personnel was used in 21. It has not been used at the level um, this year, so there is a reduction coming in 23 for that line. And then uh, memberships, uh, registrations uh, for the different associations and, and conferences. Computer replacement, uh, the charge for that as well for the replacing the desktops and laptops. Copying and printing charges, and then communication fees. Those largest operating expenses make up 76% of, of the county manager's operating budget. Uh, the rest is for the vehicle replacement charges, maintenance of the equipment, uh, contracted professional services, office supplies, fuel, uh, postage, publications, um, and, and training, promotional expenses. So I'll make it quick on this because basically you've watched uh, my great team over the last few meetings uh, go over all of their areas. And there's a few more to go. But basically, my job is to make sure that they have everything they need to do that and implement uh, the policies and ordinances that you want me to, uh, to do. So I take, I'm very honored that I get to do that. And, uh, so we have 2,700 now full-time and part-time employees. Uh, personnel takes up a large portion of my time. Uh, I'm the final authority on all of those issues and uh, but I'm proud to say I think we again have a great uh, team out there and uh, just as the sheer numbers is the 2700 there's a small group of uh, usually individuals that will end up taking a lot of the time and of course uh, we do have uh, what seven separate unions uh, now so <clears throat> we uh, a lot of work goes into that as well and of course we're uh, really almost always in budget season anymore it's a it's a matter of building it and then running it and uh, another thing I take a lot of pride uh, is, is how we do work with the cities and uh, I have uh, met some of the neighboring county officials too I think we could probably increase our game a little bit with the uh, counties uh, near us and uh, started a little bit of that and, uh, and of course, the Department of Transportation, I certainly uh, spend a lot of time uh, working with them. And, uh, and we think we have some of the best relationships we've ever had with the department. And that's uh, only going to get better. So uh, then we get into, of course, the rest of the team. Uh, we have the deputy clerk. And we know uh, all the work that uh, Carissa and her folks do with the, uh, the meetings, the workshops, the agenda uh, preparation, which again, is a tw it's a seven day thing all the time. We're always working on the agenda and then several agendas out and we manage those records. Uh, the advisory boards keeping track of that. And of course, while they're doing that, we're also rotating uh, to make sure the front desk is covered and each of you guys as we provide the support for the county council and we try to manage your day as far as uh, your, your calendars and your meetings and uh, I don't think the outside world knows how much of the demands that are on you 
uh, and we try to keep that straight for you. Um, and of course, uh, as I call it, game day. Uh, we have the county council meeting set up right down. As you know, they'll be here as soon as we're done cleaning and putting stuff uh, away, and, uh, and we start on for the next one. Uh, more and more, you guys have external events, and uh, they're there to support you with that as well. So again, we're very active. Um, didn't get to the degree of Mike's presentation, uh, and I, but I will point out we are also down uh, by one deputy manager that I uh, have not filled, and uh, probably Suzanne was gonna kill me uh, for not doing that, but, um, but we've tried to maintain with what we've got, um, but we'll talk more about that as we get into budget. And next up, our star for the day, uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards and his office was a good job earlier. Good evening, I'm Jonathan Edwards, internal auditor. I am excited to be presenting today because internal audit um, is, or may I should say, is internal audit awareness month. So we're very excited about that. I even got one of those and I still don't have uh, appreciation day for the attorneys. Right. That's right. I would have brought cake and ice cream, but I was afraid the attorney's office would eat it all. So. Um, so for this budget year, you did approve the addition of a staff auditor for the department. Svetlana Reese, who you saw in the last picture on the last slide, joined me in January um, from our accounting division, and she assists me in performing the audits. So what do we do? We identify risks that could keep the county from achieving our goals, making sure that the county council and the county manager are aware of those risks, and recommending improvements to help reduce those risks. So how do we do it? We analyze processes and procedures, look for opportunities, suggest improvements to operations, promote ethics, ensure accuracy of records, raise red flags, recommend stronger controls, monitor compliance with rules and regulations, help reduce the risk of fraud, waste, and abuse, and communicate the results to the council and the manager so that those can be addressed. And we follow all the professional auditing standards issued by the Institute of Internal Auditors. As I said, there are two employees in our department our operating expenses are broken down, as you can see on the slide. Um, of the 91,000 of operating expenses, $75,000 is for any specialty audits, for example, cybersecurity, which continues to be the number one risk in um, public sector as well as in the private sector. Um, the other expenses are for training, supplies, service charges, and then the capital outlay is for computer and monitor, and then reimbursements from the internal service charges from other departments for our departments and our, uh, the general fund pays for our expenses. Um, recently completed audits, as you can see there, and in January is approved by the council. We are in the process of the inmate trust account audit, and I've already started the planning for the charges, fees, and collections audit, and later this year we'll start on the audits as approved in the council um, in, the audit, in, in the annual audit plan. And of course, um, every year we also perform an audit of ECHO and Volusia Forever programs, and we'll be following up on the audit recommendations that were reported in 2021. So that was my presentation. Any questions? I try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that happened every time you walk into the office? <laughs> Well, it's actually in preparation for International HR Day, which is Monday. I know they don't have one for lawyers yet, but you're free to buy us <laughs> breakfast on Monday legal. Good evening, Dana Page Pender, Human Resources. Um, and not to take anything away from any of the other divisions, but I would argue that that's probably the best looking team up there on that slide. <laughs> um, our, our division is divided into four main areas. We have operations, which is what you typically think about when you think about payroll. Um, we have employee relations, training, things of that nature. We also have our hiring um, employment area, which um, is recruiting the best and the brightest that's out there. We have our employee benefits and our occupational health clinic. And we also have our risk management group. In HR, while we do reach out to the community while we're trying to recruit and retain people, our greatest um, customers are our employees. And so to that end, our goal is to always help others to be their best selves. Um, with that, our main thing is recruiting and retaining the best talent into the county. 
We're also training so that we can grow our own and help people move to the next level. Employee recognition, which is pictured up there. Um, we have our annual employee recognition breakfast. We think that's very important in retaining our talent. We also have our Caught in the Act program. And one of the big programs that we have is our employee wellness program, which has won an award, a Cigna um, Outstanding Culture Wellbeing Award over the last several years. And with that one, we, have, um, we started with wellness challenges. We had about 50 people involved in the wellness challenges a couple of years ago. Our most recent one had over 300 people. And actually, it's the divisions. We, we've started a little rivalry with divisions. There is a moving trophy. So I challenge you for the next one. We've got one coming up in the fall. Put a team together and join us in our wellness challenge. We have our group insurance fund, which is our medical and prescription um, insurance that that's paid for, as well as some of our um, fringe insurances. And then our risk management is our workers' compensation, liability, um, and property insurance, which you approved earlier today. We have three funds. Um, the first one is the general fund. It's actually our smallest. Um, 25 of our 36 FTE are in this fund, and our greatest expense in this fund is our personnel services. We, um, like the other divisions before us, do have reimbursements in this fund. Our largest operating expense is um, our contracted services. NeoGov, which is our applicant tracking system, is part of the contracted services, as well as our volunteer software that we have. It's a database. It's tracking the volunteers all across the county. So we're working with divisions to get all of our volunteers loaded into that software. Um, we also have background checks, fitness for duties. Our second biggest expense is legal expenses, and that's our outside labor and employment council. They do assist us sometimes with negotiations or in bargaining, but they also represent the personnel board should we need those services. Our next biggest expense is scholarships and awards. That's tuition reimbursement. That's also your employee recognition programs are covered in there. And training. Um, we actually just signed um, an agreement with Franklin Covey, so we're excited to bring that training here to the county, in addition to the other great trainings that we offer, training our employees up um, in Microsoft Office. We had 365 coming on board, so we'll have trainings in that area, customer service training, and any other needs that the county has for training. And then, of course, we have liability insurance um, and some of the other things like computer replacement programs and things that you've heard from other areas. Our second fund is our group insurance fund. Personnel services in that fund is, is small. There's two FTE there. Our largest um, portion of that fund is our operating expense. We are self-insured for our medical and prescription. We do have a third-party administrator, which is Cigna. Um, and we do have reserves that we're required by law. We're, we're required to have a certain number of claim days in our reserves. And so that's the reserves number that you see there. We do have revenues in our group insurance. The largest one is the 9,540 per funded FTE that the county contributes for each funded position. We also receive that same dollar amount per funded FTE from each of the constitutional officers. The employees um, pay into their portion of the premiums for their dependents and for themselves. And then Cigna on our behalf goes out and they get rebates from pharmaceutical companies on behalf of the county. And that was budgeted at 1.9 million. And that sometimes is flat, sometimes it increases over the years. And then we have retirees that haven't reached the age of 65 yet. They're also um, a part of our program, our group insurance program, and their premiums are part of the revenues that we receive as well as the constitutional officers, retirees premiums. Our greatest expense in the group insurance is our claims expense. Um, it was budgeted this year at 44, a little over $44 million. Um, contracted services is our second greatest expense. That's Cigna, our administrative services fee with Cigna, Shard Snyder, which um, works on our retiree benefits, and then our actuary. We also have a retiree health insurance subsidy. So if you retire with a number of years of service and you um, have leave over the cash out amount, you're able to use that excess leave to help pay down your retiree insurance premium. And we have printing up there as the next largest expense. Um, that's this year. We're working to go more digital and we're looking to reduce that next year. The third and final fund I want to talk about is our risk management fund. We are self-insured in liability and workers' compensation. We do purchase many of our specialty lines. Today, you approved our property insurance um, premiums that we just did. 
Our FTE here is nine. That includes our occupational health clinic. They are under a risk management fund. Um, we do have reserves that are set by the actuary, and then we have a grants and aids number up there, which is the fee that we pay to the state of Florida for being self-insured for workers' compensation. We have revenues. Again, it's a risk pool, so all of the um, divisions pay into the fund, as well as the constitutional officers. And then if we're able to recover anything for um, any injury or anything, incidents that occur against county property, that's budgeted there, as well as if we receive any money from our excess liability if, if something was over what we, um, what we would pay out for self-insured, then that's in included in our claims recovery. Our largest operating expense is our policies. Our excess policies is the biggest one, and that protects us from large claims. Um, our again, our property policies you approved today, earlier today. Our second biggest expense is our settlement expense, and that's our liability, um, what it costs us to settle our, li settle our liability claims. And then our next two are related to workers' compensation. That's our medical insurance claims, as well as our compensation, um, that's the 66 and two-thirds uh, salary that we have to pay to employees. And those numbers are actually set by our actuary. And then our next expense is our claims expense, and that's whatever it costs us to settle claims, whether it be depositions, witnesses, um, attorney's fees, things of that nature. And we have our contracted services. Those are um, our broker of record, our drug screens, lab works, physicals, things of that nature. So looking ahead to future challenges, you've heard from a lot of the departments and divisions um, how tight the labor market is. And so our biggest challenge that we face is retaining the talent that we have, not just in HR, but countywide. And in March, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that the number of job openings in the United States um, outnumbered the number of employee, unemployed workers by 5.5 million dollars, 5.5 million people or positions. So it's really important that we retain the staff that we have because we know it's a tight labor market and we have to remain competitive with our compensation in that tight labor market, which, start, which is our second challenge. And our third challenge is we've got an increasing minimum wage. So we know we have to meet the state law and increase minimum wage to meet the statute every year, but at the same time, minimize compression for our current workers that are here. Just like um, if you own a home, you probably have seen some increases in your homeowner's insurance or your auto insurance. We're not exempt from that, so we're seeing increases in our insurance premiums. Um, that's another challenge that we're facing. And the impact of COVID-19 and increased medical costs. And when we say COVID-19, we're just not talking about COVID-19 itself, but we're talking about seeing an increase on um, people have put off getting uh, some of the preventative things done. And so we're seeing an impact on our group insurance fund from some of those um, decisions that were made during COVID-19, and then the increase in medical costs. Any questions? <laughs> Good afternoon, Kevin Captain, Community Information Director. So, pardon? Yeah, where's Gary Davis? Well, I was told that uh, Attorney Appreciation Day is on the marketing calendar. It's February 30th. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a quick glimpse of our team. I'm very proud of this team, the whole entire team. Uh, as you can see, we've got diversity. We've also got a real good generational mix. And that's very important for us today when we're delivering public information to today's audience. Here's a breakdown of our organizational chart, and we basically have three different sectors of community information. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about those along with the two administrative professionals that support our team. So our budget is 1.3 million. Our operate, most of it is, is personnel services. And uh, there are some operating expenses, which I'll also go through in detail. And as Aaron mentioned on the county manager budget, there's also the uh, reimbursements, which are the, the the fees that help get offset some of the operating expenses. So let's just take a look at the operating expenses. What we have the most is the contracted services. Uh, we have not used any temporary personnel and community information. Most of what we have for contracted services is we do have a third party 
uh, videographer service. The county has always had that. We have it with Drone 360. We also have the annual broadcasting fee with Volusia Magazine, which I'll talk with you a little bit about. And then we also have the biggest expense, the two expenses is the Soledad, which is the, our web hosting uh, server, and then our social media management program. We also have marketing and public relations, which we've not had to use much of that money in the first half of this fiscal year because we've been able to execute those services uh, internally. Uh, but they're also available to cover costs for marketing, also available in the case of a, an emergency or a special assignment or task. Computer software is another expense for us. We do, uh, our production team uses the Adobe Premiere software. And we also have special graphic artistry programs and things like that that we use, including photography programs and things for software. Liability insurance is another operating expense, as well as promotional advertising when we have to put out newspaper, print, or other ads, as well as boosting social media. And uh, of course, communications too. Um, pretty much almost everyone on our team has a county cell phone. So summary, summary of operations. So, Community information is best viewed in three sections. We have marketing and public information, production services, and graphic artistry. First, you might think that the four marketing PIOs that we have is a lot. But when you realize we have over 30 county divisions plus the county council, it's really not a lot. I mean, we, we're actually razor thin when it comes to marketing and public information. And third, uh, I, let me mention too on community information with production services. That's also a growing sector of our, of our division because as you know, video is king when it's telling our story. And so also, we can't do it without graf graphic artistry. So that includes the web sites that we have and all the graphic images that you'll see. We also provide a news and information uh, services to the media on a daily basis, and sometimes on weekends. And we compile those activities into an evening report for the council every day. And when you read these reports, I hope that you are impressed as I am with just how much information that goes in and out of our division every single solitary day. So first, uh, when we talk about challenges, I like to refer to them as opportunities. And Mr. Chair, many, many meetings ago, you mentioned that Lucia County government is like operating a Fortune 500 company with nearly a $1 billion budget. And at this year's State of the County event, you actually mentioned it's a year of change. And so for us in community information, we understand that as in any sector of business today, Change is inevitable, and it's necessary. County government is changing rapidly, and all of us in community information acknowledge the importance of change, and we must continually reinvent ourselves every day. The stakes are too high if we don't. So we become a more successful organization as we change. So one future challenge we have when it comes to change is Volusia Magazine. This is a staple for county government in Volusia, and it's been a half hour, 30 minute show every month for 30 some years. The show airs on Daytona State College's cable TV station, WDSC TV 15, and it has served the purpose for many years. However, our information outlets are changing. Non traditional outlets such as social media have become the dominant platform for delivering news and information to today's multi-generational audience. A growing number of news outlets and consumers have cut the proverbial cable cord, and it makes strategic sense for us to transition Volusia Magazine from its historical format to a new format that will live on social media. So what we wanna do is rebrand it, reformat it, and re-deliver it to viewers in a different way. Instead of them coming to us, we want to be able to come to them. And also, the demands on our division for video production, audiovisual production, and just news and information in general has been 
exponentially increasing. And so for being locked into a 30 minute show every month, as you've noticed, we've been running a lot of reruns. And a lot of that is because of the heavy lift that it requires to put that show together every month. A five minute feature is hours and hours of staff time behind the scenes. But we don't want the features to go away. Instead, we're gonna put them on social media. You've probably seen the growing number of features that we're pushing on YouTube, through Facebook, on Instagram, that becomes more and more of our predominant platform to deliver information. And you'll continue to see those features just like you will the uh, campaign that we did for, for anti-litter campaign. So you might be thinking, we already have Volusia today when we talk about rebranding. But to be honest, that's the whole point. We wanna transition the television show from a 30 minute feature to a new name and have it more variable on an as needed basis or story, tell the story as you go. Again, instead of being locked in. And the name Volusia is really truly our brand. There's, it's a unique name and nobody else uses that name. So when you hear of NBC's Today Show, they actually have other streaming channels. They have Today Talks, the Today Interview, uh, Today in 30, and they all help cross promote Volusia Today. So when we say Volusia Today, it's, it's gonna become the transition for both radio, features, and really what's happening in Volusia Today. And we'll also be able to reach a younger demographic without necessarily losing our current loyal viewers. Volusia Today will still be educational and informative, and it'll help promote all that we have to offer, but with shorter uh, varied features and PSAs. With social media, we, today we have 32 accounts across the county, and they are growing. We continue to have more requests for divisions that want to open up of either a Facebook account, Instagram now is rapidly growing, so there's more and more emphasis on social media. Just to give you a, a little bit of an idea about the graphic artistry and the other products that we produce in community information, we have two graphic artists full-time, one who serves as a webmaster and one who serves creating the images that you see throughout the county. And these images, this, this artistry is not done in a vacuum. It requires the marketing specialists and the PIOs and the liaisons in every division to be able to come together, tell us what they want, and let us create something fantastic. To give you a little idea, we do booklets. We do library activity booklets, brochures and pamphlets. The many, many different logos that you see are all created here in community information. And we try to update them as, as possible. We have products that we do for the airport, the beach, the coastal division. We had a lot of graphic artistry that we did for the census, community services, DeBerry Hall, environmental management, the emergency operations center, public protection, the library, the ocean center, parks, rec and culture, the Lyonia environmental center, the marine science center, Votran, and also for the county council. Lots of graphic artistry that we do. When we look at the website, volusia.org is actually 48 microsites in one site. We have 24,000 visitors a day. Those 24,000 do not count county staff as those IP addresses are removed from the count. So this is a tremendous web page that requires constant maintenance constant server support, and that's what our other graphic artist perpetually works on. We also manage the Daytona Beach International Airport website as well. That gets about 2,000 hits a day. Ocean Center is about 800 uh, visitors a day that we also manage. Votran is another site that we manage, and that one's about 1,500 sites uh, visitors a day. And then we have the Marine Science Center, which is about 1,000 hits a day, floridabusiness.org, which is right now a little bit less than 1,000, and Sports Volusia, which is about 400 a day. So lots of management with just those seven public-facing websites that we have to continually update. 
and production. We're looking forward to more opportunities to enhance and optimize our production services. And just I think as you've seen over the last two years, we've really made a big difference in upgrading the way we do production. So we have a new production studio in the historic courthouse, and the studio has lots of capabilities, I might add. What we can do out of here is nothing short of amazing, and, and really I would emphasize that it's because of our team members. It's also complemented by what we call a creative suite that's across the hall, which is essentially the control room to the studio. And this is where all the video editing takes place. It's designed as an open space to enhance collaboration and communication. And then also, we're always regularly reassessing and looking at ways to maximize our production capabilities. With more events like State of the County and the Affordable Housing Summit, we take extra steps to make sure that we are producing a high quality event. We want Volusia County to look good. We want you to look good. We want to show the public what a beautiful county this is and all of the beautiful things and services that our county has to offer. And so we look at every one of these events as an opportunity. So for future challenges, the uh, production team, I will say they do a whole heck of a lot more than just making cool videos. They also serve as uh, consults. They do consultative services for AV, for the other areas of county government. Because as you know from the pandemic, there's more and more emphasis on virtual meetings, virtual capability, and even just on the improvements on the dais here with public participation, we're constantly trying to find ways to improve and optimize the way we provide public information. So in closing, I will tell you that every member in community information and in the county manager's office, they bring their very best to work every day. I'm proud to work with that team, everybody on the team. And, you know, speaking of team, you've all heard the acronym, together everyone achieves more. I believe that to be true. Everyone comes to work and they never, ever say, this is not my job, because they know it. I'm proud of our team and I hope you are too. Any questions? Pin. I'm hungry, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin, I, I do I do like the changes that you've mentioned. Yeah. I think it's timely. And, yeah. and, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It, it is timely. I also and, wondered if, if the county attorney, if Michael Dyer, noticed that when you speak, you use voice inflection and you kind of change it up. <laughs> Might come down to my office a couple times this next week and. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to mention too, this is such a minor little thing that you all do. I was invited to address a Hungarian summit, had not a clue what to do, and notified staff. And Pat came back with the most spectacular speech for me to make. In fact, Senator Wright followed me. And while he was on stage, he goes, wow, I don't know how to follow that. That was tremendous. I immediately shot her out of thank you. But over and over and over again, I know I use them a lot. And I think everybody does. And it's always wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wheeler. You I, I, Hungarian? I, I had a hard time doing it in Hungarian. I read those talking points, and, and, and you bring up a great example of the necessity for our team to be agile, nimble, response-driven, and solution-oriented. And that's also the reason for the change for Volusia Magazine to Volusia Today and making it so that we're not locked into that schedule, because we need to be flexible for the council, for the public, for the media and for our internal clients. And the ability for Pat to be able to just reprioritize and get you though that information, that's also why we're here. Uh, but it's also another reason why we have to shift our workload a little bit to be able to continue to, that, to be responsive and to be flexible. So thank you.
Okay, I was able to sit down for a minute. <laughs> thank, thank you all. So community events update. There's actually just two quick events to give you an update about. One is a reminder that the Beach Lighting Expo is on Friday, May 27th at the Daytona Beach Shores Community Center, and that's gonna be from 1 to 7 p.m. The other update is to let you know that the, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Florida Forest Service, and the Management Plan Advisory Group for the Tiger Bay State Forest will be conducting two virtual meetings on June 7th to take public comment on the draft 10-year land management plan of the Tiger Bay State Forest. Again, that's Thursday, June 9th from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. And if anyone has any questions, please call Donald King at 386-317-3277. I also will add that this is added to our county calendar. So if you go on volusia.org under news and county calendar, you'll be able to find more additional information. But we wanted to make sure the public is aware of that. That's the 10-year the land management plan. And then our last item is a sponsorship request from the NAACP for their Emancipation Day celebration on May the 21st at 6 p.m. They're asking for a $1,000 sponsorship for their event. And this is the first time we've been asked to, sp to sponsor this specific event. Uh, but so we have supported the NAACP in 2019. It was the last uh, support for sponsorship. An individual ticket for this event is $50. I move approval. Lowry uh, moves approval for the 1,000, is it 1,000 or? A $1,000 donation and a second by Wheeler. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Thank you. I have a question for you before you go. Sir, we have a question on the who made the motion in the second. The motion was by Lowry, the second by Wheeler, and the vote was five to zero. Oh, fine. Okay, I'm sorry, we're thinning, thinning the herd. I have a question uh, for you. This is a good time for it. I was asked to check it, to see if you had received a request for sponsorship from the Juneteenth committee. So I'm looking over at, at Megan because she's the initial recipient of those. I have not seen it, but I will follow up with Megan. And if not, we can reach out to them if you'd like us to, sir. And, Yes, and that and they also have asked for a, a proclamation for the the dinner that night. I think it's June sixth. That I believe, uh, Pat. Sixteenth. June sixteenth. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Brower, we do have Mr. Nicholson. And Miss Miss Levette has has long left, hasn't she? Okay. Okay. Uh, John Nicholson. John Nicholson, B side, and yes, I too have been here nine hours. Uh, you early, slept through some of it. Yeah. yeah, part of it. I do. <laughs> but don't blame Clay. He was just kind of boring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he deserves it. All right. Um, with your development, you were talking about development. Does it pay for itself? All right. I mentioned before, I sit in front of a property, Wyndham, um, who people condemned because we, we gave them 10 million. Well, in essence, we really didn't because they paid it themselves. All we did was we allowed them to take half a million every year of what they would have been paying in taxes to pay down the, the debt. But we still ended up with a million bucks every year, plus another half million dollars in water and sewer and whatever, plus several millions of dollars in which they bought in the community. We have an identical lot at the other end of Ocean Avenue, which gives us $37,000 a year. We don't lose a dime. 
but we get 37,000. So to me, if I had a choice between 37,000 a year and not losing anything, and losing a half a million dollars, but making $2 million, I'd rather have the $2 million. So to me, development pays for itself. Uh, when Tandra Allet Wall came before the city, Ruth said, no, malls don't make it. Allet malls are failing all over the place. We're not gonna have anything. Uh, Rob Gilliland, uh, we were having Margaritaville go in and Mosaic. No, no, they're not gonna succeed. We won't see a house built in Margaritaville until 2025 or later. Well, the old adage is rooftops bring commercial, and it did. We ended up with a boom town of houses on the other side of 95, and Tanger Outlet Mall, if you ever go there, is just amazing. It is just really almost built out. So that area is producing income for us that we would never have ever had, all right? So when you're sitting there saying you gave $2 million here, but you're only getting back, so I think it was uh, one Daytona was 32 million, now it's 158 million. Well, that to me is an increase. But you all don't see what I see when I pass it all the time. All the people going in and out, all the people staying at those hotels that are around it. We end up making money every time we put out money. There's an old adage, it takes money to make money, and it is absolutely true. So I asked you before, I'm asking staff to either prove or disprove the adage. Does development pay for itself? Because you hear it all the time on one half says it never pays for itself, and the other half says we need it and it will pay for itself. So I'm asking you to prove it one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, county manager. Mr. Chair, I think all this could be said has been said today, so I'm done. Uh, Mr. County Attorney. No, sir, thank you. Have a good evening. Good, good inflection. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's late. If, if I didn't like you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tease you. Um, Ben Johnson. <laughs> I'm glad his, his uh, mic's not on. That was it. Uh, Dr. Lowry. I'm good. Heather Post. Danny Robbins. Good. Billy Wheeler. Two quick things. Um, the Boys and Girls Club have their stake and stake on June the 2nd at the Hilton 5.30, 7.30. That's one of their big fundraisers. But they're also reopening their um, Boys and Girls Club at the Dickinson Center in Daytona on May the 27th at 4.30. It's, it's really wonderful what they've done to create it. And I uh, hope we can see some people there and uh, get tickets for the stake and stake. We need it. Okay, and Barb is not here. Um, George, I just want to just a couple of real quick things. Um, when they went through your staff, all the women down here to my left were involved in the in the picture. Um, but I think I can speak for everybody still sitting up here that we really appreciate the service that. You four women, Hazel, um, Carissa, Terry Pendarvis, um, what, what you do for us with really different personalities from grumpy on one end to super nice on the other. Um, and you just handle it well and treat us all uh, the same. And you do good work and we appreciate it. So, um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention that um, <laughs> Um, on a very serious note that a, a friend of the council, um, a friend of the community, um, Big John is, um, is no longer with us. He served uh, well, He's, he served hard. He wasn't always on our side, every one of us, but he, um, he always treated you 
like a, a lady or a gentleman when he had you on his show or in person. And you, you knew where you stood, but he will be missed. And uh, I, I just didn't want to let this meeting go without mentioning the service to our community that, that Big has, uh, has done for us. Um, and I think that's it. So with that, at 7.01, we beat the 8 o'clock. Uh, thank you all very much.